thank you. All right, superintendent, if you will just let us know when we are live. You are uh, ready to begin the meeting whenever you'd like, and uh, we have had uh, one additional board member also join, so we're getting close. Actually, two more. So, uh, actually, we got all three. I think we're maybe nine now. Okay, awesome stuff. Hello, Vice President Wilson. Good to see you. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Good evening, um, board directors. Uh, it is uh, currently 5.31. We're getting ready to start our um, our Little Rock School uh, board business meeting for February. And uh, I'm so pleased that you all are able to make it. Thank you, Little Rock, for uh, tuning in and um, engaging the way that you do. So um, we will start off with the the pledge, uh, Director Wood, would you please uh, uh, start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Welcome. Everybody, just a chance to stand up if you can. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you for that um appreciate it um director calloway yes uh would you like to uh give us um about 15 20 seconds of um inspiration or how uh you have uh demonstrated the uh, self-determination act collectively as a um, and and then for a community as a group absolutely thank you what we do here today is important what we say here today is important it is important for our children it is important for us it is important for our community for well, I want all of us to re to remind themselves today that to teach is to touch a life forever. Is that long enough? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> I totally appreciate you guys. Um, so as, as you guys know, we have a a word of the month. Last month it was unity. This month it is self determination. Um, and with that, we look at that from a, a, a collective and how do we um, exhibit those things? Unity, how, how do we bring our um, community together? How do we unify, right, as, as a board? And what does that? that um, uh, look like, and then just um, individually going out and just doing all of the great deeds that we do. Um, and then of course, around self-determination, just, you know, just always getting to do, do and be better at what we do. And then next month, I will just throw out the, the um, mission of next month. It is collective work and, and responsibility, which I think that that is very important and then why does um, us as a board um, being, 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 being in a forming stage and developing our process and style and, and then our collective work that we do, it um, impacts um, thousands of thousands of uh, children and um, community uh, members uh, right of our city and those abroad, abroad uh, that comes in. And then the last part, it is the responsibility that like we all um, share in that. So it is an honor to serve with you guys. I, I do believe we have a very diverse board uh, that represents many um, ideals of the city and uh, us coming together as nine uh, really, uh, it, it really um, pro 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 provide a perspective and blanket to the city. So um, I appreciate you guys um, for serving. Now, next up on our agenda uh, it are our uh, district celebrations and then our superintendent will go ahead and get into 
our uh, district uh, uh, cele celebrations. And uh, Superintendent Mike Poor. And have President Hatter, prior to the district celebrations, I believe this is the appropriate time. I'd like to make a motion to modify our One. agenda. Oh, okay. um, modify our agenda to add a resolution that I am proposing. Okay. Um, I'm happy to very briefly describe what it is and then you all can decide. Well, can we just um, hold on on that at the moment um, with the, let's see. Okay. Um, can we, I'm sorry, can, can, can you say it again, please? The, the audio was, was, in, was in, in and out on, on my end, and I want to make sure I, then I heard you correctly. So please again. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was making a motion to modify our meeting agenda tonight to add one item, which is a proposed resolution. Um, and it's, it's very simple. It's simply a resolution urging the state to seek waivers so that we would have the flexibility to ad administer our assessments remotely for students who are um, virtual learners. And so I'm happy to discuss that more and talk about you know why it's being added at this time, um, if you would like, or we can. Yeah, we can. Um... We can hold on that. Uh, like, I really want to um, get through our agenda. That is a topic that we did uh, discuss, not discuss, but highlight last month about testing. I do understand that the Biden administration have recently, just recently, um, re released a position on that and, and waiving like that 95% um, a percentage of the student body that have to test. And so, um, right since uh, there, you brought it up, but was, was that, of motion, were you making a motion? Um, do, yes, ma'am. Okay, so since there's a uh, motion on. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just very clearly, so um, the reason it was being added right now is the guidance was just issued on the 22nd. Right. And if we would like to speak as one, speak as a board and um, proactively offer our input or feedback to the state on this, the next state board meeting is coming up, I believe, on the 11th, and then we have testing. So this would really be our opportunity to speak on it. Right. So um, that did just 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 come out, and and I think the state already knows our position on that, um, or our thought process of going forth. So um, let me just see if there is a motion to a second to um, have a discussion. It will come at the end of the agenda, just so we don't. I have... will make that second. Okay. Um, so. What we will do is, oh, we will. The next phase is 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 is, is actually a discussion um, on on that motion. So, do you got so as a board? Do you want to get into that now, or else we can actually uh, in, entertain that at the end of the meeting, just so we could stay on track. I think we should entertain it at the end of the meeting, but I think it should be added to the agenda. Okay, and so the motion was to add it to uh, right to the agenda. We will discuss um, or have some level of, of conversation at the end of the meeting to decide what will we do. Um, the state hasn't taken a position on it yet. I I wonder if they even had time to even caucus about it since it just came out this week. Um, so, do we all in favor of putting it at the end of the me meeting? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, we'll add it right to the end of the meeting. Uh, Su Superintendent uh, Mike Poor, uh, you have the floor for the district uh, celebrations. Go forth. Thank you very much, uh, President Hatter. And uh, we always look forward to sharing some of the wonderful things going on. We want to start tonight with celebrating uh, partnerships that we have in the district. And I want to turn this over immediately to uh, Ms. Blaylock, who will lead us through the partnership aspect of celebrations. Ms. Blaylock. Tammy, we're not hearing you if you're if you're speaking, you need to unmute. I'm sorry, my clicker obviously doesn't work. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you, Mr. Ports. As always, it's a privilege for me to be here and to introduce to you 
and members of the Lorac School Board, one of the district's newest partners in education. In partnership with the little uh, with Cherry Elementary is Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers, located on South University. Now, the wonderful thing is, this restaurant is new to the Central Arkansas uh, area and almost immediately raised the question, how can we help? And of course, that's always great. I believe we have representatives from Terry and Raising Canes with us tonight. I'm sorry, I can't see the participant display on my screen, but those of you that have joined us from this partnership, if you would unmute, introduce yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Tyler Kachinchai. I'm actually the general manager for that location. I was the one who approached Terry Elementary and many more elementaries about just some of the great things we do. Um, and for those of you that don't know, we are a chicken finger restaurant. We serve one thing, chicken fingers, one of the best at it. Um, but that's just a front. We really enjoy to be community partners, um, specifically education, because as we all know, you can't have a great community without great education. And I am so excited. I actually just relocated my family to Northwest Arkansas. I'm super excited to be part of y'all's group. Just opportunities are endless. And I mean, as we all know, you know, uh, support is always welcome. And we're, as a company and as an individual myself, I'm excited to be a part of you guys. And I'm um, excited to see the impact we can make together on this younger generation that we have in our city. So thank you so much for having me today. We truly appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you so much. And if he did not make you hungry, the next time you are hungry, you swing by Raising Canes and tell him how much you appreciate them supporting the Rock School District and being a part of us. And you will receive your frame certificate from us soon. And we are glad you're part of the Little Rock family. Is anyone from Terry on? Would you like to add any additional notes? Yes, I'm here. This is Stephanie Franklin. Can you hear me? Can't, we can, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, as the principal, I just want to say thank you, and you're going to have to teach me your name a couple of times, but I'm, I'm a big proponent of making sure I pronounce names correctly. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for sending out the feeler um, to schools, and I know that you should have had an influx of students coming through with their academic achievement certificates for a free kids meal, because we um, gave those out to our academic honor roll recipients already. So we're glad to partner with you and to see where we can take our partnership um, in, other, in other avenues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also next up, I'd like to introduce to you Charlene Kerr. Charlene is the president of the Little Rock PTA Council and she has an announcement and a special thank you she would like to extend to one of our present district partners. Charlene, are you there? I'm here, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here to share this. I mean, a lot of you may have known we um, did a, a thing um, on, I think it was Thursday a couple of weeks ago at Sam's Club. Um, well, Little Rock PTA Council got a, a $50,000, yes, 50,000. I about started crying. I had to be almost resuscitated. I've never in my life and in my nonprofit work been given $50,000 to, just do good things for Little Rock School District. So um, obviously Little Rock, Little Rock PTA Council is a separate entity to um, Little Rock School District, but we serve, we're here to serve the parents, teacher, and students. And so what we, I had initially spoke to them about is offering lunch to all, to all teachers and staff at every school in Little Rock School District. So I am really, really excited to be able to do that. I actually thought I was getting $30,000, so which is unbelievable amount of money. But when we got there, um, the general manager said at Sam's Club, we'd like to take things to the next level. I never know what take things to the next level meant. <laughs> but anyways, they, um, <laughs> I'm still like, I can't speak. They pulled that check back and there it was $50,000. So I did kind of say there's so many other things we would love to do, but obviously with funding and it's been really hard this year with council um, bringing in money and memberships with virtual and everything. So we're really excited the last couple of weeks, uh, myself along with our board has been out contacting schools. They're so excited. The principals have been working with me. Um, we're trying to go in and find 
it won't keep you but trying to find businesses and families that are kind of have students or families that go to each school and really trying to support local um sam's club was very very excited when i said that's kind of what i wanted to do they didn't put anything on who i could use or what i could do so i really see this as a massive blessing and now that i know about raising canes thank you <laughs> I, we'll be meeting each other soon um, but yeah I'm really excited and it's been exciting for me just to see how many restaurants and families are, are involved with um, supporting Little Rock School District so if you are a teacher uh, a staff member uh, an administrator um, be looking forward to a, a nice lunch before school ends this year you all so deserve it it's been it's been a heck of a year. <laughs> Thank you, Charlene, for joining us. I reached out to her and Thank I said, Charlene, you've got to join us because this is your story, not mine. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We're really excited. We always uh, we always need to be thankful to all of our partners because they, whatever whatever their contribution is, it's, it's significant. So this is a perfect segue to my last reminder before I close for the evening. I would just like to remind all of our viewing audience we have an important deadline coming up. Uh, on March 9th, we have deadlines for reporting your service contributions for the year and also for our VIPS award nominations. Now, as all of you are aware, because you've been viewing um, our community advisory board me uh, meetings and our school board meetings now, you know all the wonderful things our volunteers and community partners are doing. So please, please remember to help us celebrate volunteerism and nominate worthy individuals and partner groups for our awards because we want to highlight them and celebrate them. Thank you all for being patient with us tonight. Thank you all to all the Rock School District partners. Thank you, Mr. Poor. Thank you so much, Ms. Blaylock. And I know the board will be excited to take part in the big celebration uh, when we get to that to honor all of our VIPS partners more formally at the end of the year. Um, just as a matter of executive privilege, I am going to just mention one other thing before I get into the rest of the district celebrations, and that is that I want to really compliment our parents and our staff and, in particular, our uh, facilities crews for the work that they did over the, the snowstorm. We had over 20 buildings that had some form of significant damage. The significant damage means that we will be claiming some sort of insurance uh, for the damage uh, and, and so we had multiple water type issues and we obviously have five schools that had to go virtual this week because of it our total bill for all the issues and problems we have will exceed one million dollars and just right behind that because I saw Miss Wilson almost go um, I want to share that the one million dollars we are insured and our deductible will be about a hundred thousand dollars that we will end up having to pay and from that we also can work with the state to offset that by about ten thousand so bottom line we're going to be on the hook for uh, probably about ninety thousand uh, dollars for the all the repairs we know that three of the schools that we had on virtual this week will be ready uh, we hope to go back into school on monday that would be watson cloverdale and jefferson we have our most significant issue at Pulaski Heights Elementary and Middle School. We are finalizing plans to transition to Hall. Uh, parents that are listening, you will be receiving further communication from your principals, but please know that we have arranged it so that elementary will have their own wing. Middle schools will be kept separate from the high school kids, high school from the middle and elementary, so we will really cordon off all the building into different categories for folks and really do things with transportation and we've got a logistic challenge there of even getting things that are elementary needs over into hall so we've got a lot to work on it probably won't be pulled off in fact it won't be pulled off on monday but we hope that by the middle of next week that we are back to in-person learning at pulaski heights albeit at hall high so more to come on that but i want to again thank our facilities department i want to thank our parents for their their patience and support and I also want to thank our teachers who have had to kind of work through some of these challenges, especially as they had to shift to virtual. On to the celebrations. Uh, our first celebration tonight, uh, as we change back to the screen and uh, get to start to fly through some of these things, is the first thing is today, actually it was yesterday, Hall High was announced as a level two a high reliability school. This is tied to the 
a professional learning community model, which is a part of our exit plan. And high reliability is, is kind of the, the, the approach that the Marzano group takes, specifically with secondary schools, it seems that they've gravitated towards it the most. And uh, we have two schools that got level one, which is Cloverdale and Hall. But Cloverdale now is the, excuse me, Hall is now the first school in the state to be categorized as a level two school, which really shares so much about their practices and the things that they're doing to uh, you know, do the, the, the research-based level of support towards students and interaction with the staff. So we congratulate Dr. Roberts and we congratulate all the members of the Hall staff who have uh, attained this lofty uh, status. Our next item that we want to share is that we also have received a district award. This is a national award. It's tied into Class Link. Um, Class Link is a uh, a tool that we actually, Mr. Wood and and Mr. Mason might remember that we were very proud last year that we were able to find a way to have all of the different apps come into one location for parents so that you didn't have to go search all over the place. Well, that effort now is being recognized. If we go to the next slide, we've been named as the outstanding school uh, district for K-12 for large districts for Class Link and the idea of making it easy for parents, students, and our staff to have access to all the apps that support learning. I want to thank our staff for this, but I will tell you, and Mr. Wood and Mr. Mason may remember, this actually came out of parents saying that they were frustrated and the district listened, we adjusted, and we came up with a solution that's now being recognized on a national level. And again, congratulations to our tech team and to our instructional team for pulling that off. Next, we have a, a kind of a momentous uh, occasion. Uh, the first time that the work that we've been doing with the Graduation Alliance, it's a partnership uh, that really goes in search and hunt, hunts for students who for whatever reason have fallen through the cracks and, and we haven't been able to re-engage them. That's their role. We uh, are going to have our first, really two graduates and only one will be able to attend tomorrow uh, where we are going to give them a diploma tomorrow. And so this was a, a student set of students that if they hadn't been found, uh, may never have received that diploma and most of you probably know the staff that if, if you don't graduate, don't have that certificate, don't have that diploma, you're more or less throwing away five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars over your course of your life in earnings by not having that, that diploma. So we're excited to do that tomorrow. Board members, as we do more of these over the coming months, please know we will always invite you as a board member if it's a student that resides in your board zone. Uh, and we have to limit it because we're doing this in the board room and with parents and staff, uh, media potentially, we have to limit our, our participation. So we're looking forward to that tomorrow uh, with the Graduation Alliance and our first ceremony. We also are doing a little quick commercial right now that Lexia, which uh, we, we're so excited about. This is a partnership with the city and the school district to push out literacy. These are above and beyond opportunities for our students to enhance their, their reading skills and their passion for reading. And we are into the Winter Olympics right now from March 1 to April 4, and we want parents uh, and students to realize that there are prizes to be won. Uh, previously, Otter Creek took uh, the initial prize on the first contest that was held, and now we're doing our second contest to try to amp up um, folks participating. Our next celebration is two of our central office staff members uh, that are going to receive recognition for the uh, King Kennedy Awards. Uh, the King Kennedy Awards uh, ceremony uh, is going to recognize Dr. Daniel Cummings, who leads our accountability and assessment uh, area, and Dr. Jeremy Oa, our deputy superintendent. And so we're really excited that you know our staff is being recognized at the state level for this important award of the King Kennedy Celebration. And I know that uh, those of you that know those folks um, will give them a pat on the back. Uh, this set of awards has been in place in our community and in our state since 2005. Next uh, topic, today, today uh, at the State Gifted and Talented Conference, Ms. Rhonda Adams was recognized as the outstanding uh, gifted and talented educator for the state of Arkansas. Ms. Adams is a, a member of the Gibbs staff 
but she is a member of the Little Rock School District staff. She helps everybody, and she's always willing to support um, and, and do things. She is an advocate and passionate about uh, DI. Uh, that's one of her, her main things that, that she participates in and helps. Uh, she helps kids be thinkers. She um, engages every type of learner that there is and finds a way for them to have their voice be heard and to let them share their talents. She is a great representative of our district. We're so proud of her for winning the state award. Next, we have our national merit finalist. And you can see that we have really a, a healthy number that's coming from both Central High and Parkview. And with each of these names, my guess is that some of you are gonna know one name or you think you know the name, but please reach out to their families or their friends, however it might work. Uh, to share congratulations because this is a very, very big deal for them to be named finalists for the National Merit uh, Scholar. And uh, we're excited about this because uh, each year uh, nationally there are 7,500 scholarship recipients chosen from the 15,000 finalists. So our students are in line for that type of recognition. And uh, this says so much about these young people. It says a lot about their parents and I hope it also says a lot about the Little Rock staff who interact and engage and support them as learners. So congratulations to all 10, uh, there are actually more than 10, to all of our scholars who are recognized as National Merit finalists. We actually have 13 uh, scholars recognized. Finally, we did mention this in our board meeting two weeks ago as a part of our pre-agenda, but we formalized uh, the announcement that we're excited that we are going to be able to have graduation ceremony this year where students and families will be able to come into a setting and the student will actually receive their diploma and walk across some form of a stage. We still are working out details, but one thing that we do know now is we do have dates. Uh, board members, uh, we will get those dates so that you can put them on your calendars um, and you can see that they happen on uh, the uh, in, in late May. So we've actually pushed back the graduation from our calendar. That, had been published early in the year because this is the time when we can have access. Uh, we still are, are working out all the details. There will be some form of limits on the number of tickets that each family can receive for the ceremony, but we're very, very excited to be able to have uh, a graduation where it, it's a real graduation for our seniors, which last year we did a virtual, and I think we did a good job with that virtual ceremony, but. Uh, you and I both know what it means and feels like to, to walk across the stage and how nice that is for everybody from the, the, the scholar to the parent and grandparent. And of course, we will capture it on film as well during that event. So we are limited on many of the other activities uh, that, that sometimes come at the end of the year. Uh, so traditional things like prom and banquets and baccalaureate ceremonies, uh, after graduation or after prom type parties, those are out of the equation in terms of the guidance that we've received from the Department of Health. But again, the most powerful message is that we do get to uh, have a real ceremony uh, for our graduation. And I believe, Ms. Hatter, that I now have covered all of our celebrations and I will turn this back to you at this point. Thank you, Superintendent. Of course, those are <laughs> Very exciting um, celebrations and partnerships. Um, we have just heard getting next into our agenda is uh, pub public comment. Uh, Superintendent uh, Poor, do you have uh, public all of the public comments? I do, and I do want to make note, uh, members of the board, that I did receive uh, one public comment that was in written form that came in uh, after our deadline. I will put that into our board notes, board newsletter for you. Uh, to see um, the one thing that I will share is that those comments are not action items, so you will be able to see it and use them for uh, thoughts and discussion for future meetings. We have one uh, written document for public comment, and then we have one individual that has asked to speak to the board tonight. The individual who's asked to speak to the board is uh, Ms. Teresa Knapp Gordon. The comment, I will read it first. Uh, this comes from a Parkview Magnet baseball parent. Um, and Parkview High School is one of three LRSD high schools that does play baseball. 
They are the only team that has no home field. They have no safe manager's field on which to practice. They can only play about half as many games as everyone else because they can't schedule home games. Why can't this district either rework the old JA Fair field that was given to Parkview and make it safe and playable or provide access to a locally managed field such as the University of Arkansas Little Rock? This comment came from Mr. Burley Smith and I will share with board members that we do try to respond uh, back to that patron so that we can uh, inform them and we also will share a little bit of response on that in our board notes. The next individual that asked to speak um, is uh, Ms. Teresa Knapp Gordon. Uh, Ms. Hatter, I'll turn it over to you to set up the parameters. Okay, okay so um, next up we have um, uh, Teresa Knapp Gordon uh, for public comment. Public comment is uh, three minutes and so um, I will turn it over to um, Mrs. Gordon. Ms. Gordon, oh yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Teresa Knapp Gordon, president of the Little Rock Education Association, and I'm excited about all of the great news that Mr. Ford just shared with us. Um, great news regarding our students and, and our educators in the Little Rock School District. I do want to begin this evening by just taking a moment um, regarding the loss of Don Akins, uh, a longtime security guard in the district. He um, worked at many of our high schools, Central, um, McClellan, and Southwest High School. He actually retired and came back to work in the Little Rock School District. Um, and we lost him recently. His services will be this weekend, and he will be greatly missed. I do want to talk to you for just a minute this evening about a couple of items. Um, the first being the proposal to outsource the custodians at the new JA Fair K-8 school. Um, we have outsourced custodians in the past and I have um, spoken against it every single time. So uh, I want to remind the board that our custodians in our schools are mentors to our students. They know them by name, and they serve as role models for our students. They are part of our Little Rock School District family. Many attended our schools and have children, grandchildren, and other family in our schools. Our custodians that work for our district have a vested interest in our schools and their success, unlike an outsourced person. When the district outsources our employees, it hurts our community as, as a whole by causing more people, including our students, to be without benefits like health insurance because the outsourced, outsourced company controls the hours of their employees so they don't have to pay those benefits. When we don't value our employees, it makes it more likely that those employees will then send their children to other schools like charter schools and encourage others in their family to do the same. I also want to point out that when management says that we can't keep enough custodians hired, we need to be asking why. Is it because we're not paying them a decent wage for the work they are required to do? Is it because we hold them accountable for work that they are not trained to do? Is the workload too much for them? We need to look at the root cause and fix it and solve the problem. It's what we tell teachers to do all the time. I also want to speak just a moment about the Little Rock 69. Um, I know there was a discussion about that at a recent board meeting. Um, I did check with our attorneys who would know if um, any of the cases are in circuit court. And it is, um, it is their understanding that there are no cases pertaining to the Little Rock 69 in circuit court at this time. I encourage you to take action to recall their discipline and make them whole by reinstating their pay. And finally, I would like to encourage the board to reinstate teacher and student board members that were sitting on the board each month. Those seats were chosen each month and, and there was a teacher of the month and a student of the month who served on the board as extra teacher members. I encourage you to do that again um, to make the board more inclusive. That's all I have. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. You were right on time with with that. Um, thank you for 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 your comments, and we appreciate you. Okay. Next on our agenda, Superintendent, was 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 that our only comment? Uh, a verbal comment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. Okay, moving uh, next on our agenda is the district reports. Uh, the first um, report we will hear from is from our certified uh, PPC. And reporting on that is Miss Austin. Is she on? Here, thank you. Yes. Good evening to everyone. Um, my report is very brief. I know you all were expecting um, the personnel policy manual, at least part of it last month. And we had to go back to the drawing board, the administrators, myself, and um, the president of the LREA, Teresa Knapp Gordon. We had to include some things um, that had to be there in regards to um, coming off of the level five and the, the, the plan to get us off of that. And so we have made some great progress um, with our meetings and updating the personnel policy manual. And so on our um, meeting, which is the second Monday of this month, March the 8th, I mean, next month, March the 8th, we will then, I will take the information back to the PPC where they will review and or adopt the changes. And then as soon as that takes place, then you will be notified through administration from one of the RRs, Robert Robinson or Randy Rutherford, and they will present that information to you all next month during that time. So we are making some, some gains uh, because we do have to have specific language in there that will um, benefit the district in being off of the, um, the level five. So that's all that I have for my report. Well, thank you, um, Mrs. Austin. We uh, appreciate you and we appreciate your service and uh, everything that you do. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is a, a report from our classified staff. Good evening. <clears throat> thank you, President Hatter. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, our report for the classified PPC will also be very brief tonight as well. Um, this week, um, two times this week, the classified PPC have been working diligently with the communications department, Ms. Pamela Smith's team, to work on um, clarifying the criteria for the classified employee of the year recognition program. And I believe we have some great information to present to her tomorrow. Um, so we're excited about that. And I just wanted to provide everyone with an update. We are still working on attempting to fill our child nutrition and our transportation um, positions on the classified PPC team. Um, I've got the, both of the, uh, those directors of those departments are working um, to attempt to help us. Um, I talked with both of those directors to see about um, making sure that they had paper forms so that um, all of our employees in, the, in those groups know that there are seats available. I think that by via technology only was not enough to get the word out there. I also reached out to Ms. Teresa Knapp Gordon, uh, president of the LREA last night, and also Ms. Lakeitha Austin, chair of the certified PPC, to also help provide us any names or any assistance that, to um, have those positions filled. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, if, if you uh, guys could stay online, uh, Mrs. Austin, and of course, Miss Easton, you're here with us all night. Um, I'm going to open it up for uh, uh, questions from um, any of the directors. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Unmute, and um, I'll direct that traffic if y'all have any questions. Do you have any questions? Okay, three, two, one. Hearing that there's none, um, thank you, Ms. Easton, Easton, and thank you, Mrs. Austin. We appreciate your report and your time and service. Next up on the agenda, we have um, a report from our community schools. 
uh, our community school update. And we have uh, Dr. Jay Bark. He is with the city of Little Rock and he will provide a report on um, the progression and what is going on with our uh, community schools. Uh, Dr. Bark. Great. Um, thank you, Ms. Hatter. Uh, good to see everyone. And I'm going to be joined by Mr. Darian Smith, um, my partner in all things uh, community school related. Uh, uh, we really have uh, developed a uh, a great working relationship over over the months, and uh, and we really work as a team, and we'll we'll present tonight as a team. Um, I think I think the, Mr. Smith, are you gonna get the PowerPoint going? Or Ms. Smith has. All right, great. Um, thanks. So um, you know, I think it's uh, safe to say that you know through much of recent decades. Uh, there was a, a fairly high wall between uh, the city of Little Rock and the Little Rock School District. There was not the kind of uh, mutually beneficial engagement that um, uh, we see in the healthiest uh, communities um, across the United States. And uh, Mayor Scott um, uh, came into office deeply dedicated to, uh, to bringing that wall down. And uh, that has happened in a variety of ways. Um, and uh, next slide. We've seen a variety of, of partnerships really show themselves uh, across the last year. Um, we, um, in, the, in the mayor's first year in office, uh, frankly reading really targeted uh, some of the lowest achieving uh, readers uh, at a in-person uh, summer camp. When uh, COVID struck, uh, we had to pivot of course, and uh, uh, in partnership with the district, uh, we were able to provide Lexia, the uh, supplemental reading software uh, across the entire district. Uh, we had a variety of partnerships around COVID. Uh, I think most, uh, you know, most noticeably uh, were related to the, the massive meals program that was not just the district and the city, but really a variety of community partners, including World Central Kitchen and the, and the uh, Clinton Foundation. And of course, we had a variety of uh, partnerships around digital equi equity, uh, particularly in the areas of connectivity um, and uh, digital literacy. Um, and then uh, we, of course, continue to partner uh, and work on Ford NGL as it begins to flush out academies. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy with the, the, the greater variety of academies, especially related to public service that have come to the forefront. But what we're really going to focus on tonight, of course, is the community school model, which, um, which began to be implemented um, um, about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago. Um, I, um, my role as chief education officer, I think, was in many ways, um, it had been on the on the on the uh, in the plans for a number of uh, really since the mayor announced um, his um, um, his 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 in his race for for mayor, uh, but um, it really got uh, fast tracked when uh, the decision to move forward with the community school model was made, um, as the conversations about return to local control were taking place at the state board. Uh, level and the mayor at that point uh, committed uh, to uh, shift city dollars to the community school model uh, to partner with the district, um, and uh, then uh, the uh, the that came to be through a vote of the the city board. Um, and the community school model, I think many of you know the key pillars of the community school model, but I think it's important to 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 always remind folks of what the community school model includes when it's really fleshed out. The first of these is a clear recognition that no, no, uh, no matter how powerful uh, the teaching in a, in a school, no, no matter how, um, how effective the curriculum being offered in a school, that in many schools, really all of our schools, but especially schools in some of the most challenged neighborhoods in our community, that students really need uh, student supports uh, so that they can be their best academically. Whether that is healthcare, whether that is uh, whether that is uh, tutoring services, the variety of things that students need so they can really be their best, that has to happen uh, as part of the community school model. Tied to that, uh, the second pillar of the community school model is a real recognition that we can no longer see uh, the school day as just 180 days a year or so, 
and we can no longer see the school uh, school year is 180 days or so. The school uh, day is not a 745 to 245 phenomenon. We really have to think about expanding, enriching activities uh, that tie back to uh, the school day, but really are enriching students in a variety of different ways, whether that's arts-oriented uh, programming, whether that's coding and computer science program, those things that are really going to activate and energize students' learning so that they can really uh, uh, be their best. The third key pillar uh, of the community school model really um, is certainly very much tied to the school building, but really is not so much focused on the students themselves, but a recognition that we need to improve and better the community uh, from which those kids are, are, are coming that we need to provide a variety of engaging opportunities for family members, for community members at the school that will really allow those parents to be, to be their best. And so whether that is re-entry programming for, for parents, whether that is uh, digital literacy opportunities, whether that's English language learning courses, we've really got to present those kinds of opportunities to parents and community members and really treat the school building, this great facility, as a community hub, as a de facto community center. And then finally, the community school model really says, um, yes, the principals are, are the school leaders, the principals and the assistant principals, but we've really got to have a collaborative leadership style in that school if that school is really going to be at its best, especially related to all this variety of opportunities so that there is a good, deep, trusting relationship among teachers, parents, community members, um, at that school through the development of institutions such as as the community school council that really works together on an ongoing basis to build and, and evaluate uh, these uh, these programs. And so that's the model. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith to talk about kind of where we are with our, our implementation uh, of the model uh, uh, to date. Thank you, Dr. Barth. And I, I want to uh, also share that uh, Dr. Barth has been a pleasure to work with. Uh, and it's clear that the city of Little Rock has a vested interest in not just the city of, as, a, as a whole, but the Little Rock School District as well. Uh, as so as Dr. Poir pointed out, we've been on this journey of the community school model for about 13 months. Uh, started in earnest in last, last January, uh, where we were able to take a team of individuals uh, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, as well as Shreveport, uh, Louisiana, to visit uh, their forms of community schools which helped us pave the road of what we wanted community school model to look like in the city of Little Rock. And from that, we were able to host uh, virtual town halls uh, to in, in last spring to share our vision and hope for what the community school model would be in the Little Rock School District and in the city of Little Rock. Uh, and then fast forward to October of this past year, uh, we had the announcement of the Little Rock's inaugural community schools. I'm not gonna be able to do it as well as our students and staff did uh, in the video uh, that you can see on YouTube, uh, but I would like to introduce to you and to our viewing public, the new four community schools in Little Rock School District. Our first community school is Booker T. Washington Elementary School. And Booker T. Washington Elementary School is led by an outstanding leadership team of Ms. Alita Branch, who is the principal, and Ms. Mrs. Hazel Harris, who's the assistant principal, and our outstanding site coordinator, Ms. Angeline Johnson. Our second community school is Stevens Elementary School. Our leadership team there, and there are another outstanding team as well, is Mr. Philip Carlock, who's the principal, and Mrs. Barbara Griggs, who's assistant principal. And our outstanding coordinator at Stevens is Ms. Marthel Hadley. Then we have Chico Elementary. Uh, and Chico is led by a dynamic duel of Mrs. Gina Curry, who is the principal, and Mrs. Mildred Butler, excuse me, who is our assistant principal. And our team is led with our site coordinator there, Mrs. Nicole Chandler. And then finally, our fourth community school is Watson Elementary School, and they are led by another fantastic team, and Mrs. Stephanie Walker, who is the principal, and Mrs. Morgan Ely, who is the assistant principal, and our uh, site coordinator there, and he uh, last on board, but is eager to work, is Mr. Am, our Earl Graham. So we're excited about our leadership teams at each campus, and those are our four community schools uh, for Little Rock School District and the city of Little Rock. Our early work uh, that we've been working on, as I stated, the last 13 months, 
Uh, we began uh, in earnest uh, the last month and a half working on a needs assessment where we are asking our parents and our staff right now what they believe is the need for that particular school in that community. Uh, and from that, we will then begin to create a blueprint for what, what each individual community school will focus on. Our, our progress right now with the programs that we've put in place, uh, we have been funded for school pantries at three of the four sites. Uh, Stevens Elementary was one of the schools who already had a school pantry uh, in place. And so we will have school pantries also going into place at Chico, Watson, as well as Washington. Uh, we also uh, have health clinics at Stevens Elementary School and Chico Elementary. And of course, uh, the Chico Elementary Clinic will also service our students at Watson Elementary due to their proximity to each other. But we were looking for an opportunity to provide uh, health services for our students in Washington in the south part of our city. And so we have a partnership with our care to provide telehealth options for our students and families at Washington Elementary School. And then also we are having school gardens. Uh, we have a grant that we received. Um, we will have a full-time Farm Corps member who is already on staff working alongside Mrs. Chandler at Chico Elementary School to help us design and manage a school garden, uh, which will not only help uh, educate our students about where food comes from, how to grow your own food and how to support yourself, but it's also gonna be a resource for our schools and the community as well. Uh, because they're going to be able to, to take things out of the garden uh, once we get them up and going. So, Dr. Barth, I'm going to turn the grants back over to you. Sorry. Um, we do have um, a variety of grants that are um, uh, grant applications that are out right now. Uh, one is uh, in partnership with Forward Arkansas and a variety of other entities uh, that would be a federal uh, community school grant that would uh, provide the funding for the expansion of uh, uh, the, for the next school, uh, the next community school to come online. Uh, we've also got uh, a grant application uh, going in on um, in the next couple of days. Uh, it's due on Monday to the Wingate Foundation, uh, which is very interested in some of our after school and summer uh, program work. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about what I'm seeing as, 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 as my job is, of course, it's to work with, uh, with uh, Mr. Poor and Mr. Smith on, on the coordination work. Uh, but it also, um, you know, I'm, I'm the chief fundraiser in many ways for, for these efforts. Um, and that is what I see as one of my main jobs. And while the city money is there and we will use it, we've already used it to, uh, to, uh, to help cover some of, the, some of the costs related to the school gardens and the telehealth options. Uh, but I really want to uh, go out and get uh, grants, whether from the, the government or from private foundations uh, to help cover the cost of these uh, needs, cover the cost uh, of the needs, and then use the city money to really fill the void, the things that we can't get funded through, uh, through grant dollars. And so that will be uh, an important part of, of our work going forward. Um, and so I think we do have one uh, video that's uh, uh, just got produced, just hot off the, uh, and this is another partnership with Forward Arkansas um, and the Batesville Community School effort, which is also got off the ground about the same time. And so that's a very different community than Little Rock, but we've, uh, we've been uh, uh, partnered with them on a lot of this work as well. But here you'll see a little bit about uh, the community schools, uh, uh, its uh, uh, effort here in Little Rock. The challenges facing students didn't just come out of nowhere. When you get down to the core of it, each school is unique. It has strengths and weaknesses. You cannot be successful if you're hungry. You cannot be successful if you don't have the information that you need, if you don't have the resources, if you don't have the equipment that you need. What a community school model is, is trying to utilize the facility, utilize all the stakeholders to not only understand their needs but what they could bring to the table and then surround it with other resources that are a part of the larger community to make that community thrive. Neighborhoods are not equal in terms of the challenges that students face and this is a model that really promotes equity. We have a barbershop, we have our health clinic, also mental health services that we provide. We have OT, PT, and speech, and all of these are housed here in Stevens Elementary. We want those young people to grow up to be confident 
I think if you're cared for, you do become confident. We see students more likely to have high levels of attendance. We see lower disciplinary infraction rates. And ultimately, we see higher academic achievement. Our district is a heartbeat to the city of Little Rock. Every ounce of energy that we put in to support young people, it has a, a real return for all of us in terms of a better society. Many times people think equity is solely about race. It's not. It's about providing resources to areas of need. We were able to work with the Little Rock School District and a number of different foundations to produce 750,000 meals for those that are in need here in the city of Little Rock. And when you really have these strategic partnerships with teeth and resources and human capital, you're able to have even more solutions to the educational system. What I truly love about Stevens is our community involvement. There are so many people that are working towards these goals that it's gonna bring all of us together. But it's not just about transforming schools and academic success in those schools, it really is about transforming entire neighborhoods. We wanna focus on how do we get the community involved by listening to the community, understanding what those resources and needs are and provide those resources to have solutions for the greater good of not only our student, but our entire community and our city. I'm Marthel Hadley. My name is Darian Smith. I'm Mike Poor. I'm Mayor Frank Scott Jr. I'm Jay Barth. And I believe in community schools because I believe it takes a village to raise a child. Because they close the gaps. Because it will have a positive impact on our entire community. Because they have a proven track record of improving students' lives and improving the neighborhoods where those kids are coming of age. I believe in community schools because they provide equity to all of our students to do their best. So Ms. Hatter, Ms. Hatter, I think we're glad to answer any questions that folks have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Smith and uh, Dr. Barth for uh, giving uh, the presentation. That was a really good and great um, video as well as some good information that came out of that. Um, I will open it up to the board to see if they have any questions for you all, uh, board members. Do you have any uh, questions? Any one of the directors? Uh, Director Morney? Director Shandrick, hey, good morning. Hey, Jay, I know I got to speak with you. Can you hear me? You're a little choppy. All right. Yeah, I was just saying, Jay, I got to talk with Jay before, I think, um, the community school idea. And I don't know if you just uh, touched on this, but I know we kind of talked about, um, like, is there a possibility of schools to happen or some kind of programs for, like, out of school time for kids? Yeah, that's a fundamental component um, this morning, and um, that will that will be present at, at every uh, at every school. Uh, it will take different forms. Some, in some cases, it'll be after school. Some cases, it'll be summer school. Some cases, it'll be both. Uh, we are uh, surveying uh, parents, and of course, we're also carrying out focus groups with students um, as well to talk about what they really see as the kinds of programs that would most enrich them. And what we're seeing is in the initial, in the first uh, surveys that we've returned, uh, I don't want to prejudge everything, but we've got, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in computer science and math and the arts, uh, kind of writ large, uh, of, of, of arts, theater, dance, uh, music. Uh, that's another, those are kind of the three areas that are popping initially, and, but they're gonna, there's gonna be some variance across the schools mm -hmm. as well in terms of what the areas of greatest interest are. Great, great. Thank you. Well, thank you all for the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay. Um, the view I have, I can't see everyone, but Dr. Barth, as, as I uh, flip through this, I will ask, um, what have the parent and a community input been? I, I know you, you and uh, Mr. Smith have started. Jay, are you, Dr. Barth, are you able to see me? You're frozen on my end. I'm here. You yeah. are? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so my question is, what have the uh, families of those uh, four schools uh, been and then the surrounding uh, community um, input? Um, what are you guys finding right through your needs assessment? Yeah, it's certainly a work in progress. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think this is an area where, uh, and we've, we've talked with some of our national advisors, uh, 
uh, who have provided us um, uh, ongoing technical assistance. We've talked to them about this. COVID is a real challenge in this regard in terms of where we would normally uh, get that kind of feedback, of course, would be at community meetings, would it be at, you know, uh, neighborhood meetings. We have had uh, community school cafes, uh, which uh, because of COVID have had to be grab and go events rather than sit down sessions where we can really have that kind of uh, dialogue. Uh, so we're building in uh, focus groups um, to kind of, uh, to go along with the uh, survey responses that we're, we're getting back uh, right now as well. Um, and we're gonna really focus on uh, getting the surveys in for parents and staff members for the next uh, 10 days or so. Um, and then we're really gonna begin to use that data um, and um, and the, the the data from other sources, such as the early de uh, development instrument, which is a um, an assessment of all the kindergartners at, at the schools, we're using that information as well. And um, I think it's important to note that we are also developing um, advisory councils uh, filled with stakeholders from that local school uh, that will be ongoing serve as an ongoing needs assessment uh, mechanism uh, to really evaluate what's working, what's not working, how are the needs of the community changing across time? So um, some challenges related to COVID, uh, unquestionably, but we are we are really continuing to, to get voice from the community in a variety of different ways. Thank you. Um, my last question to you um, uh, uh, is either to you, Dr. Barth, or to um, Mr. Smith. Uh, what type of training uh, have the community school coordinators been through? Are, are, are they using um, any of the community schools court um, coordinators uh, curriculum that that's out that are courses that are national um, and if so uh, who is the provider or a trainer for, for that because there are uh, free courses as well through like NEA and and uh, different ones yeah I'll, I'll let uh, I'll just say one thing we did get an NEA foundation uh, grant uh, from um, in, again in partnership with Forward and um, and the Batesville schools, uh, that has provided uh, some of the tr training for uh, for the coordinators. Uh, that's ongoing, uh, so it's not a one shot thing. It's really an ongoing process. Um, but um, uh, Mr. Smith and I and the four coordinators, we also meet uh, every week to problem solve. They also meet as a group away from us and uh, really have built a great deal of camaraderie kind of across the campus. So I think they're really helping to train each other as well on an ongoing basis, but we are looking to national folks as well through uh, through some of those grants. Okay, great. Um, Smith, Mr. Smith. To add there? And, and as Dr. Barr said, one of those organizations is the Community Schools uh, Coalition, and we did have a, a half day training uh, with them, uh, with our coordinators, as well as uh, other stakeholders. Uh, to support the work that we're going to be doing moving forward. Okay, great. Um, and two, uh, you guys may already know, but uh, just a point of reference, and then we'll go to Director Adams. Um, the NEA, they also have the um, the community school coordinator uh, curriculum, and and it's uh, they meet national. You know, they go in and and they have other community coordinators across the nation, and and they meet um, uh, weekly or biweekly, and. And so that is another cost-effective way uh, to um, ensure that uh, our coordinators are getting the, the the maximum training. And I could send you that information if needed, as well as the contact. Uh, Director Adams. Thank you, Ms. Hatter. Um, first, a comment, then a question. Uh, comment is is really um, thank you, and, and I'm very encouraged. I think uh, to Dr. Barth and Mr. Smith for your collaboration and the. And the partnership with the city we this is something certainly that uh, miss johnson and i did not experience when we served on the board before and so it's really great to have this kind of partnership with the city um, in this way um, dr barth you mentioned the possible you mentioned uh in your comments about the ex expanding and i wanted to know what are the what's the process and the timing about w how we would how this kind of program would be expanded in the little arc school district yeah, so anything related to expansion is obviously an ongoing conversation with Mr. Poor, um, uh, Mr. Smith, myself, um, others from the city, um, because of course, it's funding is, is required uh, to make that happen. We 
certainly hope that we get some external funding that will make it easier and, and also provide uh, multi-year uh, commitments, uh, which is also very important. Uh, um, so I think, uh, you know, to be determined, uh, I think our, our, our very clear hope was uh, that we could, you know, continue to grow um, across campuses um, in, in the next uh, few years. I think that's still our intent, but we all know that that other factors will come into play, both where resources come from and whether they're available, and then of course what the budgets of both the city and the and the district look like um, over the next few years. So I mean, we're not gonna, we can't do it. If, if there's not the resources to do it. And we hope that we can get external funding either from the federal government or from foundations to make that happen. And we've, I will also say that we've also, I've had some very promising conversations with some uh, community-based organizations who may be interested in doing a multi-year commitment as well uh, to support a community school. That would be fantastic, right? Because that's really deep community buy-in and we hope that that comes to fruition. Thank you very much. I don't know if Mr. Poor wants to add anything on that. I, I will. I, I text Mr. Smith this, <laughs> so I'll, I'll go ahead and take his thunder. But you know, we also did this needs assessment for all campuses, and so you know, we know that the targeted approach is built to the schools that that have greater needs. But we also know that every school has strengths and weaknesses, and there we're asking them to use their needs assessment to help build their school improvement plan because many of those things are culture builders as well as connectors out into the community that they may be able to do on their own. Vicki, I think you're muted. Sorry, well. <laughs> Uh, okay, I was started talking, but uh, Director Nolan, do you have a comment, a question? Yes. I and have, then uh, Director Woods after you. I have um, two. The first question is about the sustainability of our programs and the funding sources. Um, and I just wondered if you could speak to that because that is an ongoing concern that we, you know, make promises that we then may not be able to keep if the funding isn't there. So could you speak to that? Sure, um, and I, I'm very, very conscious of it, and we're we're really building in sustainability plans all on the way. And that's as I as I noted earlier, I'm really trying my best uh, not to use city money, so that that city money could be there as a stopgap if if we can't if you know if money were to dry up. And we're also you know most of the the grants we're looking at are multi-year grants, which I think is really important in terms of of, um, of sustainability. Um, so, um, you know, I think we, we, we always want to under promise and over deliver, but, uh, but I do think that, uh, we're deeply conscious of sustainability and, um, you know, I don't know that I, I have, you know, the kind of insurance, obviously, uh, this is an area area where this mayor is deeply committed to this work. This city board has shown its commitment. Um, this administration from LRSD has shown its commitment, but uh, we, we hope that that really, we see, begin to see the kinds of success we wanna see, and we are gonna certainly um, um, measure everything and have data that, that reinforces our, uh, 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 our evidence of success that we can then uh, take back to decision makers at the, at the city and the district, but then also take uh, to, to donors as well. We're, we're taking data very, very seriously. Thanks, so, um, Director Nolan. From the district standpoint, uh, we have that have been identified as community schools. Uh, fortunately, we have some 1003 funds that we have been able to utilize to help uh, begin the groundwork for our care to ed piece, which is our leader in me, because all of our uh, community schools will be leader in me schools. Uh, so we're utilizing that funding that will uh, go away in a year and a half uh, to go ahead now and train the staffs uh, so that they can begin that implementation process for the leader and me. Uh, but currently our our coordinators are paid out of district funds to support that uh, effort at this time. Uh, but as Dr. Barf indicated, we are seeking uh, funding outside of the district and outside of the city uh, to continue to support and expand the work around the community school model. Um, 
thank you. And so I have one more question and then potentially a follow-up comment right after that. But these four schools that were selected, um, and I, I think this was touched on, but what was the process as far as were these, um, did, did the CAB approve the selection of these four schools before we were seated? Did it go to Secretary Key? Uh, and this may be a question for Mr. Porter, but just the selection process um, as far as the district. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it first and, and really what we did is we looked at the schools that had um, kind of some of our most uh, severe challenges in terms of uh, previous academic performance we also looked at it from a strength point of view uh, we also looked at it from a, where they were located in the community and we really tried to be thoughtful and considerate about having you know somewhere on the on the east side of, of our city more or less which represents Washington uh, on the south side really it kind of became a combo effect because we knew Watson really needed it. It's a, a school inside of a neighborhood um, and, and, and it has many challenges um, and it has previously not scored very well academically. Chico, kind of a school on the rise, but it had the, the, the whole healthcare clinic. And so kind of thinking about those two as a package and then Stevens also made sense because we had some structures in place that, that fit the community school model and it also fits well right into an area of need within the city. Um, in future expansion, we've talked about um, the possibility of, of J Fair as being one of the campuses and then potentially some other campuses in the Southwest. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Board. Um, my question was really about the um, decision, the final decision making process and which entity, because I'm just trying to get a feel for whether or not those were decisions that were made um, prior to this board being seated or if these are new decisions that are coming up now. It was made prior uh, to you guys ever being seated because uh, we actually started to do the decision making probably we finalized it this past summer. And that was the selection of these schools, the four schools? Correct. Okay. Um, well, the reason, the reason I was asking is just um, we haven't necessarily defined exactly which items um, would need board approval in terms of the community school model. And since this is, you know, this falls into the categories of developing new things, which often are, those are things that go before the board when you have something that you can say, we've never done this before and it's something new, um, or something that impacts our budget. And so I just wanted, you know, we, it might be helpful for our board at a future date to really explore um, what our expectations are as far as our, our um, process, our approval process for, um, future developments on this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Director Nolan, are you saying as far as moving forward with the community schools? Because there have been um, conversations before the mm -hmm. election of all of us to write to the board with the um, community schools. Like, um, so are, are you, just for clarity, are, are you saying that um, things requiring a budget approval for the community schools to continue to go forth for them to come before the board every time? I'm, I'm saying when we are, oh, I'm so sorry. Man, I did not mean to speak over you. Were you um, I'm saying that when we are making, when there's a new decision being made as far as designation of a new school, um, as we go through it, another round and we move forward with other um, additional schools that may be added to this list or selections of um, significant programs or services that we are adding. If those are things that ultimately our district would be responsible for in terms of budget, um, then we need to be involved in, in in that. I'm not talking about decisions that have been made up until this point. I'm just trying to, to create some clarity about making sure that we are um, we are signing off on decisions that ultimately will impact um, our budget and our schools going forward. Okay, okay, that's true. Um, I believe that they would come before us uh, if, if that's the case, but of course we'll tackle that one no matter when more schools come, come online um, or community schools. Yes. Uh, uh, Director Nolan, have you finished? <laughs> if, so we can move on to Director Wood, and then we'll wrap up with uh, Director Calloway. 
And just so uh, we're clear, we're on community schools and asking questions um, uh, that will be beneficial to either the rest of the board or the community audience watching. Uh, Director Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Barth, Mr. Smith, thank you very much for your work on this. And the first comment I have is that I hope that you will invite the board to come and see the community schools in action as often as we can be included and given the you know odd times we live in now but also to come and help i mean i i want i want to be you know boots on the ground helping uh pull this off and, and i know that many other board members uh want to want to serve that way also so please let us know how how we can help practically you know from time to time um i hope in the I've got a, a March 18th um, is the next community school cafe. Um, they'll, I think it starts at five, maybe at four, I think at 5 p.m. We'll get you information. Um, that's a great opportunity to come out and um, while folks are coming, grab and go and getting food, you may, may get uh, pushed into work, uh, moving some food boxes or something. Uh, but uh, that's a great opportunity, I think, to see, um, see some of that, that work in, in uh, going on. Yeah, good. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Barth, the next thing I have to say might, might be outside of your house, Will House just a little bit, but Mr. Smith and Mr. Poor, I hope that we will use this model. I hope that we will do it and do it well, do it very well, and use this as a recruiting tool in neighborhoods where we face competition with, you know, like charter schools and whatever in, in the same area. And that might involve um targeting well not so much targeting but broadening our target student group to be students that are involved in non-lrsd schools and and meeting the needs of their families as well and giving them an opportunity to come in and see our schools and and maybe build relationships with our staff and uh and and build a rapport with lrsd so that maybe we could win their trust uh going forward um, it's not really a question, just a comment, and that's all I have, Madam President. Thank you. I appreciate you, uh, Director Wood. Uh, Dr. Barth, I do have a, this will be the last question, closing out um, questions and discussion on this item. Um, Director Hatter, you went on mute again, and then just to remind you, Ms. Callaway is also in the queue that wanted to ask a question. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I, okay. Okay, um, I was on mute, so I will start over. Um, Dr. Barth, <laughs> uh, just uh, bringing um, back and, and, and refreshing my memory to um, a conversation we had in, I think it was either in the end of December or January, and then we, we, we was um, de discuss discussing um, sustainability, and I expressed the, 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 the need to make sure that there's a groundswell of community support to help um, keep uh, the, the sustainability of the school strong to where um, communities and neighborhoods are not receiving something and then having it taken away because of it being uh, strongly organizationally um, uh, pushed and, um, uh, and funded. So is, have, have there been um, any uh, sustainability um, progress from the one from the community uh, right to buy in and to keep these things going uh, because community schools is really about the families in the school and then it's the community around it that use it as right as a central hub. I, and then I see that you touched on some of the things we, we talked about back then. Yeah, I think I think you're totally totally on target uh, for a community school model to succeed. There has to be community buy-in. Um, there has to be teacher buy-in. There has to be staff buy-in. Uh, there has to be buy-in by all the stakeholders. And um, and I will I will uh, we are we are working hard in that regard. We're very conscious of it. There are some special challenges at this moment, as we all know, in terms of of community engagement because of. Uh, the times in which we live, which we hope are are um, are subsiding, and we can kind of return to normal and um, and 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 do things in ways that we know work. It has been challenging. We've had to try to be creative. We also are are dealing with, I think, uh, parents who are a little overloaded by 
by virtual, um, virtual communication. Um, so it's 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 a challenging moment, but we are doing what we can. We certainly are using the community. We have used the community school cafes as education and and communication um, um, uh, modes. We certainly are using surveys and other things as a way to really send very strong and important signals that we 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 have to hear the voice of the community in helping to build uh, this model in a way that meets the needs of that community. And, I, and I'd like to add to that, President Hatter, that we will be conducting community surveys as well to get community input uh, on the needs assessment, as well as uh, we pointed out that each school will have an advisory committee. And a part of that, we will have community representatives on those advisory committees in each campus. Okay. All right, well, um, I am glad to see um, um, you guys uh, moving forward on this and um, er er earlier conversations um, um, had and, and, and how uh, you guys have, have implemented uh, those uh, thoughts and, and feedback. And I just look forward to um, continuing to talk to you guys and then watching the growth of our community schools and appreciative of the partnership with the city. Uh, Director Callaway, I did not forget to get you. Uh, Director Callaway, you are recognized. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions, and I'll try to make it brief. Uh, first of all, we're going to pay the directors from out of our budget for uh, these community schools. And my question on that, are they certified or classified people? Is there, a, is there a salary scale if they are uh, 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 people, if they are teachers or uh, will they be paid on the teacher scale or is there a whole different scale? Because that's something we really need to look in to because we're talking about redu possible reduction in force. And when we have a reduction in force and we have other things we need to look into that we need to pay for, uh, custodial services and adding custodians to the, the mix and then I also like to know if this does not work they these schools will not uh, Dr. Barr uh, turn into charter schools and uh, then I also heard uh, somebody say that we're, we're trying not to use city money and I thought the city was supposed to be all in on helping establish these schools. Now, uh, maybe I missed that, but those are some questions I have. Well, I'll take I'll take the last question. And I'll let Mr. Smith tackle the the the, the pay uh, issue. The city money is there. We will use it. We have already started to use it for for the telehealth program at Washington and for, um, for um, uh, it will also help with the, the school gardens, the cool pantries, we're gonna to continue to use it. I was just saying that we are also going to try to get grant dollars to cover the cost and use the city dollars to kind of help fill the void when we have a need, identifiable need, but we haven't found the grant money to actually cover the cost. We will use the city money there. I was just saying, I'm trying to be conservative with the city money and using grant money when we can first. That's all I was saying. But the city money is there; it's not going away. Um, and and I'm smart enough to know that there, we need to use it to uh, for 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 us to show the the continued need. Uh, but I do think there is a. It's great if we can get grant dollars to cover these costs uh, uh, and use the city money in uh, a more careful and um, and kind of filling the voids. Does that help? Yeah, oh, yes, it does help. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just make a comment on the on the charter school comment. I mean, these are traditional public schools, and uh, these are and they are fantastic uh, traditional public schools. And what we see as our goal is to use this model to help traditional public education thrive uh, in this community. And I think go, to go back to Ms. Wood's point, I think this really can create a very competitive um, um, uh, vision for what traditional public education can look like as an innovative endeavor um, in uh, in the city of, of Little Rock. And 
Mrs. Uh, Director Callaway, as it relates to the salary, uh, the positions are uh, non-certified positions, uh, and the salary range is below a starting teacher salary. Uh, but we, we believe it's competitive uh, initially. Obviously, we would like to pay all of our staff more, and, and our teachers and staff definitely deserve to pay more. But our funding currently is Title IV funds that we're using for our community site coordinators positions. Okay, Mr. Smith, uh, your coordinators, are they into social work, or do they have any background or hours in education? Uh, Actually, they come with a, a, a variety of backgrounds. Uh, as far as education directly, no, not a not a teacher's license. No, but they. Uh, what I'm uh, what I'm saying is they might have taken some classes in education, you know, well, and uh, they, they're not necessarily certified. Now that I know that they're not, but uh, like, are what are their backgrounds to the background. going to get uh, Director Callaway? Um, if we get into we are that question, I understand that question, but then <clears throat> getting into um, personnel um, issues because of um, and, and they're easy. I, those personnel members are easy to identify because we only have four of them. Um, I think uh, a question, a, 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 another way to a, a answering that question is or asking that question maybe whether or not they met the qualifications and I think they probably uh, do, Mr. Smith uh, do you want to answer that from um, like a global you yes. know a uh, larger so, Thank you President Hatter uh, one of the major focus around the job description was in work in the area of social and family support uh, okay. and so that's the criteria uh, by which we um, interviewed and selected candidates for. I guess that's what I was trying to ask you, Mr. Smith. I, you know, I was not uh, asking specifically what, how much anybody was going to make, but uh, in the, we, we're in a, a financial crunch here and we're up to planning our new budget and whatever. I feel like I felt as if that was a pertinent question. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Director um, Callaway, for uh, your questions and uh, making it clear on um, the reason for that. Uh, Dr. J. Barth, Barth or Mr. Smith, do you have anything else to um, add to um, your presentation? Thanks for your engagement and interest and questions, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the near future to continue updating you on, on our progress. Thank you. And Dr. Thank Barth, both, both of us, yes. Thank y'all. Okay. All right. So um, moving um, into our next um, items are our, our, our consent items. And uh, we, we have um, our, our minutes, our resolution to adopt the Pulaski County multi-jurisdiction uh, um, hazard mediation plan, and then the uh, personnel uh, changes. So uh, I take it you guys had the opportunity to review those consent items. So um, can I get a motion on the consent item? Or is there any discussion form? President Hatter, just real quick, um, we did have uh, one board member that did bring, make us aware that we had very minor changes to make on the minutes. Mm -hmm. And so um, as part of your motion, we would want to say that the, those minutes have been adjusted or tweaked um, and, and hopefully that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. That's President, President Hatter, are we uh, making a motion on the consent all, all three of these or just one at separate separate at a time no uh, we're, we're doing it as, as a package um there's there isn't anything um okay. heavy in those uh the corrections in the minutes they were uh, very small um uh, corrections like uh leaving off a letter stuff like that and then uh the other one is, is just the um, emergency management plans we have 
And then the last thing, the personnel uh, changes, is just the retirements and things like that as yes. well. Okay. All uh, right. I, so I would like to move that we on uh, we uh, I, vote, I move that we accept the, the the minutes, the resolution to adopt the, the Pulaski County Multi Jurist uh, Hazard Mitigation Plan and personnel changes. I move that we accept those as a consent agenda. I will second that motion. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So uh, our consent action items have uh, passed. The next thing is our financial and support services. And uh, with that, we are we. This is uh, the first thing we're getting into our, our bond refunding and extension of of our debt millage um, options. So uh, we will go into that presentation. You guys, as I just want to just remind you guys that uh, part of my responsibility is really to uh, help fa facilitate our uh, verbiage, uh, our, our our questions. And so if you guys could uh, start formulating those questions as uh, Mr. Trumper go through, uh, that will be great in any talk or discussion. So um, Mr. Trumper. Uh, good morning, President Hatter. Um, is uh, Kelsey on with us? I am, I am. Hello, Mr. Kelsey. Trumper. Can y'all hear me okay? Good. And, and before uh, Mr. Trump gets started, I'm not sure if Mr. Poor want to introduce this or not, but I can as well. Of course, you all know we went out uh, to the voters twice, uh, once in 2017, of course, this past year, uh, and both uh, times failed. But we still have great needs in the district for capital improvement. Uh, it's going to play a big part in our three-year budget planning as far as the exit criteria, uh, because we got we have to have funds and we need significant capital improvement funds. For our, our buildings out there, average age our buildings about 70 years old. So uh, we'll have to address it. Uh, if we don't address it now, it has to be addressed probably sometime in the immediate future. But this is just giving you some options out there. And this is uh, actually a recommendation the way we would go from administration. We're not asking for voters to increase our current millage rate. Uh, we didn't want to uh, put that burden on the, on, the, on the taxpayers, but we think extending our debt service mill out. Uh, doing a refunding and doing a debt extension was the way to go, and that's why we proposed it twice in the past. So, uh, Mr. Trump is going to go through uh, a calendar out there, and I'll share my screen as well, and whatever else you may want to share, and any questions you might have uh, to kind of inform us of what we need to do if we choose to go this way or not. But uh, just the bottom line, we, we will have to make some decisions, some tough decisions concerning our facilities out there. So, we've been very fortunate over the past, uh, no, past 12 years since I've been here to had some opportunities to do some refunding through Stevens Inc. We've saved about 30 million that we put back into our facilities. Along with, uh, we had our funds, which was stimulus funds in 2009, uh, 2010, that we were able to catch up on some roofing projects and different things like that. Um, we have uh, some ESSA funds that may be helping out with some of our uh, fresh air units and some of our ventilation things. But I mean, overall, we still have quite a bit of need. So that was just a kind of introduction, but want to thank uh, Mr. Trumper for being on here and always really willing to, to stay up with us and, and give us uh, whatever advice and uh, answer any questions we always have. So, Thank you, Mr. Bailey uh, and President Hatter, Mr. Poor, members of the board. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Uh, what I think uh, you have before you or I think is a, is a timeline uh, that includes either a spring election or a fall election. And in this timeline, we have different dates that certain items have to take place and what those items are and those responsibilities. And so just to kind of go through a spring election or a fall election, uh, Arkansas school districts at present uh, are allowed to have a special election to vote on a millage the second Tuesday of the month up to their annual election. And the Little Rock School District uh, annual school election is in the fall. And of course, this year will be November the 2nd. So kind of looking at the timeline going for the next several months, that if the district were to decide to go to the voters in, in the spring, and I, I, I used the election date of June 8th, which I guess is in summer, but I guess technically spring doesn't start till June 20th, so we'll, or summer, so we call it a spring election. 
the first thing that the board has to do is to approve what is called a proposed budget of expenditures. And this has to be done every year by every school district in the state uh, before the election. And then it has to be published at least 60 days uh, before uh, the election. And so that date, 60 days, would be no later than April the 18th. And then uh, bond council would prepare uh, the ballot, which would be then sent to the Pulaski County Election Commission. And there you can see that uh, we have that date of uh, March 29th. And then we would receive from the uh, Arkansas Democrat Gazette the proof of publication of the budget uh, no later than April the 12th, just to make sure everything was in order. And then um, the ballots, the and absentee ballots, have to be delivered to the Election Commission at least 46 days or no later than 46 days. And so that day would be April 22nd. And then what happens is the Pulaski County Election Commission will publish two notices. Uh, prior to the laws changing, I think it was 19, there were actually four notices, but now it's just two notices. Uh, the first one is at least 20 days before the election, and the second one is at least 10 days before the election, and then, the, of course, the election would be held on June 8th if that's the, the date that the board chose to go with. So that's kind of the timeline for a spring election. If a spring election is not the choice and the board would choose to go to the election in the fall, the annual school election, which is November 2nd, then we picked your August 26th date where that proposed budget would be approved by the district. And then it has to be published in the local paper no later than September the 2nd, uh, because anything after that would be less than 60, less than 60 days. Uh, so the preparation of ballot would take place on the 30th. We would then receive the proof of publication no later than September the 9th. And then 46 days before the November election would be uh, the absentee ballots delivered no later than September the 16th. And then, of course, we would work with the Pulaski County Election Commission to publish the notice of election, first publication 20 days, second publication at least 10 days, and then that election would be held uh, on November the 2nd. So um, typically speaking, if the election is successful, uh, funding uh, can be generated, for example, in June, the district could have funds uh, in uh, uh, probably late July, early August, in November. They could have funds sometime in December, early January. But these are the steps that have to take place other than the campaign effort uh, for a school district in Arkansas to hold an election for a tax initiative. Let me stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, President Hatter. Okay. Uh Alrighty, I cannot see because we're in um, presentation mode. So I'm going to ask: uh, Are there any uh, questions? Right. Okay. There we go. Are, are are there any questions by for by from the directors on this motion at the moment? Director Wood. I have a quick question. Can we choose any uh, second Tuesday of the month to do this, or are we limited to? Uh, November 2nd or June 8th or, or what, what what are our constraints with regard to election day? No, Mr. Wood, I'm glad you asked that question. At present, at present, unless things were to change with this session, uh, with the uh, approval from the Arkansas Department of Education, you can hold an election the second Tuesday of the month up to your annual school election. So that could include July, August, September, and so forth, assuming it's approved by the Department of Education. Okay. Thank you for that question. Director Adams. Thank you. Um, so the decision to, to, to pursue this path, you know, whether or not really in any ways, I think it's a political decision for the board to figure out if it's the way to go and strategically how to go. But from a financial perspective, um, do you see Mr. Trumper or Mr. Bailey, is, are there advantages or disadvantages to doing it as early as possible such as in june or to doing at a, at a later date in november trump i don't know if you want to go first you want me to I, uh I, I would think taking advantage of the current rates where they are they're getting some favorable rates back and uh, mr trump can kind of talk to you uh about those as well so not sure where those rates are going to go that's why we really pursued to try to do it last year because the rates were really on the decline with the pandemic uh of course, with the lower rates, that means more money you can actually bring in on this or based to our, our cap that we actually set out there. But Mr. Trump, you want to 
So I'm no, gonna... no, Mr. Bailey, that that's a great point. I mean, the, the, the interest rates that the that the district would receive will will honestly have a direct reflection, of course, on the payment uh, and the amount of money that can be raised. And up through, for the most part of 2020, uh, we were in a very very uh, com uh, low interest rate environment. And I would say we are still in a low interest rate environment. But I would also say, over the last two weeks, we have seen a rise in interest rates and there, there are several factors that are being thrown around. A lot of those factors are the concern of inflation and with inflation uh, that there would be rising interest rates. Uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, which is kind of our benchmark uh, uh, during 2020, got as low as around uh, the, this 0.6 per uh, point 0.6 range we're now at 1.5 percent or slightly above that so over the last couple of weeks we have had a rise in interest rates the bids that we have received from the sales at this point uh depending upon its maturity have still been very competitive and have been very good interest rates but they are higher now than they were uh when i met with you all back in january and so you know we just don't know uh where they're going to be at the end of the year we have a better feel for them on the short term than the long term but that's uh, kind of the environment that we're in today so so it would be if, if i understand correctly then again just from a financial perspective that if the board decided to take the path that the educated guess would be that it would be to the to the district's financial advantage to do it sooner than later as long as it, it yeah, that's kind of a, that's a great good question the guess would be yeah if we're making the assumption that we think rates are going to be shorter in the shorter term as opposed to the end of the year and of course i say that but i could they could also be lower at the end of the year as you well know mr adam there's just no way of knowing we just we just have a fair better feel for where they are now versus eight months from now or seven months from now right yeah that thank you that that's kind of why i put it the educated guess because i don't want to i don't want to lock you into you know saying more or meaning more than you than you know and it's not what that wouldn't be fair thank you thank you that was a great question uh mr adams as well for me i would have a chime in as well it would give us opportunity if we went sooner than later we could actually have this uh factor in job budget for our next fiscal year as well so uh we do have to address like i said capital needs out there so um, next fiscal year, when we have those roofs that need to be replaced or those boilers that go out, there's a hundred thousand dollars a piece and different things like that. Where are we going to actually pull that money from? So we have to make those decisions whether it's going to come out of our fund balance or are we going to cut, you know, additional personnel down to that amount to to alleviate some of those expenses, or are we going to look at something like this? So, so are you saying, Mr. Bailey, that that when we are thinking about our budget concerns, which is one of our major concerns, that so, that that if we did this and we were successful, that it could make our budget look better and we're in a healthier shape in the, in the coming fiscal year than than if we did it later and we were successful later. That's correct. It would mitigate uh, us dipping into our fund balance and use for emergency purposes because we have, like I said, our building's average age is seventy years old. We've experienced a lot of our boilers and different things going out from the pipes first now, but. They just go out throughout the year in chillers and different other things, and those things aren't cheap when you're looking at the size of the units we actually have out there. So, okay. but it, it will give us opportunity because our budgets are due in September of each year. That's the deadline to submit. So, if we did something, you know, prior to that, well, that was a proposal, we could always write that into, you know, our three year budget plan or, you know, our immediate budget plan. So, okay. I'll throw in one other consideration to your comment, Mr. Adams, and that is that obviously the sooner we do it, the better chance it has of having an impact on, on young people too, with the things that, that we outline in, in, in the next, in this coming slide. But, you know, we can go make things that are gonna make learning environments better and safer uh, for students. And, and of course, that's our main motivation uh, to seek this type of uh, debt extension. Ms. Hatter, I don't know if you want me to save this question for later, but I do have a question about timing. If, if we did went this direction, and if it was approved by the voters about the timing of how long it would take uh, to do the pl the thought the plan renovations at the McClellan campus, and but I could I'm, I'm glad to delay that question till later or ask that now if you think it would be appropriate. Uh, while we do need to uh, look at the building plans, I think they got one more slide uh, to uh, show. So uh, let's pause right th right there. Um, two, we need to look at the landscape of our city and 
I mean, so uh, let's, uh, Mr. Trumper. It actually be me on this slide. Um, if Kelsey will put this up and, and then our team will Oh, I'm to... sorry, um, Superintendent Poor. Thank okay. you. Let me let me find it. I don't think it was attached. Was it attached to the agenda item here? And and and, and just to be clear, this all uh, this is all part of the same package, correct? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I didn't get it separated. First off, I want to share that as board members, you get to help determine the, the buckets, so to speak, of where we would want to use these resources if it's approved. The one caveat that we always bring up is the fact that we have a uh, commitment as a part of a lawsuit to take care of Cloverdale Middle School, which in, in our eyes is the campus that needs the most dramatic improvements. And our solution is to move it to McClellan with a totally new campus and then also bring in uh, two other elementary schools into that campus to create a K-8 environment in the Southwest, which we currently don't have as an option. The um, campus uh, there would end up that particular price tag is about 60 million. The The next thing in terms of all the, the different buckets of, of, of money that, that, that you could decide to choose from are things that, such as security systems for the elementary uh, school. Um, we did the secondary, but we did not go ahead and do the outside visual cameras uh, for uh, the elementary. So you can see that we're, we're kind of here in the the middle section here for people watching on TV and board members. Uh, the blueprint, and I, I don't want to go into a ton of detail because tonight we're not voting on anything, but just making sure you're aware. The blueprint, like Rockefeller, most of you that have been in that campus know that we do have pre-K in there. We've made it even a bigger pre-K delivery, but we still have open campus. So for us to make that even a larger pre-K option, we'd have to do some work there. Romine, we can have pre-K there next year as we move to the fair model. But if we want to use every classroom in that campus for pre-K, there would be need to be some further adjustments. Uh, J Fair, our number of adjustments at that campus as we move towards it is pretty minimal, but we would want to do some enhancements uh, at Fair and Henderson to use that facility. Um, we, we would make some adjustments so that we could keep a hold of that campus and not lose it to um, any charter school entity. See, we have the McClellan Group, uh, modifications to campuses at Hall, Central, and Parkview. Some of that could be tied to the Ford NGL model that we're moving forward on, but it's also tied to just some basic needs to beautify the campuses and make them more functional and attractive. We talked about the elementary uh, HVAC systems. Uh, obviously, air quality is important, um, even beyond the pandemic. Uh, lighting saves you money. Uh, roof projects are very expensive, and we, our team does a good job of knowing when roofs are about ready to receive a, their last leg. A classic example of that is Dunbar has a, a roof issue uh, that's been patched and, and taken care of in a lot of different ways over a 30 or 40 year span, but it's never been properly addressed. We could certainly use this money for that. Um, uh, and then there's some things that sometimes you would say aren't very sexy of specific ground needs, uh, you know, meaning parking lots, uh, water mitigation so that it flows away from the building, uh, flooring to take away some of the tile floors so that they don't have to be uh, cleaned all the time with a, uh, a, a, a kind of the chemical of waxing and so forth. And then of course, just upgrades on electric and plumbing. Some, uh, I know that we've had board members even have brought this up. Well, shouldn't that be the responsibility just of the money we get in every year? But remember in 2014, the Fannie Howey study done by a board of education shared that there was over $300 million worth of needs on our campuses. We've actually knocked off a large number of those needs, but we still have additional needs. As Mr. Bailey pointed out, we have needs that come just because we have 60 year old buildings that need continual investment. And so uh, that's why you know, we've come to the voters twice um, and, and, and we're gonna come to you as a board. This is not tonight, but we're just kind of framing the conversation to come to you to say, we think that we do need to go forward. Um, but we're gonna get input from each of you individually. We'll follow up with conversations on this topic. Um, and of course you will again have to help us package 
uh, what, where you want the money and the projects to go. Uh, Ms. Hatter, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Um, can we take it out of uh, thank you? Okay. So, are there any other um, questions or thoughts on the presentation that we uh, just just heard? Uh, this is this was to present the options uh, again. Um, about uh, voting as a board to take a millage to um, our little, our, excuse me, our, our Little Rock voters. Um, so uh, this is your time to ask your final thoughts or questions before we move on. And then of course we will be having more discussion about this. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey and Mr. Trumper, uh, thank you so much. I'm this, sorry. Ms. Hatter, this is Greg Adams. I, I had that one follow-up question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. You was asking. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Bailey, I think this may be for you or for Mr. Poor. So um, if we went this way, if we, if it passed by the voters, um, what would be a rough estimate for timing before we would have the McClellan campus ready for students? Well, I believe I have my director of maintenance operation on here as well, uh, Mr. Kevin Yarbury. I would probably have to kind of get that to him. I, I know things may be delayed with the pandemic and different orders and everything. So, Mr. Yarbury, if you address that for us. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, Mr. Adams, uh, to answer your question, um, right now we believe that um, it's about a, um, a two-year project um, schedule. Um, there's obviously there's a the building that we have to have demoed. And before we can really start significant demo on that building, there's a lot of uh, asbestos abatement that has to take place as well. Um, so that, that kind of sets us back a little bit on what would, nor what would be a normal construction schedule. Um, so really right now that puts us, you know, two years down the road and uh, we've, been, we've been talking about and extending that, that, that idea about that schedule ever since we got the, the, the drawings on paper. Um, and we do have 100% uh, construction documents on paper, they're ready to go. Uh, we actually have a, a general contractor of record um, that we've already assigned to the project. Uh, so everybody's very familiar with the project and the things that are going to have to be done to get the building down and get the new one up. Um, so there, there, there's no um, uh, lag time for design or planning or any of that. We've already solicited the, the city and code enforcement and all those different entities that, that have input on how we do what we do when we do. Uh, so basically what I guess what I'm say, telling you is that we're sitting on green ready to go. We're just we're just waiting on that that green light. Mr. Adams, if I could, uh, I think just to frame that in a way for educators and parents, that means that really I believe the first time that that school would be ready to open would be the start of the 2024-25 school year uh, would kind of be the time. So, uh, you know, that would be starting, you know, the work sometime, let's say the by the end of this, this school year, or excuse me, the end of this calendar year, and then you'd have two and a half years to complete the project. And Mr. Poor, if I might too, one more bit of information, I think that might be important for the board to understand is that we, that is an approved partnership project with the State Department of Education. So we're kind of on the clock right now to, to realize uh, that partnership money. Uh, so really what that means for us is, is we, we really need to get started on that project probably within this calendar year uh, for us to realize those funds. Now, if, if we didn't do that, obviously we could ask for uh, uh, an extension and in and, and hopes that, that would, they, would, they would extend us on that, that, that uh, agreement. Um, but, but right now as it is, we would have to get started this, uh, this calendar year and it would be better sooner than later for sure. And the, and the amount of those funds? Um, it's close to a million dollars. Um, it's based on our uh, health, our wealth index in the city of Little Rock. So um, we've, we've had it calculated and we're, we're somewhere in the, you know, 920, 30,000 range. Mr. Yarbrough, uh, what was the cost of uh, South, uh, Southwest High School? I know we mentioned it um, before. What was that uh, building cost with the ground, uh, with us stabilizing that ground? Uh, before building uh miss hatter i, I believe I, I don't have that figure in front of me um, but it was over 10 million dollars 
Um, it was a it was a pretty significant number. Um, the the ground just was not was not favorable. Um, but without significant work uh, to get the slab out of the ground, we knew it was going to be a challenge. But it even uh, threw some more curveballs at us in the process. So it wound up costing a little bit more than what we expected. Okay, and then and then you're thinking it was about ten million. Yes, ma'am. Roughly, oh. roughly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then uh, with the uh, McCullen uh, Foundation, then we don't have that. Those uh, that ground is, is stable. So, uh, uh, well, our, 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 because from then from our last conversation, then I remember uh, you saying that like uh, we wouldn't have to stabilize the ground like that. So, it, it are is, is that still the case? Yes, ma'am. It, it certainly is not as in, in bad shape as the uh, Little Rock Southwest uh, property was simply because that property was a wooded area for 100 years or more. So we had a lot of um, um, unfavorable materials on that site that had to be removed and even feet down that we had to, to get off the site. Now, McClellan's been there for quite some time. Uh, we are going to have to negotiate the existing uh, uh, pier and beam system that that building sits on. Um, and probably a lot of the concrete that is in the ground supporting McClellan right now will remain uh, simply be, sent for the simple fact of, of trying to avoid its cost avoidance for trying to remove all of it. Um, so uh, we, we believe that we can effectively do that. Um, there is a little bit of stabilization that's going to have to be done because the new building will not exactly sit in the exact footprint the new one will, but it certainly will not be to the uh, degree that, that we had to do at Little Rock Southwest. Okay, and then as far as the building plan, and then we'll get uh, the building um, plan for our, uh, and then right for the the school as well at some point, will we? I know we have the blueprint, but have you guys already, uh, and then when I say blueprint for clarity, I'm talking about the blueprint we did a few years ago. Um, so have have you guys already started thinking about a design or anything? Yes, ma'am. We actually have a full set of uh, construction documents on paper now. Uh, we've got a full set of specifications, and uh, that's that's been a very, very long and tedious process. Uh, it took us quite some time to get to that point, and we we uh, took a lot of uh, input from uh, all of our uh, Little Rock School District uh, stakeholders. Uh, all departments were were asked for input, and and uh, so it was a, uh, as I said, it was a very lengthy process. But we do have what we interpret all that information uh, that we received on paper and in specifications okay. so as far as that goes all the construction documents are ready to go we're, we're ready to start building got it thank you so much for providing uh, that information uh we are closing out discussion on president hatter may, may i ask a question oh yes director wood go ahead please thank you uh madam president um mr poor mr bailey have we I brought this up at the last meeting. I'm just wondering if you put any thought into coordination with the city and uh, the library system regarding, you know, the, the likelihood that they may be asking for uh, a, a similar uh, ballot question. What are our thoughts on teaming up with them, having it on the same ballot, uh, cost sharing, campaign, uh, all, all together, or uh, this, you know, the strategy of, of when we might want to go in what order? I'll, I'll start with this, and Mr. Bailey may have a comment, as might Mr. Trumpert. Um, we have heard that the city is looking at a, a, a sales tax. One of the things that I think is impacting the city on their thought about a sales tax is whether or not uh, when they might want to hold that election, because there is uh, a piece of legislation in front of the state group right now to limit special elections. And I think the city would like to be out in front of that, which means they'd like to do an election early. And of course, they're also thinking about an early election, probably just for the, some of the same reasons that we've talked about on the fiscal side of things. The library, um, from what I understand, is looking at it more like a, similar to what we're talking about, of a debt extension. Um, and I don't know if that's their same term, maybe Mr. Trumper can share it, but um, that's kind of what we've heard from the library. And I have not heard a date that they've even begun that they've established for that. Mr. Bailey or Ms. Trumper, would you guys like to add? I think you pretty much covered it. Uh, it was our first step is to get uh, direction from our board here. So uh, before we probably explore those options out there. So once we get a green light or, or a red light, we'll kind of know which direction we need to kind of go. But I think you captured Superintendent Board. 
Alrighty. Well, so if, uh, I could, if I could, if I could ask one more thing, I, I'm not sure, M Superintendent Poor, that you know, as, as I've thought about this, and we we've, we've gone to the public twice now and asked for this, and it, with, without this being a comment on the validity of the need, because I 100% believe in the need. We, we seem to have a problem convincing voters to spend $200 million on, on parking lots and roofs and windows. And I'm not sure that, that we shouldn't be, I, if the money is there and the money can be cheaply obtained, I'm not sure that we shouldn't be also thinking about a, a you know, a bolder, I'll, you know, someone else used the word, I'll use it sexier, uh, sales pitch to the voters of what we could do with money that, that they would trust us with to uh, to Im Im improve schools in every neighborhood. So um, I don't know if, if it wouldn't be appropriate. I, th I feel like we could almost have a whole meeting on just uh, where, where to spend money around town and ask voters to support that. But I'm, I'm kind of dropping that out there. I'd love to hear from other board members as well. Just the thoughts on two failed campaigns and going for a third one. And should, should we be asking for different, should we be committing to different projects to try to convince the people to, to trust us to spend the money on some big stuff around town? I don't know. I think the only caveat to that is that we can't use uh, district funds for those campaign purposes. So it would have to be outside sources to utilize that. Now we can tell the facts and different things like Mr. Poor has a fact sheet. We can do some social media stuff, but we, I mean, we just can tell the facts. Sure. <laughs> but we have to be very careful when crossing those lines, especially spending the public funding pieces. So, but it's, it's definitely a need and it's something we just, we have to address. Uh, we tried to address it in the past. We always had an option to go to and the option was we looked at performance service contracts which were basically energy conservation uh, contracts where we saved enough money to actually pay for a debt service uh, loan so we got a loan and actually got a pretty low rate at that point we did about 12 to 13 million dollars of energy efficient projects I'm a six I think it was six uh, largest energy user halls we call them out there that saved probably over a million dollars with all the things we've done uh, after our failed attempt in 2017, we actually did second lien bonds, which was on that flyer there, about $92 million. So that cost the district $7 million in additional debt service payment, but it was needed. I mean, we had to finish up the Southwest High School. We had to do some other things around the district as well. So uh, right now, we, we don't have an option. It's not an option out there. We can't really take on additional debt service uh, payments right now. We were at $14 million. We're paying $21 million now. So uh without not where we are right now with decline in enrollment and different things that we got to look at as far as reduction of our bud budget so it's all about resource allocation we're talking about budget typically i don't just focus on budget i really focus on just re uh, resource allocation so if you got a school that may need this we should be able to provide that service that they need i'll just use for instance we had a meeting with forest heights this past uh it was the last week during this while we were out on snow break they were looking at replacing their project lead the way and technology that technology has been now I believe for seven years now uh, typically that technology should be replaced at three to five years so things like that we have to reinvest back into our, our schools and in, in, in our district so okay. Any other I, I don't know a way to convince the public out there but the needs never go away so our buildings aren't getting any younger they're getting older in about a minute right. Okay. So President Hatter, President Hatter, I just had a, uh, I, I had a comment regarding uh, uh, what uh, Director Wood said about combining the vote with city and the library. I, I, I really would, you know, I really, I know we've been, been out twice and got turned down twice. I would really like to go it alone. So to show that we, to show that we need the things that we need regarding our repairs and buildings uh, going and it really would focus on just us instead of uh, raising a sales tax for the city or or something else for or, or for the library I think we should focus only on ourselves 
Good point, uh, Director uh, Mason. Right, and I think, and I've said this before and I'll keep it brief, but I think whatever plan we propose to the public, we have to promote it and it's gotta be detailed. And we actually got a lot closer this time to passing it than the previous election. But I think, I mean, people wanna know where the money is gonna go. They wanna know exactly, and we've gotta get out and promote that. <laughs> And, and and the thing I'll add to that is that it's also an equity thing and it's a little bit more deeper than 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 the conversation here that's not being had so um, I will uh, reserve the rest of my thoughts on that and uh, director wood and then we're going to close it out after director wood and move on uh, with the agenda I was done I forgot to un I forgot to mute again okay <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. All righty. Uh, we will move on to our custodial uh, service uh, contract, our superintendent. Um, excuse me. I was shifting my papers and I lost my spot. Bear with me, you guys, just for a quick second. I was shifting. Okay, so um, our next um, agenda item, uh, we are going into our uh, custodial services. Oh, and uh, Mr. Trumper and Mr. Bailey, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I almost, um, I started to move on without thanking you guys. So thank you for that information. And of course, as a board, we'll uh, come back to discuss um, uh, possible action on asking our voters or asking the market this is something we want to put on the ballot. So uh, next up, uh, our superintendent will go ahead and um, talk about our custodial services uh, contract. Ms. Hatter, um, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to make an adjustment. The actual next item is the options for enrollment. And this kind of brings us back to the discussion we had um, a week ago with Hall and school innovation correct i'm sorry i jumped that um so options for uh enrollment uh decline and in this uh you guys uh we will have a discussion so uh superintendent thank you so much and uh i'll try to go through these slides you know fairly quickly but i think it's a follow-up and i've had some really dynamic conversations with each of you related to you know the, the discussion that we had at our, our retreat. And, and that was of value to me and, and I appreciate the time that each of you have spent with me. One of the things that we do have to realize is that we do have an economics factor. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened, uh, if we can go back to the screen please, is that we had, uh, even with the conversation of lost enrollment over the last two weeks, we've actually had a bump in enrollment of uh, over 300 students just in the last week that have we've been able to get back into the district and and that's come from intentionality of, of phone calls towards parents it's come in intentionality of radio shows and it's come because of the discussion you all had um, and and how that got carried out into the media and so you know that is very encouraging to me and in particular um, as of today, we had about 200 kindergartners come back uh, in over the last week, which was super encouraging. But if you go to the next slide, please, um, we have, these are the numbers that, that, that we've uh, provided you, uh, wanted you to see kind of where we were at our October count. Remember, October counts are really critical. And then where we were uh, right prior to the retreat in terms of a, a count, and you're seeing them by the different grade levels. And obviously these numbers have adjusted uh, since we showed this to you last week just because of good efforts by the staff. We know that, and we think about economics because we've been talking about the fact that we, with loss of enrollment, we're gonna have to make some tough budget calls. Well, one of the things that you think about on, on budget calls are efficiencies. How can you staff most efficiently? And when you think about staffing things efficiently, you know. The, in some ways, the, the, the larger the school, the greater the chance there is for efficiencies. And that really can be said for any level, elementary, middle, or high school. 
Each level, though, is unique in terms of how you staff it. And, and our principals and the directors at those levels really work well together to try to understand that. So for example, if you have 33 elementary kids at second grade, you know, you're not going to just go create one section and then say, hey, the rest of you, you got to go to a different school. You're going to end up with one class of 16 and one of 17, but that's not really at the model that you're funded at at the state level. Does that make sense to y'all? If you look at it from a middle school or a high school thing, now you're trying to look at, we've got to fund and staff the core classes, and you want those core classes to be as close to 25 to 28 students in each of those classes. And then you also have specialty classes that are there at campuses, and each campus gets a little bit unique, especially at the secondary level, in terms of some of their course offerings because of their potentiality of being a magnet or what they're trying to do to attract students. Same thing goes for high school. We are working very creatively and actively on making sure that those efficiencies happen not only during the course of this year, but then on into next year. And of course, our ultimate goal is to make sure that we have a very strong, effective educational delivery where staff is collaborating and that we can provide students with an excellent education. If you go to the next slide, this actually highlights what we're trying to do during the course of this year when we found out that we had a loss of enrollment. Specifically, remember our enrollment loss was at the pre-K level and at the K-5 level. At the secondary level, we actually had an increase in the number of students. So our loss was at the elementary, and so what we've started to do is one, we reduced um, some of our cost in terms of transportation service. Some of that also was helped because of the pandemic, to be honest with you, that we've had some reductions uh, on fuel and transportation. Next is we've had consolidation of positions and delayed even hiring some staff because every time you do those things, it creates a cost reduction during the course of this year, which then helps our bottom line going into next year. We've also decreased our use of substitute services, and we've also been able to backfill in on some of the substitute cost as a part of the ESSER funding that has come in from the state or from the federal level, in particular ESSER II, the new funding that came in, allows us to uh, backtrack on any of our COVID leave and make it so that we can take it out of that ESSER category rather than our own account. That's helpful, okay? That's a cost savings for us. We've also utilized uh, teachers at early childhood and elementary where enrollment was uh, lower to move those folks when we had a vacancy at another site. So if there was a vacancy at another site, we might collapse a class at an early childhood um, and make those students move into another room where there's plenty of access and then move the educator into the elementary where there was an opening. We have been more aggressive on that than we've ever been in the past. We would kind of shut those things down in September. This year, we have made those adjustments and moves clear into January and February. Uh, I don't think we've done one in February, but in January, we've made those adjustments of uh, moving some folks just to save money and also have the staffing model be right. And then, of course, we're thinking about, you know, always looking forward of right sizing and how do we, again, leverage um, our, our resources? How can we seek efficiencies on everything from teachers to assistant principals? And each one of these things kind of gives you an idea of average cost per human being that helps support the education environment. Finally, one last thing to give consideration to, this bill has not even been uh, discussed to the best of my knowledge. It's a hold harmless bill, SB 142. There is encouraging signs because of who is sponsoring the bill that it will get passed. It's a nice coalition of both Republicans and Democrats. And there are many small schools that have been hurt just as bad as us that hope for a hold harmless. That may also help us on some funding and also uh, thinking about our budget for the upcoming year. Ms. Hatter, if you don't mind, I want to check with Kelsey to see if he has anything to add on how I've presented this so up to this point. Uh, you're doing well, Superintendent Poor, and these, I just want to say these average costs here include benefits as well. So when you're looking at it, those aren't just salaries, so those include the whole caring costs, all our benefits associated with the average uh, person in that, those positions. 
Okay, so we'll go to the next slide then. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bailey. And our next slide just is our, our high school look at, at enrollment as of February 18th. These were numbers that we discussed at the last meeting. And uh, it shows, you know, kind of a, one of the things that I think Mr. Rutherford did a good job of is sharing that when you look at, at grade levels, you can kind of see a pattern here that when you look across it at ninth grade, 1,551, that's really the, the student population that we have as a almost a given in terms of the number of kids that we get to serve. So when you break out that 1,551 and then the number of schools, and I, that is why one of the things I think Ms. Hatter was trying to share in our last meeting with all of you is that we have a set number of high school kids and then we've got these schools that are all trying to build and start. Obviously West School of Innovation's um, marketing plan uh, this year has doubled, that's very positive. Um, you can look back to uh, when two years ago when they were starting, they were about where Hall was. In fact, they weren't even as far as Hall is with the 50 number that we have right there. Um, but they they built on it. Um, bottom line here, this these are real factors, real numbers. Again, this is this item we're talking about tonight is not an action item. We're trying to make sure that your head gets filled with as much data as possible to help you then guide your discussions and your decision making. The proposal that as a superintendent I would like to float to you tonight, and this would then come forward to you as an action item. Ms. Hatter and I have talked about if it becomes an action item at the next meeting uh, in March, that we would have a public comment section just on this topic about what we do with Little Rock West and Little Rock Hall so that the community can weigh in and pitch in specifically on this item as a part of uh, a discussion. So administration might do a very short presentation. Community then gets to do their three minute public comment just on this topic. And then you as a board would get to discuss it as well as then possibly act on the action. We think as, a, as an administration that what the best approach right now would be able to make a commitment. And the commitment, I actually heard you as board members saying this during the meeting last week, at least that's my interpretation, that if you just say, well, we've got to see how it goes next year, that doesn't give parents the feel that we're committed to the school. We have got to say, we're in this for the long haul and that the board's in it, the superintendent's in it, the, uh, the administration is in it, the community is going to buy into it. And, and if we do that, I think positive things can come from that. So the three-year commitment, this is not a surprise because it's probably more or less what you start, started to think I was going to present. One is a three-year commitment to keep moving forward on Little Rock West uh, and have it be uh, still a school of innovation and have a virtual learning component that would also enhance the numbers and the staffing uh, at the school. Second thing is uh, to have Hall, the Rock Hall STEAM, uh, continue forward on its momentum and have um, work to have its partnership uh, with Forest Heights uh, greatly enhanced and then create an efficient staffing model that will be very unique, unique that in ways that Little Rock has never probably seen uh, efficiency on staffing of administrators, staffing of teachers, and staffing of classified staff so that we can uh, make this as cost effective as possible. Tied to this then, I want to give you two slides then that kind of just share a little bit because some of the things that folks are, are wondering is well how far have we got along in being able to really create the programming? And obviously the programming at, at West School of Innovation has actually started to pick up some momentum because you can see the numbers doubled in terms of enrollment. But we have mapped out for West School of Innovation with the help of the Ford NGL model with our, all of our partners that are tied to that of looking at what are possible at that school so that it becomes some program of study that kids can get excited about and courses that can be taken. We have a course delivery for freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors for both of these campuses, as we do also for the campuses of even Southwest. If you go to the next slide, this is the kind of the map for Hall, and it shows their career academies that we are developing. And again, within each of these career academies, there are specific courses and programs all set to be delivered 
for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Finally, two more finals, I guess, is that we want to always kind of remember the impact on students. Right now, we do have uh, students that have made and parents that have made choices towards these campuses. Um, we are doing things that are allowing, uh, you know, uh, some, we know that we can do things to help enhance the student experience, even in a small school environment, of having them do some activities where there's some cross grade activities and doing some things with uh, extension of learning and virtual learning. Um, we know that we're starting to build up some student and teacher relationships. Um, had a, a parent tell me all about uh, a staff person at Hall that comes to every basketball game and talks to the families and the kids um, and, and helping build some things up. The K-12 structure, it's not, you know, that Forest Heights quits being its own campus and its own delivery there, but just that combination of working together and having families. But we're going to need some time to, to continue to enhance that over the next year. And uh, we know that some families, I think, would be attracted to that and would really be the first option uh, of its sort of trying to kind of create a K-12 flow of students from uh, Forest Heights up into Hall if, if, a, if a family's wanted that. And I believe that the, uh, the last thing that I would share, and, and I really appreciate that as board members, some of you gave me your thoughts and you thought, you know, we don't want to create the word accountability, but what about trying to create priorities or targets that we can all gather around and, and support? And so the targets, you know, I'm telling you that if we can move forward on this commitment at Hall and West School of Innovation, by the month of March and April, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, board members, that you will see an influx of resources that are going to come in from the chamber partners to these schools. And Ms. Hatter has been probably the board member that's been most involved with the Ford and GL model and knows the realness of the chamber's commitment to that kind of thinking. Um, but they want to know that we're committed to a three-year approach to get that kind of funding. Um, as a part of the priorities and, and targets, you know, we can all rally behind some of the expectations that you would help us create of saying, these would be the enrollment targets that we would have. These are the public relation targets. These are the community engagement targets that we want. And so you guys would be able to dive your hands into this. Please understand that on each one of these things, this has to be fair on both Kind of a thing that you'd say well we didn't quite we didn't do it we didn't achieve it as well as we wanted we have been doing some of these things over the last year but obviously when you only have 50 we didn't we didn't knock it out of the park in any stretch of the imagination but that's one of the benefits right now of a board and uh, this work in a collaborative fashion that I believe uh, especially with this Ford and GL model coming in that we can greatly enhance both of these campuses do more to support kids and so my my thought again is to uh, come back at the next meeting with a, a specific proposal that says a three-year commitment to both of these campuses and moving forward. And with that, I'll, I'll stop Ms. Hatter and uh, let you guide the next steps. Okay. All right, you guys. So uh, thank you, um, Superintendent Poor, uh, for your um, presentation and information. Um, in this um, uh, next di discussion that we're about to have, it's not a action item as um, I believe I heard Superintendent Poor say, I just wanna reiterate that it's not an action item. However, we do need to um, discuss uh, these options. Uh, we have five options uh, and I don't know if you guys need to be reminded of, of those options or you guys have them for Hall High School and uh, West Hall High School is gonna take the majority of um, our focus most likely. So. Um, I, I will open it up for discussion. So unmute your mic. And if I hear multiple people speaking, I will uh, direct at that point. Director Adams, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, so as far as discussion goes, I, I would say that I the uh, three-year commitment for both schools is appealing to me and, uh, and makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways. Uh, looking at the um, at, at the proposal, particularly for Hall and being connected to Forest Heights, uh, Mr. Poor, this would be for you, the administration. That, that for me, uh, in order to make a decision on that, I would 
um, I would be looking for a lot more detail um, as we go forward about what does it mean to have those efficiencies, you know, across the board. Uh, what what would those exactly look like in reality, and what the, what would that proposed partnership really look like? Uh, how would that change um, the lives of, of staff and students already there at Forest Heights right now? Um, and you know, and the other piece I, I wonder about that I'd like to have some thoughts on would be the impact of the other high schools. So in, in our environment with, with several other high schools, um, if we look at that mix of total of 1550 high school students in the, in the Little Rock School District that are spread around right now, the, the schools that we have, you know, is our vision, you know, that that's probably the, the number of students we're going to have. And that, and so if, if Hall increases, for instance, does that mean we're going to have a decrease you know, somewhere else at Central or Parkview or, or some, you know, somewhere else? Um, do we think that it's realistic that, that, in, that we might have some of that, but, or maybe not, but, but instead we would have, if we increased at Hall, that that means we're attracting students who are not in that mix already. And so we're, we're making a bigger pie or bigger supply. And I guess the other piece would be, let's say it would lead to a decrease in some other school. And I think that's probably the most likely one to, to think about at least for me would be parkview because there's a lot of overlap in parkview and and hall as far as the art science you know um, focus you know would it be do we as a vision do we see a little sm a smaller parkview but a larger hall do we see that as an advantage you know for a healthy your district or does or does that give give real concerns for us and i think those are just kind of big co picture vision questions that that I'd like to hear more thoughts about and details, you know, for us um, before we before I would want to take action. Mm -hmm. Those are my comments, Ms. Hatter. Very, very good. Actually, you 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 touch on a very important um, uh, topics that I share as well as far as just shifting our current student students um, enrollment around and uh, and 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 potentially. Uh, causing a further decline in in different schools while um, while increasing um, enrollment at you know at other schools. Um, with with that, uh, I I do believe that part of you should should be a part of a part of the conversation because of it taking a direct hit um, with how uh, uh, Hall is 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 coming about and then two looking at um, the uh, the the relationship uh, with uh, Forest Heights. And so to really we, we have, uh, we, from my perspective, we have had two um, different set of options presented. We had the options right from the retreat with the five um, options that, you know, we will have to have um, conversations on, on which way do we go uh, uh, with Hall. And also we've just been uh, presented with a three year uh, commitment of going forward for um, West uh, School of Innovation, the high school out West, as well as uh, Hall High School. So we have two things on the table that like we have to address. And so I say that to uh, prep the minds of other um, board members to talk about that. Uh, Director Adams kind of touched, well, he did touch on both of those. So you guys, this is the time to have the conversation and for us all as a board to have the conversation around hall options um, for both the three-year commitment as well as those five other options. And I think it was two options for Southwest. So, I mean, for uh, West School of Innovation. I The view I'm in, I can't see everyone. So if you're unmuted, if you could just start talking and well, I'll facilitate from there. Well, I want to. I want to. First of all, I, I, I want to say this to let it be known that I'm I'm both supportive of the West School of Innovation and Hall. Uh, I, I really would like to hear Director Wilson. She's a parent in that area, and she gave a great uh, synopsis of during our uh, retreat about what some of the parents in that area thought about the K-12 at Hall. And, uh, but I'm very supportive 
of Hall, you know, my, everybody might not know, but my mom taught at Hall over 20 years. So I have a affection for that school and I, w I would really like to see it survive. And uh, I'm not sure, Director Adams, that it will pull students from a different school, maybe, maybe, maybe a Lisa Academy or something, it may pull from, uh, from the other, uh, the private and the charter schools. So it may be uh, competitive in that way. So I, I'd like to hear Director Wilson's uh, synopsis on. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, I do wanna say, I had some comments last time about how we didn't talk about West School of Innovation enough. And I think for me, I didn't address it because from my point of view, it looks like that's being successful. They've more than doubled the enrollment. I think they need to keep doing what they're doing. I think it's working. Um, you know, for Hall, I think the most questions I've gotten and the biggest concern is what would a K-12 look like? What would that mean? Would our middle school kids be going to the high school for classes? Um, you know, of course, like I said last time, our parents want the details. And so I got lots of phone calls and lots of text messages after our last retreat. Um, I think the biggest thing is just they need to know and have some exposure. Um, when the new principal was hired for Southwest, we saw him everywhere. He was at everything. He was excited. He was energetic. And I think our students need to see the same thing for the staff at Hall. And I'm not saying they haven't done it. I'm just saying I personally haven't seen it and that's what I've heard. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of opportunities to do lots of mentorships, some, I mean, they have robotics at Hall. We have robotics at Forest Heights. They could do some partnerships. They could do some STEAM nights for us. And that really, they could do all those things for all the middle schools. Um, but I think we're gonna have to have some hand-on specific planned activities to make those connections and that overlap. And, you know, to address what Director Adams said, right now, Forest Heights kids mostly go to Central or Parkview. So if we're channeling Forest Heights kids, or the goal is to channel them to Hall, that means pulling kids from Central and Parkview. Now I know Central is maxed out. They could probably stand to lose a few students because they're so over enrollment, but I don't know if that's true for Parkview. So there is a concern that we could be pulling kids away from Parkview, potentially hurting Parkview. Yeah. You know, Director, um, um, Wilson, I, I sh that that is a true sentiment, and uh, because it is hurting Parkview, um, our and, and and that is something that we need to be cautious of, and and really stop um, um, advertising and branding a school, and start branding our entire district, right. and and show representation right of our a uh, true student body, um, right as not only just a minority and a majority, but but what all is there to offer? And, and the hesitance of um, um, Forest Heights parents, it, it's real, it's true, it's honest, because um, as you know, I got a email from um, different um, parents, um, not only in, in the Forest Heights, but also throughout in former um, hall uh, parents to where they just don't wanna enter into un uncertain waters right as the right as it's currently being 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 developed and so um with that uh i think that it will, it will be no doubt if we uh continue to move on the path that we're moving and accepting um right i think there's like 56 kids uh children now that have signed up for a uh, hall and and to give them that experience but then like we know uh, like the 23 24 school year or the 22 23 school year is going to be a far better experience and then when the work has been put in and, and um built out I, I i just think um we just need to have a real conversation about where is that what do we need to do look at those those five options we already know well singing from past conversations option one which is no change and option five which is school closure is 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 um doesn't seem to be on on the table however looking at the 11th and 12th grade do we allow them to matriculate through and finish and then use a year to plan 
um, or what does that look like? Um, and then the other option from, from the district was to, um, well, of course, the K-12, we were talking about that now, and then the ninth grade academy. And so, you know, it didn't seem like, I don't think, I don't recall in, in much conversation around that ninth grade academy last time. And then now we have another set of options, which was, which which are three-year commitments. But that set of options, in my mind, will be after uh, we look at the first set of options that have been uh, presented to us. And so, um, I, you know, at next month we we are going to have to vote on on these things, and we need to be looking at it from from a cost-effective way. Uh, we need to be looking at at what does a fourth high school in Little Rock look like, uh, what is best for our, 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 our entire city, and not just play to certain um, subgroups of um, right of our city and, or else just one school because then we're going to be back here talking about the same thing again. What do we do, do with these schools and making sure that um, we are concerned with the 75% of, of the majority of this district that are um, um, uh, choosing other options as well and how do we market our entire district. So uh, it's always better to talk from a citywide um, stance about schools and not a narrow stance about schools. And um, I will, I'm talking to see if anybody else is unmute, will unmute to go ahead and if they have any other comments on this. But even when Forest Heights was um, being, being, being put together and it was an idea um, and y'all remember that, that was, you know, it, it was under um, three superintendents ago. And then there, was, there wasn't just a concerted, only we are looking at the Forest Heights community um, and getting input from there but the super, but but the, at the time the administration looked out at the entire um, district and got input from 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 the entire city, and so we need to make sure we take that approach as as, as well um, to make sure that 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 we're building a good and successful schools because then people will come to good and successful schools. Um, so I'm gonna pause right there. I'm trying not to share uh, too much of what I what I think because I because I really want to hear what the other um, directors have have to say about that and then to uh, talk about uh, uh, Southwest. I mean not Southwest West uh, School of Innovation. Uh, direct Director Wood, go ahead. Yeah, thank thank you, Madam President. So. Um, I know, I know we're not voting tonight and, and, I'm, and I'm glad we're not there yet. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the, the K-12 model, um, but I, I echo uh, Director Adams' questions about that, that there's a lot of details there that, that need to be fleshed out. Um, I, I would say this, that even if we don't take a formal approach there with a K-12, I would certainly hope that there would be an informal partnership between those two schools. And I'm not sure that that wasn't the goal a year ago, but uh, I would love to hear from the leadership of both of those schools that, that they will commit to partner with one another, whether or not there's a K-12 program in place, but just so that the middle school and elementary students that are across the street in a STEAM Academy, can, STEM Academy, can benefit from uh, the high school environment uh, right there at, at their doorstep. So, you know, um, that, that's me essentially saying, I hope there is a lot of working together between the schools, regardless of whether we adopt a formal K-12 partnership there. But I do wanna hear a lot more about that as Director Adams said. When it comes to the competing between schools, um, uh, I would echo what Director Wilson said. I agree that Central seems to have maybe too many students. Uh, and I have no doubt that there are a lot of parents that would like their kids to not be in trailers uh, all day. Um, and anything we can do to alleviate the crowd there might be helpful. When it comes to Parkview, this is a specific question though, Mr. Four. Is Parkview full every year? And if it is full, are there students that are turned away 
uh, that you know didn't didn't make it to Parkview and wanted to be there? Thank you for the question. Um, this year our enrollment is down a little bit in the freshman group. Mr. Rutherford can give you a more specific number, but I believe we're down uh, about 40 students on the incoming freshman group uh, coming in. We do have a, a rigorous uh, expectation for entrance. The one where there's usually the, the has the most students applying is performing arts. I'll let Mr. Rutherford enhance my answer. Good evening, board. And uh, I, I don't, and Ms. Hatter, uh, let me say this, their numbers are down this year a little bit. Uh, and some of that, uh, well, some of that, uh, those kids, I think well, the science uh, move, I don't think that the messaging necessarily got to it. I think there was confusion is the best way to put it because Parkview still has science as Mr. Boer shared with all of you before. But I think that caused a little bit of confusion because the drop typically right now at Parkview did come in the science area from the traditional enrollment that we do. Uh, and so obviously I've talked with Mr. Castleberry and, and as the administrator at Parkview that they have, we have to do a better job of making sure that parents understand the programs that are offered there. Typically in the visual arts area, just to answer part of the question, visual arts is always, when I was there as the principal and even now with Mr. Castleberry, typically has more students than we have seats. Um, we occasionally even take additional visual art students when one of the other magnet areas don't fill completely. If, I hope that makes sense to everyone because again, for staffing purposes, that's what we wanna do. We wanna maximize the use of our staff. Uh, but the science seems to be the thing this year that threw some parents off, uh, but that we, we are gonna have to do a better job of communicating on that overall. I hope I answered your question, Mr. Wood. Sure, I, I guess I'd like to be really clear though. It, are there students that wanted to be at Parkview that, that don't get to be there? That if if Hall were to be another option and you know were to draw students from, from Parkview, are there students that wanted to be at Parkview that would just fill those seats? Or are we talking about a, a you know a loss of enrollment at Parkview if, if competition comes into play between the two schools? You know, that's a tough question to answer because you can't project to the future to know. I mean, really, Parkview is all about choice. I mean, for parents, all, and it always has been in the Little Rock School District, and, it, and not just for parents, for kids too, and their interest. It, it kind of defined as a magnet school. What NGL is, Parkview is all about choice. I mean, for parents, all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But anyway, I think you understand it. It really was ahead of this Ford NGL move is what it amounts to because of the way Parkview was set up. I mean, it had its career pathways inside of the arts and inside of science. And so I say that just to say, obviously it's, it's moving around a little bit as far as that's concerned to project to the future. It's hard to tell, uh, you know, it, it really does. And I think you heard it earlier from the city survey that we did on uh, community schools. We have a lot of kids in this community that love the arts and love what arts have to offer. Well, Parkview is the one high school that emphasizes the arts. And so I think yeah. it's just, it's a messaging and part of Parkview, they, they, their biggest recruitment tool, and those of you, and I know Ms. Hatter knows this because she has a daughter that goes there, but the biggest recruitment tool that Parkview has is when they're able to get out and be in schools in front of the kids in the middle school. Kids are recruiting kids at, from Parkview, but because of COVID, that as you know, we can't send them personally to the middle schools the way we did in the past. So all their communications happen to happen online and just the best way they can communicate uh, through Zooms and everything else. Um, one, one, one last question, if I might, and this is general, this is the, the neighborhood around Hall. Uh, because we are trying to attract new students, not just shuffle students. Where do those kids go to school? Because I, I, I read, an, I believe it was a news article within the past year and talking about the, the changes at Hall um, and even the, the article dove into a little bit of the history of Hall and it says that mo most of the kids that go to, go to Hall aren't from the neighborhood around it. So I just, how, how do we convince those families that live right there that this is the place for them. And where are they going? Where would we be getting them from if we were to convince them of that? Is that a question around uh, which which neighborhood are you? Are you talking about Hall or Parkview? Hall. Oh, okay. 
And I, I think I can step in and answer some of that. Part of what we have tried to put together and we've started looking at is to find the answers that Ms. Nolan has asked, where we haven't accomplished all of that yet, to find out where are our kids going. And it comes back to the survey that I shared with all of you that we put out to our eighth grade parents to find out. But one thing I, can, I, I can't give you the exact details of it tonight, obviously, you will get a packet that will show you eventually exactly where everyone went and those things. But history from the past few years, we know most of those kids have ended up going to Central. All right, well, thank you. I fully support Hall and I want it to be a, a, a big success. I want, I want to build programs that attract new students to, to the Little Rock School District. So whatever we can do, Director Wood, um, I have, Director Wood, I have a question for you, just for clarity to make sure I heard it correctly. Was your question about <coughs> where does uh, families from around the, the neighborhood hall sits in, about, about where do those families uh, send, send, send their children to? Yeah. Else? Was it about where, where, where did the, fam the students that was once at hall go? Just no, yeah, no, it was more of the first question. I, I have a little bit of an understanding of the answer to the second question after, mm -hmm. you know, the changes and the lack of the attendance zone. But, but when I read this news article about how most kids that live around Hall don't go to Hall, it, it just, I, I wonder where do they go? And, and how, how, and then maybe that feeds into maybe a question that Director Nolan mm -hmm. has asked and we'll eventually get an answer because I would love to know that. where. Are they going to private school? Are they going to charter school? Are they going to Southwest Central? Where do they go? If we get them in hall, have we gained students or have we just shuffled the students? You know, from my experience of um, of knowing people in that area and um, uh, and, and, and and on my journey here 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 to right to this seat, a lot of them either the ones that I ran across was either they, they went to Central or also was private or they went the um, other. Um, uh, avenues of education you know yeah. um, I I don't think I met any um, families around Hall that actually went to Hall High School so yeah. Um, yeah but that would be interesting to get some data on that and then again to make sure that we are looking at it from a recruiting standpoint from a citywide um, and not just looking at uh, certain neighborhoods, but making sure that we are looking at what is best for our city. Because again, if, if, if we do that and we're hanging our hat on just a sub a group of, of people um, to make a school successful, we're gonna be back having this same conversation um, again. Why if it, no, why, if, why if families continue to, why to not make that choice? Director Callaway. Okay. Um the kids that live around Hall. Now, in order for them to go to Central, they have to be assigned to Central. So apparently we we, we have some fault there. 2,400 kids at Central, and I worked there for eight years. And that's a lot of kids. And they have, uh, and, but they've been allowed to have that many kids. And in the meantime, you have going up and down Markham, every Lisa, every Lisa Academy almost is in the state. You have one that is right there down the street from Hall. That's where they're going. Uh, and then you go a little bit further down and then you have a middle school. That's what's killing uh, 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 Henderson. Then you go a little further and, and, and then you find another so we're kind of helping them out here. Now, what we need, and I think I've stated this once before, is stability. And if we, if we, if we don't show them any stability, you're not going to want, uh, they're not going to want to bring their kids to, to Hall. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and there was one time in this district uh, that most of you all don't even remember, but uh, I, uh, in my neighborhood where I live currently, and I have no idea what school they go to anymore, we had a bus stop for Central, a bus stop for Hall, a bus stop for uh, uh, McClellan. And that's the kind of thing that 
And you know, you gotta look at who 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 is assigning these kids where they go. You gotta look at it might be some internal problems here because that was an internal problem. I'm, I'm telling you, that's been a long time because my kids are good and grown. But at one point, that was it. Now we're now I, I've met the principal of. Uh, Hall, and I'm, I'm sorry, you know, uh, this is Senior Mama. What's his name? Uh, Dr. Because... Roberts. It's um, Mark Roberts. Dr. Mark, okay. Mark Roberts. Yeah, I've met him. Now, uh, now the doc, uh, Dr. Roberts and whoever is at Forest Heights, but I think I feel what uh, uh, Director Wilson is, is, is saying, at least I think that's what she's saying, uh, that, okay, we're going to hook Hall up to to uh, Hall, Hall up to Forest Heights. Well, what if my kid wants to go to uh, Parkview and be a music major or be an art major? And if, 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 if we make this so inclusive that the kids that go to Forest Heights have to go to Hall, so, you know, we're going to lose some more people. Now, my thing is I really feel that we're going to have to have a successful program over there and, and, and over at Hall in order for people to come. They're going to, they need to come back to the district. I think charter schools are the worst things that ever happened to education, my opinion. Uh, but that's the problem. That's where our kids are. Absolutely. Now, when the, fir the first magnet came through, it was at Horace Mann. Then you had Booker, Arts Magnet. And then I was at Parkview at the time when that became a, uh arts school. Uh, I left the next year because they made my sewing lab into a uh, piano lab. And, and, and so, like, we don't have a regular school, you know, that that offers everything except for maybe central. So that's the reason why a lot of people, or maybe I'm skipping around, are looking at central so much. Now, if you get rid of, uh, and I don't know the complete plan of how, and uh, and get rid of the other programs they have. Uh, I, I'm I'm thinking career tech things. People are gonna look and go put send their kids somewhere else. Now the 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 commercial that uh, we played the other day that we saw, those teachers were Parkview teachers who were advertising. Well, we're gonna be over here next year. That's confusing, and, and, and you know, for most parents, that's confusing for me. And I was in education forty one years. Now. If we don't have stability across this district, we're going to have some problems. And my thing is we must start with stability. Now, I think that we need to go ahead and do the three-year thing, but we also have to be real honest about uh, selection of uh, where kids go. Because 2,400 kids in Central, listen, 2,000 kids is a lot of kids. So you got 400 extra kids that can go somewhere else. But I understand why the parents would want to go there uh, because it has such a, reputa a good reputation. In fact, I cried when I had to leave Central but uh, because I was like really into that. At that point, but then I decided. Then having having visited and worked in other schools, it doesn't matter where I worked. I just wanted to be able to teach and make a difference in people's lives. But we're going to have to be stable, guys. This is my this is my opinion, and this whole conversation to me looks like instability now maybe it's it, maybe it's not 
everybody's coming up with great ideas, but we're going to have to decide what we're going to do here. Now, if we had a real idea of how we're going to do this, we, uh, I'm pretty sure that we would have more kids signing back up. Now, Mr. Ford said that we had, uh, what, five, 600 uh, preschoolers sign up. They're coming back. So we're going to have to have space for them. That's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Um, the, uh, Director uh, Calloway. Um, Director, Mr., uh, uh, one, one, I'm sorry, I have a thought. Um, Ms. Mr. Rutherford, I do have a question about um, uh, Parkview uh, teachers and the science program, because as as as, as you know, um, most uh, most of the students who go to Parkview uh, for the science side, it goes for the high level advanced uh, science courses. So and, and so since 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 that component of science, the high level courses have been moved over to Hall with the engineering and so forth. Um, how will we um, honor our students at Hall High School um, that have our, that is already on that track that will receive its seal, so on and so forth? And, and two, um, are we sharing teachers between Hall and Parkview because Parkview is, I mean, because Hall is still being built out those programs. So can you answer that for me, please? I can. The, uh, the students that are currently at Parkview that are in the science component, that are in the engineering component of the science component, uh, both, both those teachers, and I won't call them by name, both those teachers right. will still work with those kids to finish the program of study that they started in, in that engineering program. Uh, the, the main reason for the move, to be very honest with you, is lack of space at Parkview. Uh, it, it grew to the point to where, to be quite honest with you, uh, when I was there as principal, where I was having <clears throat> discussions with one of the two teachers that is making the move, it, they are, there just is not enough room at Parkview is what it amounts to. Uh, so uh, I hope I answered your question that all of those students that started in that track that are in the, in the engineering program at Parkview will finish and with those teachers. And yes, they will be shared a little bit in this pattern because obviously as we're making the transition to Hall to start that engineering component there, there will be a little travel back and forth for them, uh, but they'll finish out. And then I, I wanna be clear on this, not, I, the upper level science, the only part that came out of part view was that engineering right. part. All the upper level science is still that part view. Those, those great teachers that taught, teach the upper level, level science that really lead to medical fields and those type things are all still there and they do a fabulous job with those kids. And so, and that's all still at part view. That's why I said earlier, I think the miscommunication, the way it came out, it appeared that all of the science left part of you and it did not. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. It, it does. And so um, just for clarity, um, the students who started the 1920 school year because, um, because the engineering um, component wasn't an option for the 2021 school year. Am, am I remembering that correctly? No, ma'am. This year, there is a freshman class this year that's in the engineering program. So, at Parkview? Right. This okay. incoming group for 21-22, that, that ninth grade group, if they want the engineering component, would be at Hall. Okay. And so, and so our students that came in this current school year, 21-22, they will have the same level of rigor all the way up until they graduate with, with, with their engineering seal? And, and they yes, will not be slighted in any way? No, ma'am, they will not be slighted in any way. That, 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 it's, it's a transition and I, I think, the, I hope you all understand those, those students and those parents that selected Parkview for that very reason, well, obviously we're gonna finish out with that all the way through with them. Okay, got it. Um, Superintendent uh, Mike, Mike Poor, I, uh, I see you've been waiting and then we'll go to the director Adams, and if there's, uh, I think, no other I think Director Nolan may be before me because she, I think she's been waiting and she's been going. Unless 
unless I've misread that, but I, I just wanted to make a comment, but and I appreciate that before we end this. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, Director Nolan, you are muted. So when I scanned across, I saw mute. So you are recognized, go ahead. And I'm, I'm sorry, I thought Mr. Poor had something. Um, and I, I got a little confused about the order. So I'm happy to go or, or allow Mr. Poor to have his input here. You can. Okay. Mr. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Okay. Port, go ahead. Um, okay. I'm, I guess I'm still confused as to who you want. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. There is a lag on my end. So I'm, it, it's a lag on my end. So I said, Mr. Poor, go, go ahead. So I don't know how long my lag is. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess one thing I want to call to the board's attention, that's really what we're feeling right now a little bit about Parkview and Hall really fits in well with what happened at Pinnacle View. We opened up Pinnacle View, and when we opened that up by grade level six, seven, and eight, it had an immediate impact, and this fits in a little bit with what Ms. Callaway was saying, is Henderson numbers dropped. Pulaski Height numbers dropped. Guess what's happened over the last two years? Those schools have increased in their enrollment and Pinnacle View has met its expectation. Why? Because the district had a global view of moving everything forward. Now, all those schools have had an increase in enrollment. Think about our high school. We just opened up Southwest High School. We anticipated a number of 1,750 students and look what the number we ended up with. We have over 1,900 students. Why? because it's bright, it's shiny, it's new. And so guess what? Park, you did lose some students to Southwest. Hall lost some students to Southwest. Central even lost students to Southwest. And people came into the district to go be a part of Southwest that we never entertained. That is a district concept to move our whole district forward. And now we have to continue to move forward with the other pieces of trying to instill quality programming at Hall that's backed and supported in a community driven and, and families all together. I totally get with the questions that Mr. Adams and Ms. Wilson have posed about connecting the dots. And, and I think we can do that. And I think we will move forward with enhanced numbers. But the model is right there in terms of what just happened at Pinnacle View and what some of the explanation is of the drop in numbers at Parkview right now. Will Parkview pick it back up? Yes, because guess who else is gonna get an enhancement with the Ford AGL model? Parkview, they are ready with new partners to be announced as well that's gonna make their magnet pop even more. So the, the whole thing of a, a district moving forward, it, it's gonna happen, guys. Um, it, it, you just gotta, there's a little bit of a trust factor, and I know that maybe that's not there for y'all but we want to come back with additional information to help you. But there is a track record that you can go see that we actually have made it possible to enhance enrollment. Henderson, people thought we were gonna close Henderson four years ago, three, four years ago when I first got going. Now, guess what? We're gonna have 960 kids going to JA Fair. And I'll stop with that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director uh, Nolan, go ahead. Thank you, President Hatter. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts and I think that generally one, I haven't heard anyone express any desire for the district to elaborate on or further explore any of the options other than the um, partnering Forest Heights with um, Hall and so while we are not voting tonight, it may be helpful for us to give the district clear instructions about what we do want further development on. And I will just say from my point of view, I would love further development on this particular option. And I think that we will probably have quite a bit of um, feedback on the details of this option, but there may not be as much um, as far as picking between those options, as far as, um, you know, I, I just don't hear anyone really focusing on those other options. And as far as developing details, some things that would be really helpful, at least for me, would be things like, what would this mean for zoning? 
um, right now the students at Forest Heights STEM um, would be zoned for schools other than Hall because it is a magnet and would, if this were to be a partnership, I, I guess have to then choose Hall. Um, and so I just don't know, are we anticipating some sort of feeder pattern where those students are automatically enrolled um, rather than having to seek it out? So that would be um, something we would like some more information on or I would. Um, would it entail any sort of unity of leadership between the two schools? You know, I, I, I'm sure that obviously the principals would work closely together, but usually with a K-8 or a K-12, you're looking at some sort of um, like structural or official unity in terms of leading both schools or, or both buildings together. Um, would it, well, just one thought I had was y'all are saying um, a three-year commitment, which fully support making a commitment um, to be able to really see this through. As a parent, if I had an eighth grader and I were thinking about where to send them, three years doesn't get them through high school. And so we might wanna think about a four-year commitment instead of a three-year commitment, just so that the kids entering would know that they could finish at the school that they are choosing um, right now. And then the next thing would be, I heard um, a presentation about efficiencies as term, in terms of size. And I know that for some of our larger schools, they are able to offer, for example, more AP courses or things like that because they have the size to support all of those courses. And so it would be helpful to get an idea of what is the goal or the expectation in terms of size for Hall to be able to offer a full component of courses and AP classes and, and um, electives. And then once we know what the goal is, can we break that down? Can we work backwards? How many students per class, like per year, do we need to be bringing in? And how many students per month does that mean need to be coming on a tour? And really kind of set up some, some goals that work backwards from our overall goal number of what a full component um, what, what our enrollment would need to be to support a full and functional um, assortment of courses and, and, and extracurriculars and everything else um, and then just ultimately create a plan if we're going to give a commitment for four years we would need some um, some reports and, and feedback throughout that four-year process to see how it's going and maybe make adjustments where needed um, you know, if we see something that's not um, not working or trying to trying to make sure we're meeting those goals each year um, to make it successful. So those are my thoughts. Um, thank you very much for the proposals. And um, that's what we're doing tonight is talking about those options. And uh, it seems like those the the board as a collective, or even um, when when it when you guys are speaking, you're going automatically right to the K twelve. And of course, next month, um, it's gonna be an action item. And so we could talk about it. Some of those, a couple of those items was touched on at the retreat. It was kind of drowned out with other um, things that uh, took over it. But at the same time, uh, this is what this is about, right? We are have, we, we opened it up for uh, the board as a whole to discuss the five options because now we have a second set of options presented for the first time looking at a three-year plan. And so the three-year plan is not necessarily from my understanding, superintendent jump in, um, cause I'm just now hearing about it is not necessarily a four-year plan to, I mean, a, a, a each year to represent a four-year high school. It is um, just to say, okay, we are committed to uh, three years uh, for West High School and Hall High School. Um, West High School is in its third, will go into its third year of operation. However, um, we are gonna have to make first a uh, uh, action on the first set of options. And then, then of course, afterwards, we, we can go into um, the second motion because it will be two different motions that have to 
um, happen on the first and the second. They, they will kind of work um, uh, together. So we are, well, the board is talking about the options that like they are choosing to talk about as an individual, but it looks like the K through 12 and I haven't heard any uh, movement or changes to Forest Heights STEM Academy. It is just look like it's gonna be an extension of it and then they will have to, um, we will have, they will flesh out how, how that will happen because technically they would have to apply because neither Forest um, Heights Academy nor um, Hall High School have have a attendance zone the same as Parkview do do uh, do not have an attendance zone so um, all of this is, is going to be worked out in the details but the district just need for the board to make a decision or have to ha ha have a discussion on the options that are presented um, and then let them know right if they need to provide more information to any one of you guys um, any one of you guys to help further you guys um, our collective uh, vote and why it's right as we vote so I hope that is clear this is the whole point of us like taking this time right now to have this uh, discussion um, the superintendent would you like to uh, respond to any of what director Nolan have said before I move on to director Adams I appreciate it. I think Ms. Nolan and Ms. At, Mr. Adams and, and Ms. Wilson and, and the other members have really given us good things for us to bring back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hatter. So, so just this is just a few comments, and one is to, to piggyback on Ms. Ms. Calloway's comments about stability. Uh, but the first comment I just want to make is, I think that to me this is an incredibly encouraging conversation when we look at the whole high school picture, that we have a Southwest High School, which is exceeding the attraction for students and there's many strengths and so much potential there. We have a Central High School, which continues to attract students to, to capacity or greater. We, still, we have a Parkview High School, which has great strengths and has, has for a long time and, and um, a great deal of health. We have a new option with West and now there's the real potential with Hall. I think that's a different landscape for a high school than has been in the district for a long time. And, and so, I, so while we're wrestling with these appropriately, I, I really am encouraged by that. I, I would wanna add to, to the idea of stability that I, to me, there's a, there's a tension for what we want and that um, the I think much of the public and families, you know, they want to know what to expect. And I think that's the piece of that stability that appeals to me for what Ms. Calloway was talking about. Um, and yet people also want improvement and, and growth and new things. And so that it means change. And so there's a, there feels like a kind of a yin and a yang between stability and change that we're trying to find the, the proper balance. And maybe another word along with stability would be predictability. So the people can to know what you know what the future looks like and even if it and so they can know what to count on and and it doesn't feel chaotic because they know what's coming and but they also know that that we're doing things we're not st we're not stagnant and we're not sitting on status quo and and we're not going to just give up and say this is the best we can do we're going to continue to do better but i think there's a there's a healthy tension between that idea of predictability and change and growth that that we that we wrestle with and if we don't have enough change and growth we're going to lose folks and if we get too unpredictable and it feels too chaotic we're going to lose folks too and we're not going to serve the people we have well and so it's we're, to me it's we're trying to find that that healthy balance and i just wanted to make that comment and i appreciate your comments on that miss calloway mm. Very good. Um, this is a good uh, discussion, and two, um, we 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 will have to even look at how we will um, again with those five options. Um, look at how we will move forward because we have like forty-five or fifty freshmen that are signed up. Forty-five, I think, forty-five or fifty freshmen signed up for Hall, and only six sophomores. And as you know, we don't have a freshman class this year, so we have to look to see. Uh, do we just, you know, 
that there is another option right, where we allow the 11th and the 12th grade to go ahead and um, matriculate through and finish. And then with, with, um, with the other um, uh, lower um, class, the freshman and the uh, sophomore, uh, do, do, do we reassign because, because of it's not enough to uh, have a class, like our course load. So uh, with, with only six sophomores, right? So uh, though that is something that uh, we're gonna have to, you know, I guess at some point talk about how does that trend, trend, trend transition look? Do we um, give 21, 22 school year um, something to um, that year to plan and, 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 and implement and build? Um, or or what, what do we do? We have to look at the cost and we have to look at um, like what, we have to look at the student experience because of Hall still being developed and put together. And so like they will probably may not receive the full ex experience compared to someone coming in um, the school, uh, school year after that that 21 22 so um we have to have all of these um discussions and juggle this thing to where we are able to make the best uh decision but it sounds like from from my end with the lag of the rain outside um that the k-12 seems to be the way uh the board members that are speaking about it it, it is, is leaning and so um next month we will come back to back and make a um, motion to um, move move on that and then of course having that three-year co uh, uh, commitment what are what are what are we going to do um, with that and uh, revisit what does that three-year commitment look like because we didn't talk about that but I do want to I appreciate the conversation and uh, definitely need to move the agenda forward so we can get uh, to the last uh, uh, five or six items on the agenda. And Ms. Heather, might, might, mm -hmm. might, we, might I request a stretch break for just a few minutes? You know, I, I yes, uh, go ahead and make a motion. Is that a motion? No, it's just a request, just, just, for, just for a little stretch break. And, and before, we, before we start, because I want to be able to be fresh for these, the rest of the, the agenda. Okay, well, let's get a motion on the um, floor for a break and see if someone seconds it so we can go on into the break. Well, if you need a motion, I'll make one. I, I move we take 10 minutes. Okay. I second that motion. Okay. Any, um, I, all in favor? Aye. Okay. And we will be back in any opposed? We will be back in 10 minutes, which will be at uh, 8.57.
Okay, you guys, um, welcome back. It's 8.57. So I will do a quick look to see if we have a quorum to start. And we do. We have everyone, just about everyone back. So uh, thank you guys for uh, taking your 10 minutes and making it back on time. Uh, the next agenda item, and are we back live, you guys? Um, Superintendent Poor. Uh, do we stay live the entire time? Are we still live? Yes, ma'am. We're still good to go. Good deal. Okay, so our next agenda item, it is our custodial services for JA Fair K-8 um, school. Uh, this is a action item that the district is bringing, bringing to the board and our, just making sure I got this right, our superintendent, uh, me, I'll turn it over to our superintendent uh, to uh, present and talk about the custodial services at JFair. Thank you. We'll tag team this a little bit. If we can go ahead and put on the PowerPoint. And um, Mr. Bailey. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting Mr. Bailey. But he's all Thank you. And that's going to be my tag team partner on this. Okay. Um, so if we put up the, the slideshow, you know, there's a kind of a busy slide that we have as our first slide. And I'm going to cover that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bailey after that. But the, the first slide that we have, if Pam can put that up, is, um, uh, or, or Dr. O, I'm not sure which one's got control of it right now, but you know, we've actually um, started to work with um, SSC uh, several years ago, and uh, there was a decision made to, as we move forward with SSC, to actually have a contract that moved forward on, on the campuses at Hall and Stevens, and it was kind of like a, 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 an experiment, if you will, Let's see how this works. Um, we then expanded that contract on to having uh, us go towards Southwest. And then we've also um, utilized uh, SSC for substitutes. We've also utilized SSC to do uh, floors. And then we've also utilized SSC to help us with deep cleaning uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so the proposal specifically tonight that you have in front of you is to move forward on contracted services for uh, JA Fair, so it's just a, a one campus. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Bailey to give maybe just a tad more background and then jump into some of the, the factors to maybe help your decision. All right, good evening again. I also have uh, Kevin Yarber, our Director of Maintenance Operation on the line as well to answer any questions you might have. But just a little background, even before SSC, we decided several years back, uh, we've always had an issue with having vacant uh, custodial positions in the district. Uh, I mean, that's just the pool we have turnover in. So it's typically hard to get a good pool of applicants that can pass the background or that want to stay long term. So they're typically looking for advancement and other opportunities. But uh, we actually did an RFP. I forgot what year it was, but we actually awarded a contract to a company called GSA to help out with those uh, substitute uh, custodian uh, filling those, uh, those roles out there. Uh, we dealt with them for a few years. They were Pretty good. We hired some of, some of their employees, but as management changed, the, the, the lack of service actually went down. Uh, ran into this company actually through an Arkansas Association School Business Officer Conference, and uh, several districts around the state was actually utilized them. Uh, they reached out to us several times, and we, we just looked at their proposal, and we decided to give them a trial and just substitute custodial uh, services. Uh, from that point, it's grown into this partnership that we have today. I uh, want to just address a few things. I have another slide if we'll go down to the next one, if you don't mind, but you see some of the schools they've, they've worked in as well. But uh, basically on here, what, what a custodial costs the district is about 30,000, but we didn't do this to save money. It was actually decrease the, the, the level of service that our, our schools are actually receiving. Uh, and we're not, I mean, we're not a custodial uh, management company. We're an educational company, a lot of, uh, you know, companies are going toward outsourcing these types of things because that's just not the expertise. So when it came to trying to advertise and then get a good pool in, we just didn't just, honestly, we just didn't do a good job in getting a good pool in there. Uh, we didn't have the dedicated team to actually uh, do all the training for our, our custodians on floor care and different things like that. So we actually had floor crews going out in the summer and we were actually, uh, I think this was a few summers ago, I believe uh, Mr. Yarber is in, in this director position that time, but. Uh, we were looking at ways to, to better those those floor care uh, crews and, and, and our maintenance out there. We had some 
some crews that was put together with child nutrition workers, uh, custodials, and transportation that wanted to work over the summer. So we did some training with those, but they, the upkeep wasn't where we wanted to, do, to be. So we, we looked at this company. Uh, we actually, like Mr. Poor said, we, we have them currently at Stevens and Hall. If you walk through Hall and it's clean, I mean, it's, it's a thousand percent better than what it was five years ago. Uh, Hall was bad. I mean, we constantly went over there and tried to, you know, get it to the point uh, where it, it just looked decent. But I mean, it looks good now. Uh, but here are some benefits as far as custodial service. We're not looking at doing a, a total outsource of the district. Uh, but uh, right now, we typically run about 18 to 20 vacant positions at any time in the district. And uh, we can have that can be compounded based on additional people on extended medical leave. And it's hard to get subs in, but they uh, filled that board to the best of their ability out there. Uh, they actually allowed us on some of those subs to actually house some of those people permanently, but we have kind of a gentleman's or, or, or agreement out there that we won't steal from each other. But we typically hadn't had any employees that go to work for them that want to come back to the district. Like I said they pay a little bit more for their starting their starting people there. So their average pay is between eleven twenty five and uh, eleven fifty, and we're just getting to eleven dollars on our starting because of minimum wage. Uh, but you can see the different things out here: the risk mitigation for them. So SSC is responsible for workers comp and uh, health insurance. So the important part on that one is if we have a, if we have a regular employee out uh, that's out on medical leave or for workers comp, we still pay that employee. Plus we have to get a sub in to pay for that sub. So you're really paying for, I would say one and a half positions when you have a, a normal LRSD uh, custodian out where in this situation, if they have somebody out, they're responsible for replacing that person. So it's, I mean, there's no increased cost for us. Uh, they provide all the training for the employees and they have professional trainers along with all the equipment for the buildings and provide uniforms as well. So, and I have Mr. Yarbrough on here. If you want to chime in on any parts of this, please feel free as well, Mr. Yarbrough. Uh, but the biggest part here, uh, they, they hire the, the same people we would be trying to hire, but they have the expertise of going out there, recruiting them and training them. So they're not bringing people in from Florida, from Texas, or Oklahoma. They're hiring the people who, who live within our Little Rock School District attendance zone. Uh, they may be parents that have kids here as well. And they're definitely in our community. So it, having this, you know, as an outsource, that means that they're not bringing people in from out of state. Uh, but what else did I want to say on here? Uh, as far as uh, like pay, the pay is down there between 1125 and 1175 an hour. The proposal on this one is to actually start off at uh, 1150, which is uh, 50 cent more than what we actually pay our starting custodians right now. So their benefits are a good they they these are full-time positions out there and if you're doing a cost analysis for it for us to hire eight just say positions out there roughly cost us about two hundred and forty thousand with benefits this proposes two hundred and fifty thousand uh the part that uh is not on, on ours is actually the equipment cost the, the actual supplies and if we have any vacancies out there or, or need sub costs so it's pretty much cost neutral but it also helps with, I think, with the administrator of the school. So if you have an issue, and uh, some of you all will be, uh, I guess, looking at maybe board hearings and different things, if you had an experience in the board hearings, uh, if you have any issues with one of the contractors, we just simply tell the contractor, you're not doing this, we need to correct it. If it happens in the school with a normal employee, you have to go through those different chains out there. So it does help with some of that administration, but I mean, for, for this, with us running still 18 or so vacant positions throughout the actual year, this allows us to consolidate these sites and actually move those employees to, to sites where we have vacancies over there. So no employee, no custodian has ever lost their job because of outsourcing. We've always were able to fill them in other places so they can help out with some of our vacancies. Uh, we talked about, if we go back one slide, real quick, I think it may be the last little bullet, maybe it's on here. I think it might have been actually an executive summary, but uh, it was a question about actually whether this actually have to be to be bid out. We can go back to that slide now. But we're utilizing what's called a tips taps agreement. It's a cooperative purchase agreement. And, and this is put together where uh, multiple people within this program actually, they issue out bids that uh, districts or different agencies could actually 
what we call piggyback off and use those bids that's already been put out there as a national purchasing cooperative. Uh, so they're part of this. I mean, they have to go through all the all the, the steps to actually become members and actually submit bids out there. So we actually use this for certain, certain uh, I guess, services and, and certain products we need out there, but we also negotiate with them for better rates than what's actually out on these bids as well. So they've been a, a great partner, like Mr. Ford said, over this pandemic. We hadn't had to pay anything extra for them coming out there to sanitize our school, and we've had a lot of issues where they we had to, to utilize them. So, Mr. Yarber, anything you want to add to the conversation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Also, I, I think it's important to note that during the uh, recent uh, freezing temperatures and busted water lines, we, we actually so we weren't requesting any substitutes during that period. Um, you know, we had quite a few schools that we we just weren't had didn't have staff on site because the water was turned off and we had uh, in, in in a lot of our buildings we had a lot of spaces that were full of water and you know trying to mitigate it and, and remediate it um so we were actually they they, they pitched in and and, and offered a, a a couple of crews of people and trucks with equipment and and they helped us remediate uh, much of the water in, in in a handful of our schools as well so and again that that doesn't come at, the, at any, any additional cost to the district um, I think they've they've gone well above and beyond what the um, verbiage and expectation is in the written contract. So um, it's been a fantastic partnership, in my opinion. And they're they're a great company to work with, and um, it's just they 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 go way above and beyond the call. Can I add one last thing in, Miss Hatter, before we turn it to you? Um, I think that you know you're hearing that the salaries of what we pay versus what they have it's almost cost neutral. I do want to put up the fact that uh, some of these things that they go above and beyond, but also products, they then provide the products for those sites and in particular, the equipment. And that is a huge thing that really helped us at Southwest and Hall that they brought in their own equipment uh, that then it frees up us for dollars to use elsewhere. Uh, and I don't know if you have a comment on that, Kevin, real quick, but I think that's a significant thing. Yes, sir. And, 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 and two, it's not it's the, the equipment that they bring in. They, they purchase new equipment on the, on the account. So when we, we agree to have them uh, help us service a, a facility, a turnkey solution, uh, they procure uh, uh, new purchased equipment. Uh, they literally bring it in, in, the, in the box and uncrate it and assemble it. And, and uh, so um, we're, not, we're not having them bring in used equipment or equipment from another account or anything like that. It is purchased specifically for Little Rock School District. Thank you, Ms. Hatter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey and Ms. Mr. Yarberry. Uh, a lot of R's uh, uh, for your presentation on that. I'm going to go ahead and um, open it up for uh, questions or discussion. I will start it off with uh, with the background checks that 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 uh, the company uh, do, are they equivalent right to the same level of background checks that our district will um, conduct uh, with you know, with persons working in our schools? Yes, ma'am. I can answer that. Um, they, they so they specialize in uh, educational institutions, uh, typically public school systems. Um, so they, they, they follow the precise guidelines that we follow for background checks. Um, they, they, they do it through the same uh, entities and, and authorities. Um, and so if they don't meet the criteria that we require, then they, they, we, we consider them not employable. Okay, and then uh, do they also do um, double back and, and do background checks right as they are employed and working uh, right in a school location uh, the same way that the district does. Yes, ma'am. They, they, they follow the exact precise protocol that Little Rock School District follows. Okay. And so they will have multiple background checks, whether it's annually or how many every year? Yes, ma'am. Correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I will open it up for discussion, you guys. This is a uh, action item uh, for, you know, for the board to vote on. Sorry, I got a lot of time to move my papers around. Um, so I'm going to do a quick scroll because the view I'm in, I can't see everybody. Yes, uh, I heard a ha. So whoever said that, go ahead and talk. Um, Director Calloway, how are you doing? Go ahead. 
Uh, Ms. Jobber, uh, this particular company, do they have building engineers? Uh, so in, in our uh, contractual agreement, uh, obviously we did, we did not uh, ask for that service. Um, they, they do have, they do cover a wide range of expertise uh, in facilities um, um, services. Um, including child nutrition, maintenance, uh, groundskeeping, uh, landscaping, things of that nature. Um, but uh, but but the but the agreement that we have with them is solely for custodial and cleaning services. Okay, since that's the agreement that you have with them, uh, do, do uh, does the Little Rock School District no longer employ uh, in building engineers? We currently do not have any building engineers in our buildings, no, ma'am. Okay. This okay. This is my point. Uh, with the building engineers and whatnot, there is their job to go. It, well, it used to be another life. Uh, their job to go out and check things like boilers and the heating and air conditioning systems and see if there's a problem. Now, I don't know what extent of damage that was done to these buildings, but if an engineer uh were checking those buildings uh it might not have been as much damage i i, I come from a cold a much colder climate and no but it had gotten down to zero there before but we always had people to go to the buildings to check the boilers to check the pipes that kind of thing this this big that didn't have to happen if somebody was checking them. I, I address that a little bit as well. So typically our buildings are older. Uh, the new buildings that we built, we didn't have issues with plumbing. I mean, these buildings were really built uh, to the current standards we have now, like Southwest or Pinnacle View and different things like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of the pipes were exposed to outside. I mean, we had frigid temperatures, uh, been this cold since 1918. So, I mean, it was a, a situation where the roads weren't even, really people shouldn't have been on the roads, but uh, Kevin and his crew was actually, the night we had a board meeting when it was snowing last week, they were here in Little Rock, actually drove in and actually going around to those buildings, actually uh, <laughs> cutting off water themselves and different things. But I don't think that was something that could have been avoided, but we, we had building engineers, I guess, up to six or seven years ago. Of course, we had different uh, financial, cuts we had to make. Those were some of the, the reductions. Uh, maintenance has lost over 50 employees over uh, eight years. I mean, 50, that's a lot. So, I mean, we, we, we went toward the support areas and cut as much as we could away from the schools before we started actually reducing the school. That was a conversation we started having when we started talking about a DSEG wind down and uh, getting from other, from the DSEG funding. So, uh, right now, that's probably not gonna be anything we can, we can do. Uh, Kevin, actually, uh, Mr. Yarbrough has crews that go out and actually monitor buildings and different things like that, but I don't think it was a way to avoid a lot of the, the burst pipes we had out there in these situations, not when you have temperatures in the 20s and the, and the teens and, and even zero here. Well, uh, but that would have that would have probably helped Mr. Bailey and not causing as much damage that we've had done. And I realize that this district is old. Mine was older. Uh, but as long as you have people that can go and check, at least check. But we don't have anybody who's checking. I like the concept as long as you all don't turn into service pro, because that was a big failure. But uh, uh, I like that concept, but we do need people to go and check on buildings. Ms. And, Calloway, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that's my opinion. So so I just wanted to, to, to be sure everybody understands that, you know, in this particular situation, obviously we, we our last day in the building was that Friday prior to the to the snow event. Uh, we didn't have anybody in any of our buildings in the district, even if we had building engineers, um, they would not have reported to those buildings. Um, and it wasn't until um, we got that first call last Thursday that we realized we, 
and, and listen, we, we knew the weather event was coming and, and we, we, we thought we knew, um, we had a pretty good picture of where our exposure was with regard to the freezing temperatures and the types of damage that we might be up against. Um, and, and frankly, we went in, 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 into those buildings. Those were our primary focus on the front end. And, and we did find some things in some of these buildings. Fortunately, we were able to, to get a lot of that uh, taken care of in the first night or two. Um, but uh, I think in this particular case, as I said, we didn't have a soul in any of our buildings for over a week. Um, and most of that week, uh, we have well below freezing temperatures. Uh, and when we, in, our, in Arkansas, when we sustain below freezing temperatures like that, it's, it's a very, very um, um, difficult thing to, to not have that kind of exposure. Um, I've had, I've had um, you know, experiences with other organizations that have buildings that experience the same problems. Uh, and we're just not, uh, frankly, we're not prepared for that in, in Central Arkansas. Um, so anyway, with that said, I, I, I want, thought I might speak a little bit about the, um, in years past when we had building engineers, I, I think that um, it's also important to understand that we, we, we use that term. It is simply a, a, a title that, that some folks had um, as a building engineer, they, they literally were low level maintenance uh, staff members. And when I say low level, they, they just didn't have a lot of um, uh, maintenance experience. Um, and, um, you know, we, uh, in, in some cases, not all, um, we, we just, we did not have a good experience with the folks. They, they were more about, um, you know, reporting a problem than they were to actually repair a problem. Um, so we would, don't get me wrong, we did have some good ones, um, but as Mr. Bailey stated, that was uh, part of the, the uh, large amount of employees that we lost several years ago, and it did hurt in some cases, no doubt, um, but uh, we, uh, we, we, we just try to refocus those resources on, on custodial staff, and, uh, because that's really where our need, need, we felt our need was. And, and, I, and I do agree mm -hmm. with that. But however, if you had had people that were trained to be engineers, you know, everybody uh, just can't be an engineer. But what I'm hearing you say is that was just a ceremonial basic uh, 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 type of job. And so you're the engineer. But in other places, and I realize that Arkansas is different, and it, I didn't even come out of my house for two weeks, so I hear you. I understand what you're saying. Yes, but uh, I, I, I just can't help but think that if we had like some people who were trained and uh, 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 dealing with like spills, go through and check and see are uh, the boilers up or what, however that we would not have had as much uh, uh, damage as we have. And that's just my opinion, uh, because I, I was really, really shocked when I found out even Parkview had some water damage yes, in, in Rip Arena, you know? And so uh, I was like, okay, we're the engineers, and I know I've been gone a while, so uh, we don't have them. You answered my question. Well, let, let me let me say let me respond real quick. To that. I'm sorry, Miss Hatter. Go ahead. Go ahead, really quick. Go ahead. I just wanted to say so. So Thursday, I, I believe it or not, I, I do have we we have <clears> got <throat> seven individuals in my shop that are highly trained okay. um, in, in the field of maintenance and engineering, and and those are those folks were asked specifically to come and assist us so that we could okay. get in front of and, and try to correct any problems that we identified as early as possible. So. Um, it wasn't really until the pipe started uh, thawing that we really knew we had a problem. So, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we, in fact, we just learned about another one yesterday that we didn't even know was out there. I mean, as late as yesterday, if you can imagine. So, um, so anyway, with that said, I, I do have some very highly trained maintenance and engineering folks that I've identified to help us in these types of efforts. Okay, that's the type of thing we need. Uh, I understand what you're saying. We didn't have it then, but you answered my question. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Um, okay. So are, I'm scanning to see if any other um, questions or um, discussions. I have a question for Mr. <laughs> Bailey. Oh, go ahead, uh, Director Johnson. 
Mr. Bailey, did I hear you correctly in saying that mm. no custodian that's presently employed will lose their job? That is correct. Not not due to this. Now, I won't oh. say they won't lose their job, but it's not right. because of here. So okay. all the custodians we actually did when we outsourced Hall and, and Stevens, they were all transferred to some of those vacant positions. So instead of having 20 vacant positions, we may go down to 10 and try to fill those. So it helps with filling some of those vacancies. We already have a, a pool on staff that's passed the background check, has been trained in different things like that. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Yarberry, uh, just to follow up on um, a maintenance question around um, checks, uh, uh, do, does your staff uh, do uh, routine checks to um, help prevent uh, large cost items? Yes, ma'am. Actually, believe it or not, the Department of Education, the Facilities and Transportation Division has a required uh, set of preventative maintenance measures that, that um, we have to, they hold us accountable to submit uh, on a periodic basis. Some of those are monthly, some of them are quarterly, uh, some of them are semi-annual and some are annual. And um, a lot of them are life safety type systems, um, but, but boilers and chillers and, and larger equipment systems that, that, uh, that, that we have risk of failure, such as what we're discussing tonight. Um, they, they do have uh, a required set of uh, preventative measures, preventative maintenance measures that, uh, that we're, we're accountable for. Thank you, um, Mr. Yarberry. Okay, uh, we are moving forth. Um, now what is what we have before us is an action item on the J Fair uh, custodial contract. Uh, can I get a motion? If there's no further discuss. Oh, I think he does have questions. Okay. <laughs> You guys, you, if you have a question, just unmute because again, I can't see um, our entire board. Um, I, I have one that I'll um, just go through real quick. I got contact from, I believe it was a parent who said that she had concerns about the quality of the work um, provided by the, the contractors as opposed to our in-house custodians. Uh, and I was just wondering for Mr. Walker, I haven't seen the actual language of the contract but i'm assuming just understanding contracts that if we have issues with the quality of the work um would there be a way to address that pursuant to the contract and, and you know ultimately either terminate the contract or, or change something if we're not happy with the actual work we're receiving yes, yes that definitely would be possible okay and have you all had any issues with that with the the quality of the custodial services um, being a problem to date, no, no ma'am. Okay. I, I want to jump in on that, actually. We have had some things that we've had to work through. So I, okay. I want to make sure I'm honest. We have had to have some things where, you know, um, maybe I'll give an example. At Stevens, uh, the start of the, the school year, where Mr. Uh, Carlock, the principal, was not happy with the pace of the building getting prepared. And he voiced that concern not only to uh, the contracting company to SSC, but also to us. And then we worked it out. Uh, we had uh, some issues as we opened up Southwest in terms of it, it also needing to be addressed. And that's been the beauty of this company is that as they are willing partners to sit down and work through problems. So I just wanted to make sure I'm clear with you, Ms. Nol Ms. Noland and the rest of the board that when there's been a problem and there have been, we've worked through them and worked through them very quickly. And, and got to a good place. Thank you for that question. And contractually, we hadn't had any problems, but as far as service, yeah. if there's any problem with service, we've always been right on the spot to address it. So they've been good to address it as well. So and Mr. Yarber is the point of contact with that actual vendor. Yeah, I, I actually am the direct point of contact. Uh, there, okay. there, there, there are no filters uh, between that reporting and myself. Okay, thank you. If there's Hatter, any other comments, uh, jump in. I just wanted to make a comment, Ms. Hatter. Um, you know, I've, I'm with some of the questions before. I would not be interested in this if we were going to be paying people less or, or hiring people part-time to replace full-time people. And I understand from the response that, that that's not the case. And that and I also would not be uh, wanting to consider this if we were going to displace anybody. And Ms. Johnson's question was, was important one for me there. I did want to make just one comment. Um, 
pursuant to um, Ms. Nat Gordon's comment earlier about the importance of you know having a community family in a school. I think that's an important concept where people can feel like they're part of the team and part of the family. But I, I would want to say from my own experience, um, in my employer, we have a management company who handles our janitorial environmental services. And, and those employees feel like they are part of the family. We, we are connected to them and they are connected to us. So I don't, I don't think that um, a management company necessarily makes that an impossible thing. I think it's the, it's the quality of your people, um, no matter you know who is paying their bill. If they're in the building, if they're a good person, and you know they can be become a part, an important part of your community. Uh, I'd like to respond to that, um, uh, Mr. Adams. You're you're exactly right, and I tell you, there there are some personalities, even individual personalities, with the company that have made a direct um, a connection and impact on certain principals and certain teachers and certain other staff members in our building. So uh, I think it really comes down to those personalities and, and how well they work. Uh, together with other people, um, but but I, I I just wanted to make that point that uh, we we have had some experiences where we've had a handful of people that have made those made those uh, close up and personal um, uh, connections. I have a question uh, for Mr. Bailey. Uh, I have worked in Gopher Rat Central, and who is in charge of pest control? Is that still the cut stuff? Oh, you, there you go. Because I know we had gopher rats. I mean, they were big as little dogs back in the day at Central. Uh, and I mean, really. And so uh, at some point, I had a problem with termites at, at fair. So I just wanted to know, like, who would be in charge of that? Well, Ms. Calloway, that's me. Uh, that okay. my, the pest control is actually a responsibility of the maintenance and operations department. Um, I've actually got a very capable um, administrative uh, part of my staff that, that uh, is a point of contact on that. So when we okay. have uh, work requests come through for pest control, uh, she usually addresses that head on. Uh, she has a very good working relationship with our vendor that uh, ha helps us out on pest control. So that, that, that is wrapped up in, in, in the responsibility of my, my department. Okay, thank you. Um, is, is there any uh, further questions before I close it out pertaining to this action item that we're getting ready to uh, see if we're gonna make a motion on? Okay, can I get a hearing and seeing uh, none? Is there a motion? Does any, so do we, is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna restate the question or restate what we're doing next. We, there, we're on the agenda item for the consortial services for JA Fair. It is an action item. And yes. uh, do we have a motion on the President, floor for it? President Hatter, I move that the Little Rock School District contract services, custodial services for JA Fair K-8 school Okay. Is any is there a second? I'll second the motion. Who was that, please? You didn't show up on the screen. Mr. Wood. Okay, so we have uh, Director Mason that made the motion. Director Wood seconds the motion. Now we're at it is now we're at a vote since we already have discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the motion passes. Very good. Um, thank thank you. you, you guys, for uh, the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Next on the agenda, we're moving forward, is the January 21 uh, <clears throat> board financial report and our CFO, uh, Mr. Kelsey Bailey will present that. And as he's going through, if um, if board members are able to, to uh, make any notes or comments or um, questions to formulate that so we could 
move through the rest of the agenda items. Um, and then we have 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 an uh, added discussion at, at the end. So, um, Mr. Bailey, you are recognized. Thank you, Ms. Hatter. Uh, again, we have our monthly uh, financial reports out there, and we're going to probably highlight more on the expenditure side. What I have up now is is comprised of three different parts. We have our summary of revenue status report, our summary of expenditure report, and our fund balances. Out there, what I have on the screen right now is, is showing our actual uh, summary of revenue. And typically what we, the part that uh, may vary here is the 11,000 account and the 12,000 account, what I have highlighted now. These are our local tax revenue. Uh, of course, like we said last year, we came in a little bit short on the second half of the year. Uh, still looking promising now. Of course, the first half of the year is finished for this fiscal year, so we were up a little over $60 million on this one where you said negative, that means it's good. Uh, we're still awaiting on the major uh, tax payment comes in in April and May. So that will give us a determinant on how we, we're doing in what's called that 11,120 account. Uh, the other ones seem to be tracking according to uh, our budget here. Uh, we've had some like land redemption here. We've already collected 94% uh, on our taxes and revenue and lieu of taxes here that I highlighted here. We're already at 97%. So we pretty much have met those uh, budget projections there. So feeling pretty confident about those will uh, continue to come in. Uh, as we scroll down, most of the other ones are actually state categorical state funding and different things. So as we have allocated, they typically come in as, as they are listed as far as budget. Uh, the pieces that I had highlighted earlier, the local property taxes are the ones we, we only really do projections and hope they come in at a 98% collection rate like they have in the past. As I scroll down to page four, the actual PDF on there, we get to some of the expenditures. I know we had some questions about a few of these categories. And if you look across here, of course, I go through for the viewing public as well. So we have budgeted and we have period expenditures. Period expenditures only denotes that the period for this month. So for January, these were the expenses associated with January. Encumbrances that said outstanding, those are uh, purchase order or requisitions out there. Encumbrance is basically a reserving budget for uh, future expense. And then we have the combined of a year-to-date uh, expenditures and encumbrance, and that's what we, we have so far. And then we have our available balances out there. As you notice in the certified and some of the uh, salary categories we have some available balances that means it's good but all that's not operating available balances as i pulled the certified for operating i believe it's a little over like 2.2 million so some of those available balance is equates to some of our federal programs that we have out there so uh, we won't realize that much of a savings so don't let that uh kind of fool you out there so right now as far as operating on our certified salary schedule we're looking at about 2.2 uh, million but it's always good not to have a negative over here and be less than under budget here. But as you notice, like on this, what I have highlighted here, we have something called classified overtime. We budgeted about 54,000 on that. We spent 238,000. But if you notice up here, we have some classified room that we went in with quite a few vacancies uh, it started the beginning of the school year with COVID. Uh, most of the classified overtime has come with custodial overtime when we have somebody that may be quarantined and another custodian has the you know, to stay a little bit longer or some of our administrative staff. So that's where we are. And pretty much when we're looking at budget wise, we're looking at everything as far as salary that's in the 61,000 from this point all the way up. So we're still within margins. Anytime we have vacancies out there, it's typically gonna uh, equate to more overtime for some of those staff that have to work. So uh, some of it was office staff as well, having to do some extra duties when they have people out due to quarantine and whatever it might be. And stop me if you have any questions at any time. I'm, I have this up so I can see a few of y'all faces while I have the presentation up. And I know Mr. Adams had a few and I'll try to address some of this. This is another big one we had here, rental or computer related services here. And I, I'll probably take oversight on this mistake on this one, not really a mistake, but uh, this is actually our Conoco Minolta contract here. Uh, we have the 40,000 that's dedicated. That was just for uh, procurement, but the other actual schools when they actually put it in their budget they have it down here at 66 100 general supplies and materials so we pay for that contract out of one location at the end of the year we break those expenses out and actually separate it to the schools or the departments on whether you said so it actually is going to be posted down to the actual school level so 
right now is just still showing out there. Actually, have uh, actually created a six hundred fifty thousand dollar budget adjustment on this one, so it doesn't look so skewed on our reports. But uh, we won't actually uh, utilize it out of that department totally. So, uh, if you look at something like this, where it's showing a four thousand percent increase on this one, which is accident insurance for students here, when they actually paid for this, we actually budgeted it on the category below, but the uh, it needed to be changed to 65, 250. So some of those things, when we get to actually paying invoices, we'll move budget up to the appropriate line if, if we see one that's more appropriate. So, I mean, that's still within the margin. Any questions so far? I think we had a, a few more on here. Uh, this is one as well. Furniture and equipment is showing about a million dollars over uh, and this is directly related to our furniture fixtures and equipment for our, our Southwest High School when we went in. Of course, we went in with the premise that we, we might uh, get that bond extension passed and we were gonna actually have to, you know, amend the budget and actually add some budget there. So we'll do some budget adjustments when it gets close to the year, but that's some adjustments that actually have to come out of our, it's, it's totally in our, uh, what's called our bond, bonded account, our capital improvement account, our fund three. So. We do have to make some adjustments there. We did do a transfer over there. We just hadn't uh, actually transferred the budget down to the specific category. So the amount is covered, but it's just still showing here. So we wanted to leave those without budget at that point in time when we submitted because we weren't sure how much money we were gonna get in if, if the but once we got the, uh, the, the millage passed, so in those different categories. So one of the things I do want to highlight that's uh, a COVID, purely COVID related, but I think we'll be able to, well, I know we'll be able to recoup from our S or two funds is a, our textbooks budget. So we expect the textbooks to be lower, uh, a little over under 2 million this year. And we crossed almost getting close to 3 million, but this was due to having so many kids virtual and have to uh, order those supplemental and some of those consumable supplies out there to send home with the students where they typically be using them on site at school. So. This is one expense that we didn't actually plan for initially, but uh, it'll be covered on our SR2 as well. So just want to bring that to your attention. Were there any other questions about any expenditures? I'm not sure if I covered them. I know you had a, a few on there, Mr. Adams. Mr. Bailey, have, have you completed your presentation? Uh, this is pretty much, that's pretty much it. So the, the next part is just our general fund, our fund balance and changing fund balances. So it shows all our different accounts that we typically provide every month. So nothing really fancy about it until we actually get usually to the May point till we get that uh, that big collection for our, from our spring collection. We kind of see where we're gonna end up as far as our local taxes. So okay. that pretty much concludes my presentation. Alrighty, uh, directors, uh, if you can just uh, unmute and begin talking, and I'll um, direct uh, voice traffic. I just, Ms. Hatter, I just want to respond to Mr. Bailey that, uh, Mr. Bailey, you did address the question that I had. Thank you very much. All right. President Hatter, if this is uh, Jeff Wood. If, if I could ask a question, I'd like to return to my monthly soapbox um, of uh, paying our staff for the work that they did at the beginning of the school year when they were slated to have a day off in their contract the Friday before school started, but that no one uh, could reasonably uh, say that, that our staff wasn't working that day. Um, would this be an appropriate time for us to, to dive into that for just a second? If, if Mr. Bailey, if, would you be able to, to tell me how much um, Mr. No, go go ahead, go ahead, because I don't know what your question is, is going to oh, be. Oh yeah, it, well, it's, it, it, it's about the budget, I suppose. Yep. What what would be the impact on our budget? What would be the financial expense if we were to compensate every contract employee, every every employee that was on a contract, um, one day's pay uh, for the August fourteenth day that they had to work. Uh, I would have to try to calculate that because uh, certain, I think the teachers were off that day, but I know a lot of staff like our staff and support staff where it's just a normal work day. So wouldn't be an extra compensation on that. 
try to have to do the calculation. You may have to give me a minute to, to do something real quick, but. Okay, I, I, I do apologize. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I, I thought that maybe you had already done that, so I apologize. Oh, no um, I would like to, to get an answer to that and get a concrete answer to that and potentially get a, a, a list of options of ways that we could compensate our staff that were supposed to have the day off but couldn't have the day off because of the last minute changes that we put on them to you know to adapt to what the new beginning of the school year was going to look like um i i i'd heard that the that impact might be you know pretty uh costly i don't know what do you, did you have a number or something uh we were looking at the the typical average cost for a teacher daily rate of pay is about i'm um, between 365 and 370 dollars a day so if we were to take 370 times 2,000 employees if that was the number that was affected we're looking at uh, average of about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars so okay so we've been looking at seven hundred and fifty roughly seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to to compensate them what would the cost be uh, in our budget if we were to give them a comp day off instead of uh, directly paying them how would that be different well, it's going to depend if it's a student contact day, you have to have subs in there. So you're looking at a sub cost of average about $90, I think. HR may have to chime in on that time, the number of classrooms and different things like that. But okay. So it's going to range, if I add benefits on there, 750000 just for the salary. So benefits would bring it up to probably about nine hundred twenty-five to a million. So you're looking anywhere from 750000 to a million for those that worked. I don't know who all worked that day. All of them might have, maybe half of them. So it's going to be a range in there. Okay. This is Miss Eason. It is um, now currently $95 a day for a certified um, or degreed substitute. All right. Thank you, Miss Eason. So, what would the calculation be on that if, if everybody got a day off? Well, can we, um, Mr. Um, Bailey, can you um, uh, answer those questions right in the email uh, so we can move the agenda for it? Okay. Which I know it's budgetary related, but it's not uh, related to January's budget. You want me to so, answer that one real quick? About 200,000, depending oh, on if there's 2,000 employees out there, so. Okay. Go, go ahead and re restate that. I. I it was a lag on my time and it seemed like I was talking over you. So director would ask if we were to actually, I guess, give a comp day off and we had to actually pay for a sub and Ms. Easton mentioned that it's $95 a day of sub. So if we would take 95 times 2000, if that was how many employees we had out of rough, it's approximately 190,000, I'm saying 200,000. I'm not sure how many employees it would be uh, for, but that that's roughly the amount. Thank you. Are there any other um, questions for Mr. Bailey regarding uh, January expenditures, the monthly report? Okay, hearing there are none. Thank you, Mr. Bailey, um, for uh, your, your report and your knowledge of the budget. We appreciate you. And we'll move on to the next items. We're getting into board policies. Uh, the changes were um, a part of the board packet and Mr. Uh, Mr. Walker, you are recognized. All right, good evening. There are not action items uh, tonight. Uh, two options are for mainly for review and one is uh, a first reading. The very first option is uh, policy 7.21, it's just to show you the naming of facilities policy. This is mainly because of the increased discussion nationwide in regard to um, uh, racial equality, civil rights, et cetera. And so questions have come to the district about the naming of some of the buildings. And I wanted to show set policy 7.21 in regard to how policy, how buildings are named and, and what process needs to happen, what, what qualifications exist. And that's what we wanted to show you 
in the event that the board wanted to consider um, any discussion about the policy or, or some of uh, some of the issues. Oh, okay. So the, I'm sorry, I was trying to uh, flip to get that policy. So the, what you're saying is that based on if we are going to have a discussion around the name changes, you, you are presenting this policy 7.21 around facility name changes? Yes, only so that, so that the board is aware of what the policy looks like and, and what would have to happen if uh, the board ever wanted to entertain the idea of having to name a facility. Okay, and, and just for um, those, um, those, for the fellow directors as well as um, anybody watching, uh, this is coming up because a uh, parent or some parents at, at uh, Forest Fulbright, let me get it together, Fulbright um, had uh, made a request to uh, explore changing the name of that elementary, which is why um, Mr. Walker is bringing it up. Uh, if you remember at one of our last meetings, either the pre-agenda meeting or our last uh, meeting, we talked about uh, how uh, I too uh, reached out to force Fort Smith on their process of doing of, of, of doing that um, and so what we're doing is getting the information together to get to where right if we had to go through right through that process and, and, and we um, get the formal request to do it we already have the uh, the groundwork uh, not the groundwork but, but the knowledge base uh, to do it and say so this is informational and go ahead Mr. Walker and proceed. Okay if there wasn't anything else on 7.21 I did want to talk about uh, the staffing preference policy. Hold on uh, Mr. Walker I think Ms. Nolan was trying to make a point Ms. Hatter may oh. not have seen it. Well um, it was in anticipation of us potentially having a debate and I was just going to um, request or suggest that we not get into a debate about actual school names and really if we want to um, we can suggest or encourage um, the district to move forward on some sort of process in terms of how would we get public input but um, but really it was just aimed at I thought that we would um, have additional comments and I was hoping that we could avoid diving into the merits of any particular name before we had that opportunity to hear public input and, and you know hear feedback from the community um, but if we don't have debate on that at this moment then we can just keep moving forward yeah that was never on the agenda to even do that this was just strictly um getting the information together sharing the policy for the board on um name changing the facilities and then, of course, um, reached out to other school districts that have been through this process of changing names. So it was more of an informational um, dive. We brought it to right to the board last month, and so because it was brought to us, and so uh, we are just gathering information to bring it right to the board at another time. And so there isn't a, a, a debate that is going to happen. And of course, obviously, there would be. Pub, uh, public input and survey is, is a whole concert of things that will have to take take place and then wide in concert with not only the board but um, the district as well and then the uh, public and then it will come back to the board for a decision on a name is typically how that works in other places and so um, that's not even like a debate is not even on the table. Ms. This Hatter, I'd, I'd like to make a comment before we leave it. Um, and it may not be a time for, it may be something that we'd want to take for later. I, I could see that, but because this has come up for information, it has certainly caused me to think more about it. And, um, and it seems to me that, um, that we as a district should take advantage of this time in our history, in our, in our society, because of the issues, in the, particularly in the past year that have been raised around racial Injustice, you know, for us to take a to uh, 
can take a, a look at at the names of that we have used a, across our district not in reaction necessarily to any particular proposal from uh, from the community in this place but to but to take a look this is a part of the context and environment that, that we're in now and so i would like to see that if the district would be able to put together some type of a group um you know to to develop a proposal for how we could go about having a review of what we do and then try to be more proactive about it and as opposed to reactive about when when somebody might petition us uh, i think i think that in some ways the context of our times has petitioned us and we should and we should respond accordingly to take a, a fresh look at, at at the names that we've chosen you know to use in the past and see if those are still the ones that make sense for us today yeah i i totally um agree with that especially with us being being a civil rights district um that is something that uh i know the district had already looked at um particularly uh i know uh superintendent poor talked about a, a stone and as well as dodd elementary then you know we have some other names that are um that in history have not always uh, favored civil rights, including one of the high schools we talked about earlier. So, um, and and others. And so, um, that is something. Of course, um, um, I will get with um, superintendent. Well, superintendent will uh, look at that um, and get back to us. Mike, uh, um, superintendent Poor, do you have anything on that? With getting the names together. I think you framed it well, actually, all, 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 all three board members of what might may, may need to be the next step. So thank you. Well, President Hatter, if I, I could say I, I interpreted what Director Nolan had to say as, as something that I agree with, and, and I hope I didn't misinterpret it, and I'll allow her to correct me if I did. But the, I, I, I think we should probably come up with a pretty firm naming policy before we start to consider any specific names. Um, I think that coming up with a policy in the generic sense without something imminently in front of us would probably create a better result or a more fair result, um, you know, whenever we are actually considering a specific building or a specific name. And it seems as though that might could be the result of anything that the district does uh, in the next couple of months. Um, and then we might be facing the, the the conundrum of coming up with a policy of how we name them while also trying to decide what the name would be. So I, I would I would favor crafting a policy soon on how we name buildings, uh, if that would be appropriate in front of the board. Yes, um, that is again, part of the reason why we started bringing it up and um, Mr. Uh, Attorney Eric Walker uh, is presenting pre presenting the policy and put it inside of the our board packet was for us to review it um, because we are the um, local legislative um, policy board for our district and so this is something that we would naturally um, uh, do is, is policy so uh, again this is why we're bringing it up so we can have um, uh, comments and discussions around around that because we have already anticipated it coming up um, prior, you know, prior to even um, the, the reach out um, uh, before the election. So, um, and the, our district had already uh, talked about and, and made some strides on removing some of those things. So yeah, that is something that we will do. And so make sure, um, uh, to review the policy that uh, that was in the pack packet, and then put your thoughts together. So when we come back together to have to have the discussion, you guys have it already. Your thoughts already together, Mr. Walker. Do you have more on on your policy? Uh, not on this particular one. I was going to move on to the next one if, if this is an appropriate time for that. Yes, it is. Please go ahead. All right, um, next one is would be a new policies for first reading. Uh, it is uh, 4.5A and it is in regard to uh, how 
you know, student assignments or runs. By and large, this policy codifies the way the student assignment office uh, assigns students to schools ultimately, but there are a couple of um, things that are a little different. And I think that the student assignment office in conjunction with uh, Director Wood and myself uh, talked about this repeatedly for a while. Uh, but the difference is in the way that the, the district has operated the, the, um, the student assignment is noted in this policy, uh, with the exception of uh, the preference for area school members, uh, for area school staff members was moved above the TNT, which is transfer no transportation, and the preference for magnet specialty schools was added to the selection process after the initial recovery and that is noted on um, section A of the policy in particular uh, subsection 3 and subsection 4 with the list of A, B, C, and D uh, so it adds those two things that I just mentioned but otherwise it um, codifies what the student assignment office does on a regular basis okay, so for clarity what you're saying is um, what was presented previous, of course, it, 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 it is already happening uh, to some level of, of extent, just to be clear, just so, and, and so it's not necessarily a, a policy change because teachers are able to have, um, able to choose right where their children will go and have um, a level of priority in placement, so. Well, the, the staffing preferences is, is, is one of the new things to the policy, to, to, the, to the operation of the student assignment office. It was something that uh, Mr. Wood raised some months ago that he, he saw as a need, and, and I think that the office tried to address it with this policy. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. And I know Mr. Wood wanted to speak to any of this. Sure, I'll be happy to just briefly, given that it's first reading. Um, it, it, this is a policy that, that was presented to me as a practical problem in the fall uh, by a teacher that was, was having a hard time getting consideration for her child to, to be placed in, in the school that she worked at. And when, when we reviewed the policy at the time, there was never a mention in any of the uh, priority lists uh, for staff consideration. It just wasn't a formal thing. And so this would uh, codify essentially a, a position in consideration for the staff. And we, we've done our best to craft it in a way that, that takes many political considerations into, uh, into play and legal requirements. So I have a question. So would this mean that, um, is, is this a, a wider spread issue um, beyond the one staff member? Well, I mean, how, how how often or how big of an issue is this among staff? Because I have, is, is, is there any data that or something that shows that like this is a concern for a majority of, of our staff outside of one person is my question. Uh, my, my understanding would be that a majority of staff, uh, this is not an issue. This is this is to help uh, every staff member have uh, an equal level of priority. Okay, so and so we don't have um, just to make sure that like we're not crafting or getting in the process of or um, to crafting district wide policy based off of a person. So um, is this um, and that's what I'm saying. It does is this a, a, a greater problem for a staff members and have there been a study um, on on this to verify? I think there are consistent problems at certain schools. Okay, uh, which schools are there? Are are those schools? Well, it would be your more full schools. So we're talking about the Gibbs, the Jeffersons, the the which ones, like. The Roberts. I'm just, Roberts. Okay, I, I was going to say yeah, Roberts. Fulbright. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, it, schools where you know that, that regularly, that regularly, 
max out or get very close to maxing out, um, staff often finds themselves on the outside looking in, trying to find a way to have, have their child at their school. Okay. Um, I will reserve the, the rest of my comments. Uh, I, I, there is a level of pause of just doing Ms. it. Ms. Hatter, <laughs> sorry, this is Leanne uh, Wilson. And I just wanted to say, you know, if you looked on the district website, even though I know this is making it a formal policy, really the district has operated in some capacity of having staff preference. Mm -hmm. And it was different for zone schools and different for magnet schools. So this policy kind of makes it the same for magnet schools and zone schools and makes it a more formal process instead of just our practice, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. That's the way I understood it. It's absolutely right, Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had a comment. If Vicki, did you have President Adder? Did you have more? No, go ahead. You're recognized. Oh, okay. Um, so two comments. One is, I remember when I was looking at LRST schools when my child was in um, he was pre-K, I believe, and we were looking at um, kindergarten, and, and this was a selling point when you had schools that could say, you know, a huge number of our staff choose to educate their own kids here at this school. So it can be a, um, a positive, a marketing tool, if we can show that the staff members trust the school enough that they're bringing their own child there. So it's just, you know, when we're talking about enrollment challenges and things like, like um, you know, challenges with, with marketing for a school like Hall, that could be a positive where you can show that the staff are choosing to bring their own children to that school. Um, the other part that I would mention is I have heard from one um, teacher, this is not recent, but about the fact that we may want to look at it a little bit broader than just that particular school because, for example, um, let's say a teacher is at Pulaski Heights Elementary under this policy they might be able to get a preference to have their child attend Pulaski Heights Elementary with them but when that child hits middle school all of the other classmates will go to Pulaski Heights Middle and that child would then no longer have a preference because their parent is just at the elementary and they're no you know they're not going to be with that cohort anymore and so I'm not making any formal suggestion to change the proposal here but it's just a thought we ought to keep in mind it may be something that staff members who are parents may just have to weigh the, the benefit and the um, cost of, of doing that. But it is a thought that if we do set up a preference and it's just for the actual school where the parent teaches, it doesn't address the full, you know, elementary to middle to high school flow. So those are my thoughts. Okay. So uh, we're and so this is the, the first read of it, and particularly it's being drawn up or expanded out of, because we do have a level of preference already for our, our staff, but this is being drawn up out of the, the more popular schools that have a waiting list. So we're not talking about schools that, um, I, I get it. So uh, direct, I'm um, sorry, Attorney Walker, uh, uh, you may proceed. All right, and so this will be back for a second reading uh, and potential action next month. So if there's any questions or comments in the meantime, uh, I'd be available to work on any changes that are necessary or um, work with the student, student assignment office. I just wanted to say that before moving on. The last item is uh, section one. There are not any recommended changes at this point to section one. Uh, this is the section one is the board governance uh, section that is presented to the board for potential review uh, in case uh, there are any thoughts or changes to revise how the board decides to govern themselves. It has it was initially adopted at, uh, during the conversion from the to the model policy from the ASB model policy and revised regularly uh, since then the most recent. Uh, amendment happened on December 17th when the board terms changed from the three years to the five years. So that was the most recent change on 1.19. Uh, but 
this is, is, is what exists. And I know that Mr. Poor, in, in talking about this previously, mentioned that this would have, um, I guess, been a part of some of your training. And, and so it's uh, coming at, a, at an odd time, but this was uh, added for the board's consideration to discuss and review section one, there, how, how the board governs themselves. Ms. Hatter, um, if I could jump in real quick and, and maybe this will help the conversation on this particular topic. And, and Mr. Walker is exactly right that, you know, this was set up weeks ago and then we had to back away from uh, the training with Mr. Smith and, and Mr. Percival. Uh, but Ms., Ms. Hatter and I had a conversation today, members of the board, that as we move forward, we still do need to continue to think about how we operate as a board and what the board superintendent relations are. And maybe most important to all of you is what do we do to get to a place where we start to develop some of our strategic goals and you know some of the core commitments we're going to make to each other and our ways that we want to operate. And, and that's a part of what was going to be his third training. So we still have the second training to do and then we got to do the third training. So Ms. Hatter and, and Dr. Owa, uh, myself, Horace Smith, Steve Percival, we did talk today. We'd like to throw out to the board to do a, a board retreat just for time on the training and finishing the training all up in one segment. And the suggestion is that we'd like to look at this as being a, a training that would occur on March 13th, which is a Saturday, and we take it in the morning. And so the placeholder of this policy isn't a bad thing. And remember, policy can be looked at for two months, three months, if we so choose. But um, I just I think it's probably a good time to throw out that concept of March 13th. I'm going to turn it to Ms. Hatter to let us round off on this conversation. And I don't anticipate us having a whole big dialogue because we really haven't gotten any farther on training. But that maybe this kind of connects the dots a little bit um, and, and gets us to finish up. The other positive thing about doing a retreat on the 13th is that it sets up for our work agenda when we meet on March 11th that the two topics coming in that would be kind of foundational would be talking about our literacy program and then also talking about salaries. What can we do to impact salaries for both teachers and for all the rest of our staff? And so we wouldn't just be talking about our agenda for March, but we'd also be receiving this you know, foundational information that's going to impact our budgets and impact our, our thinking about exit criteria with literacy. Ms. Hatter, do you want to add to my comments? Uh, no, you have uh, cover, covered uh, them. I do have a comment, but it's about something directly prior to. Um, but 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 you covered it. And 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 two, uh, uh, what what I will add is that the training that we will receive from Horace. Smith and um, uh, Steve will uh, help us create the processes as well as we have to do the mission and the vision statement. Something we um, have been mention mentioned before as well as the direction and the strategic um, plan. And so, and then looking at us as a board because it's nine of us and how uh, we uh, have a unity which is not uniformity uh, and how we are able to be effective as as a board um but outside of that i don't have anything else um to, to add by to that piece of, of what you just said superintendent Hatter, are, are you frozen miss hatter could, could i make a comment on on the policy that uh mr walker has presented uh, are you speaking about the one he's talking about right now or the four point, which one? I'm sorry. No, the one, the, the board, the one point part. Oh, with the governors. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So Mr. Walker, if, if you could look at section 1.23, number seven, or school board member code of conduct. I think Somewhere along the lines, it looks to me like there was just a, a, a lack of an edit in, in that one. And I think it could be fi fixed fairly simply. It, but right now it reads, board members may provide individual advice, by may provide direction to the superintendent. And I wonder if 
if we could just change that the board members may provide individual advice or direction to the superintendent only as a result of official board action if that would just make sense but it because that doesn't make sense the way it's written you know in the middle of that sentence right now absolutely yes i can i can and two i have i also have another question about uh our i'm sorry director adams i jumped that, in that's okay. I that was that was the only that was my only comment about about the every I didn't see anything else that worried me, but that was that was the, the place it looked like it needed to be correct. And with with the board governance, I thought that uh, our training would have taken place so as for us to be able to go through and do this. It um, uh, part of me feels like we we shouldn't vote on this one until we're able to go through I know we can always change it however it is it this governance versus our last elected um, a board um, policies is a bit different and two it, 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 it it's, it's a lot of basically laws our state laws made up as our policies which yeah we, we do that however when you look at when I looked at look back at what our last elected board policy was. Some of them I haven't been through because it's so much greater. Um, it just seemed like we may need to um, wait until we have that training to look back and see how else you know, we would want to tweak it uh, before we approve it. Those are my, my, my thoughts on it because it is different and this policy was written under state control and looking back at the last um, elected board policies there are some difference and, and and i do understand laws have changed but just for due diligence just to make sure we're actually um, creating something that we will be able to follow that's that that is just a comment um but we can move forward And two, I just want to be uh, just careful with the policies, that's all. Okay, direct, uh, Mr. Walker. That was all on my end. And these are not um, action items, we are just uh, uh, discussing this. Um, and uh, we have just before we adjourn I do want to go back to the uh, teacher uh, policy around schools is that four point is it four point five yeah four point five my question uh, with that is will 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 that uh, take away opportunities for um, other students to be able to attend because most likely those, um, the schools that have was mentioned, those are popular schools. And it, it will, will, will there be a cap on the number of employees, teachers, I mean, children that could be there? Um, will it take away from non-teaching uh, staff uh, children placement if so how much I, I, and two I'm looking at it from an equity standpoint or just a fairness standpoint uh, that that is my question probably the most appropriate person to answer that might be Dr. Fields oh I forgot he was on here <laughs> okay <laughs> um, and I'll ask you uh, the good um, evening uh, board of directors Mr. Poor to answer your question um, no, it won't uh, negatively impact at all. The way that the assignment process is set up is that, of course, the law regulates that people in their attendance zones are the first ones that are assigned before we can ever go to the staff preference piece. And then the law also um, states that we have to put school choice, opportunity choice students in, and then we go to staff preference. So anyone that typically wants to get in uh, that's a t in the tennis zone. They will be afforded a seat first. Okay. Is is there a cap? I remember seeing a, a five percent. Is is there a cap on 
on the number of um, staffing children or a cap on there? I can't but remember there, what I've seen the, the, the um, percentage on. The percentage um, is on the opportunity choice and school choice. There's a certain percentage that we have to um, afford, offer seats to. And um, as far as the um, staff preference, uh, your frequency of that, and then you said you basically coined it. It's not that many schools. It has mm -hmm. surfaced, and typically you may only have three, four. The most I've ever seen is probably four staff members um, in my 10 years down there that at one school. But uh, typically it's only one or two. But four was the most that we had, and that was this year. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that. I, if I would have thought you was on here, I would have asked you. <laughs> no, so, it. Mr. Fields, where you're saying a, a policy is really not necessary because you normally can't accommodate that three right. or four. Is it? Is that fair to say that? Well, the policy, I think the policy is good because it does formalize how we do it so that there won't be any question in terms of is it fair is it equitable is it done exactly because we call it a practice we're under arkansas school board policies and our practice is un are under that but as long as this is a formal policy there's no question about whether it's going to be done and that gives us the staff members at the school the comfort of knowing as soon as the district can assign our children to the school they will okay okay Thank you for that. Thank you for coming on. You made that um, clear. Appreciate okay. you. Good no seeing problem. you. Good too. Okay. So, uh, you guys, it uh, we have one added item to our agenda. It's uh, 1020. Uh, are are you guys okay? Do you need a break? We it's 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 a discussion item around. Uh, state testing for uh, this year and uh, and options. So our, whether or not uh, we will take uh, any any steps for, uh, around state testing. Can I jump in, Ms. Hatter, that may help us move forward? Um, uh, Director Noland was kind enough as a part of her resolution to shoot the resolution to us so I can have Dr. Owa put that up on the screen so that everyone can see it. And then I, we can allow Dr. or Director Nolan then to just share what her point of view was on it. And then that could open it up to discussion and uh, then uh, a motion to accept or, or whatever actions you end up taking, just as a thought. Um, is that all right, President Hatter, to proceed sure. that way? Sure, go um, ahead. Okay, so this, I hope we'll be fairly straightforward and the board can choose to accept or decline and we can and move on pretty quickly. Um, basically, the issue of in-person uh, standardized testing this spring is one that I've heard quite a bit about from, from parents, um, parents of virtual learners who are not, uh, not happy about being required to come take the tests in person. And on February 22nd, the United States Department of Education provided new guidance that says that it will grant some flexibility to states um, regarding remote testing. And so this is simply a resolution um, that doesn't have any binding effect. It would just simply be a way for us as a board to collectively make a statement um, and, and express our will proactively so that we could help inform the decision hopefully of the Arkansas Department of Education. So, so what I've presented here is a resolution that lays out um, the whereas clauses are the, the facts as I'm stating them. One is that the United States Department of Education has issued new guidance to all state education agencies on February 22nd, 2021, stating that it would grant state education agencies the flexibility to administer remote shortened or delayed exams during the spring 2021 semester due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas approximately 42% of the students enrolled in the Little Rock School District are currently utilizing the district's virtual option um, in receiving instruction remotely. So now therefore be it resolved 
that the Little Rock School District Board of Education urges the Arkansas Department of Education Division of Element Elementary and Secondary Education to seek all necessary waivers from both state and federal law in order to allow the Little Rock School District to administer spring 2021 summative assessments remotely for students who are utilizing the district's virtual learning option and who elect not to physically enter the school building in order to take those exams. So that's the, the proposal and it would really be up to you all as to whether that is a statement that you wish to make. Uh, it's open for a uh, discussion um, to other, um, like to the other directors. Uh, do you, anyone have, have any opening um, comments? I mean, <clears throat> Director Nolan, I will say thank you for drafting this. I know this is something I have gotten a ton of feedback from on parents who are very anxious about sending their kids into the school and having a group of kids together who don't normally interact together being in the same room and are they really going to be six feet apart and every class is a little different in terms of how many kids are in the room and how many are virtual um so i mean i absolutely support this and don't have any changes that i would make to this statement do we know what the measures would have would be for the district that are for our district um, with virtual students coming in to test? Will, uh, will it be a day of, of in-person students staying out? Which I know with this, um, with, with the new Biden administration on testing, uh, they, they have provided flexibility on the requirement of 95% of the body having to test and parents are able just to opt out well just you know not send their kids in to test i mean because of the the waiver i'm, I'm just trying to figure out so is, is 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 this more of a symbolic statement um right since it's not binding and and then i mean how does this help parents because we are making a request which is something that um uh, uh, that was talked about in an email last month about do we want to make a waiver um, request to the state around testing because um, I sent that out. So this is tying is a request to the Arkansas Department of Education asking for a waiver only for remote learners to be able to take the test at home or uh, remotely? I can, I can. So my understanding of what is happening is that the Biden administration has said they will grant some flexibility and they provided some guidance as to how states should apply for that, um, for those waivers. We cannot apply for those on our own. So we would simply be asking the state to apply for the waivers that would then, um, allow the option for us to make decisions about how we wanted to um, allow for remote testing. If, if the state doesn't apply for the waivers, it forecloses those options. Um, and so this would be, it, it is not binding because we cannot tell the state what to do. We can use our voice and request that they do apply for those waivers. Okay. So, so this is, okay. So, and, and so this is a request uh, to uh, the Department of Ed from the district to request an entire state waiver on the remote learning tested, test um, for the flexibility on the assessment, correct? So it's symbolic yet action at the same time. I believe so. I believe so. And I mean, if there are, I, I included remote testing because that is what I have heard repeatedly um, from parents who were willing to administer the test remotely as they have in the fall and in the winter, but were unhappy about bringing their children in in person. And so that's why I focused it on remote um, assessments. Okay. 
and and do we feel like one uh, one second, Director Johnson? And okay. do we, from what uh, Dr. Cummings, I don't know if Dr. Cummings is on here. Um, there was a, a difference between the 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 assessments, which is why um, we uh, children was able uh, uh, to do that compared to this this assessment because it was uh, and maybe Dr. Owa could jump on. I'm here, uh, President Adams. I'm sorry. I said I'm here, uh, President. Oh, okay, awesome. So, um, okay, so can can you give really quickly like the difference between why um, why we was able to do it remotely uh, before and this test in the spring we're not able to do it uh, remotely. Yes, ma'am. The first round, uh, what we were able to. Uh, administer in the fall, uh, winter, springs are the uh, formative assessments, um, and so we had we had flexibility with those. Uh, the state formative assessment does not allow the flexibility for um, remote assessment, uh, and so that's the reason why we uh, had to require on-site administration of the spring formative assessment. Thank you. Okay, are there any other uh, questions regarding this resolution? Mr. Oh, Mr. Director Johnson, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Poor, have you heard anything from the Arkansas Department of Education on this issue? Or do you have any opinion or how do you feel about this resolution? At this what point, would you suggest? At, at this point, I have not had any uh, conversations with the department, nor have I seen any guidance. Um, it, interestingly enough, did not come up with any of the uh, superintendent meetings that we had this week. Um, I think that the, um, the state is very determined to have uh, assessment done in the spring, and I could not gauge whether or not how the state would receive a resolution from this board, I don't know. So I'd like to follow up with that first. First, just thank you, Ms. Nolan, for putting this together. And uh, looked like somebody was very had very clever legal language to put into this. You so clever. So kudos for that. But I, but I do have a question just for Mr. Porter uh, on the educational part. So are, is there any concern just from an administration standpoint um, for the for the educational perspective of if we had. Um, Students being tested at home. You know, I, I know the part of the balance. It seems to me is that some students won't be tested because they they will choose not to come in, and some people will come in under distress, but they'll come in, and but some people won't. But my guess is that. I, so, what's your thought about you know, the educational value? Is is, is there still value in having people test at home when it would be under less controlled circumstances? My, my background would say that psychometricians who develop assessments try to create testing environments that are consistent uh, across the, the stage so that everyone is being treated the same and receiving the, the, the same environments. And, and that's why some assessments that we're used to, like ACT and uh, SAT, they're all set up to be the same way. So that's, that's the, the assessment guru type people, the psychometricians, that's what they're after. And my belief is that the state will also probably go with that same mindset, but I don't know how to gauge that. Yeah, I, I get just thinking out loud. I guess my, my, my I respect the, the, the folks who are concerned and that they may just opt out totally, I guess not being, you know, an educa educator, but I, I guess I'm wondering about the value of the data if, if we have people who are being tested in such different settings, is that going to, in some ways, make it hard to tell if it's really how useful it is? If, Mr. Adams, this is uh, Jeremy Orwell. Uh yeah. It would. Um, when you have a different testing environment, it does mm -hmm. impact the validity of that data. Um, 
when it comes to the uh, final uh, assessment scores. And so um, that's one of the reasons why uh, w there were, there's a hard requirement for testing on site. Uh, it's because it, uh, it ensures or increases that validity of uh, the students who are being assessed uh, based on their content, based in, on their grade level. Um, if I could very briefly respond to that, I don't disagree that you would get more reliable and accurate data if everyone is in exactly the same setting and it's um, something you can reproduce across the district. I mean, the issue here is that we're in an ongoing pandemic and we have 42% of our uh, student body that is learning from home and learning remotely. And, and um, likely some percentage of that will not report to school for testing. And so this is an alternative where they could, we could get some data from home um, rather than not having that data. Yeah. I, I guess my concern and with that is, you know, parents can, you know, particularly since the district is not going to be penalized, you know, that, that if parents just, if they cannot in good conscience do it, then they should not in good conscience do it, you know, because they're the parent and they have to make the best decision for their child. Um, I guess as I'm just thinking out loud about this, my worry is if we actually, if this actually happened, then we might have less good data than we would if we, if the requirement was out there because some people would go ahead and probably we'd have probably have more participation in a consistent setting than if we gave if we gave people another out and then we would have more compromised data and and I just it, that that makes me feel ambivalent about asking the state strongly to provide it because it feels amb like an ambivalent outcome oh, ultimately I feel an obligation um, to present it because I have had so much uh, sure. input from parents who are concerned about this. Um, I understand if that's not the direction that the board chooses to go, but uh, you know, ultimately, the parents who are reaching out to me are not ambivalent about it. <laughs> they are very much opposed to bringing their children into the school building for standardized testing during the pandemic. So, so I am presenting it as is. Um, unless there are, you know, specific changes, of course, if someone wants to suggest one, and um, and we can either cho choose as a district to to make the statement or not. Yeah. Well, and I would not presume to tell those parents mm -hmm. what they need to do for the safety of their children. And, and Director and Adams, I definitely think on. the district should offer those virtual students to come in. And I think we should encourage that a lot I've had a lot of questions about what happens to my kid will my kid be punished if I don't bring them um and things like that and I just like I will not tell a parent that does not feel safe that they have to bring their child I mean I just can't and two you know parents are able I mean parents still are able to choose whether or not they will they will send their ch child in and either opt out of taking the test by them by them staying at home my only thing is and i'm not a big fan on standardized testing at all for those who know and follow me i've made videos about it but the thing about it is it's it, it's either we're going to secure the testing environment and make sure that all of the children are um having the same testing environment um, because not all 42% of our district have reliable internet um, devices. We don't know the condition of, of those devices. And so for me, it's more of a test integrity thing. And, and two, I'm surprised that I'm really saying this because, <laughs> because I'm, you know, normally like, oh, so um, I do think I, I I get where you're going yeah it for for those um people for for parents that are concerned about about going into a building um to a test 
um, a lot of the children or some of the children have not been in the building and then if they're not doing extracurricular activities that bring them in there are rehearsals or, and things like that I get that but um, and two we don't know if um, how how the state is going to view it and I'm not saying we should do it based on if we do know how the state is going to do it but at the same time and then right if, if, if we're not going to get accurate data anyway and if, if parents are still going to opt out um, or go into the building um, I'm, I'm just uh, a little concerned of, of, about that I do think that if, if we do do a, oh, if the state does a waiver rate and they take a position on it but parents are still able um, to opt out of it and I get the some, some symbolic statement um, to parents to say hey I've heard you yada yeah and it could come out as a action item um, if, if the state moves on it I, I, I get that I, I, I get it but and that's all of my two cents and I'll stop right there but I agree with um, Leanne on not wanting to tell parents exactly what what to do in the situation and I also understand um, about testing integrity and making sure that kids are able to take the test and that their Wi-Fi or hotspot doesn't um, because of clouds or rain or whatever uh, just go ahead and lose connection and submit the test and they wasn't ready or they couldn't get on or and what about the proctor who 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 will proctor that I mean there is a lot of logistical questions on how will we um, be able to secure the integrity of that test and then as director Adams pointed out um, it, it won't hurt the district so um, those are my quite those 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 are just some some of my thoughts that some of the other directors have um, conveyed and um, I'm all for a symbolic statement but at the same time I also like to I don't know just make sure that it's but 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 I do understand it and I'm not advocating for a test or no test I just just looking at all of it all the way around from those that are able to do it successfully for those that may have challenges and bar barriers and want to do it successfully and can't because they're at home so. and then we have the question of those that are in person about anyway but yeah um you guys uh I cannot see everybody um, I see Leanne's beautiful face in, 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 in the main screen um, but any anybody else that have um, any questions or discussion please just begin to um, speak madam president I just a point of clarification that mr. poor might need to answer are are we okay if our testing percentage falls below 95% if if the state doesn't act whatever just are as of right now are we okay if we only get 90 percent that take the test one of the new things that came out from the biden administration was the the target of that 95 percent and shared with the state that that could be looked at flexibly but it has not been uh, as far as i know i have not heard anything about from our own state of how they're looking at that we do know that the report card um, it looks like will be suspended for this coming year, uh, which you know kind of would impact those those grade and those scores for schools if they were to drop below the ninety five percent. So, are we hearing you that um, am I, is that safe to be interpreted that like we are going to be held harmless in in this? Um, I read I read the Biden administration um, position, but also I, I, I then I know you you are referencing a um, I can't remember if it's a Senate bill or a House bill. Um, so is, is, is that what you're saying uh, with the falling below the 90% like Director Wood mentioned? We, we still have uh, we're, we're going to be expected to have um, do everything in our power to get every single student tested that's going to be our charge that we'll get received from the state i don't see that varying uh in any form or fashion okay. um so just two things briefly 
one is there has been discussion about opting out and I think our understanding from a previous meeting was that that is not something that school uh, principals or teachers are telling families they're they're instructing them to to come test correct like they are being told that they are required to come test is that accurate yes, because, yes, that's because correct. legally they can't say that I mean they can't right. say that but parents are able to do it and and there won't be penalty so but my so that is my first point as far as um you know we're we're potentially and I don't want to blow this out of proportion but potentially harming that relationship because we're you know you have a, a, a teacher or a principal that is instructing a parent you are required and you must when in fact you know we're we're about the fact that you know they can opt out or, or things like that and so I'm attempting to provide a middle ground you know a way that parents can comply with the requirements but not bring their children into the school building um, and the other thing that I'll mention just you know we've talked about the value of testing the value of testing data we are a family that has a virtual learner and we have used that testing data to track her progress in reading and as we approach this coming testing you know I do not feel comfortable I, mean, I don't want to make this about my family but I don't feel comfortable sending her into the school building at this point um, and that means that we would not have that data so the virtual families who actually do value the testing data will not receive it for their children unless they take their children to the building to be tested and so this would be a way that they could get that information and still um, still learn remotely and, and remain at home so that's you know, I, my only thought with that is just looking at it from those that may have that that may have barriers to that to where they 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 too care about that data but the, but they don't have um, proper um, either but a proper president device. Hatter. Like I don't want to interrupt, but like the elementary kids that have been testing have been virtual. They have tested virtually the other two times this year. No, so I, 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 I yeah, it's happened virtually. That's that is not my my point. Okay. My point is not whether or not you can and cannot do it. I was just looking at um other possible barriers and then if the state says uh or come back and do not do the waiver you, we are still in the same boat that that's the whole point of what i'm saying it's like we are relying on the state which we don't know what they're going to do whether or not they're going to do a do a, a waiver um and then if they and and and, and, and if they don't, or else if they do do a waiver and their flexibility is not to have a, a, a remote learning, then what happens? So are, so are the remote learners not gonna go into the school and test? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking this out and I'm gonna um, end my, my piece of discussion um, and then just uh, see if there's anything else from the board um, and then we can move forward so we could um, end the meeting. Okay, uh, do we have a motion? Director Wood, you have, um, okay. Uh, do we have a um, motion to, is there a motion on, on, on the floor? Uh, I will make a motion to uh, pass the board resolution that I presented um, that has just been discussed. Is there a second motion? I would second that motion. Good deal. Is uh, all in favor? And I, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, I've heard two voices. So, Aye. all. Okay. Can, can we get a uh, we need to do a roll call. Yeah, one second, please. Uh, can we get a roll call? Because I can't see the entire board. Well, do we ha have any opposed? I abstain. Okay, on, on, on the school board, we, we don't have absences or, um, or voting present. It's either a yes or a no. Um, from what I've read, so unless I'm reading and I could pull it out, 
to make sure. Uh, the, um, Attorney Eric Walker, is is he still on? He is. Yes, hi. Um, I see the Dr. Owa. Attorney Walker, he's on. Uh, he's, he's waiting for your question. Okay. Uh, is a board member able to uh, be present and not vote? Uh, I, I I do not know the answer to that. I'd have to look something up. Um, okay. Uh, let me go to the manual really fast and online and see. Because I could swear I, I read something and asked. I think you're correct, Ms. Hatter. Thank you. Thank you. Are you are correct, Ms. Hatter. If you either, if you abstain, it's basically the same as a no vote. Or That's what I read. Vote, if you don't vote, it's the same as a no vote. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Director um, Adams, because um, I was going to go to the policy and pull it up. Okay, so where we're at now is we're going to do a roll call, and we will go by zone. Zone one? Yes. Zone two? Yes. Zone three? Okay, she, uh, I'm sorry, uh, she um, had to get off. Uh, she was, she had um, something going on. Zone four? Yes. Zone five? Yes. Zone, well, that's myself. I'll, I'll make a symbolic yes. <laughs> zone seven? No. Uh, zone eight? Yes. Zone nine, Director Wood. No. Okay, so um, the board that passes, and for the record, um, uh, there were two no's coming out of seven and nine. Uh, Director Johnson and Director Wood for for nine, and that's just for the record of the roll call um, for uh, Michael for Mr. Uh, Hutchison. So okay. we, we only had eight people here, right? So it's six. So that's six. right. Um, thank you, um, Director Adams. And uh, Zone Three, um, is um, she was here, but but she was absent. You know, for this add-on uh, agenda item. Can I ask a, just a brief yes. point of clarification, just for going forward doing business? Um, that you know, the, the the whole thing that just came up there at the end about you know, present not voting, uh, new to me, does it, in what Mr. Poor said, does it, does it count as a no vote towards the, the necessary yes votes for passage or is it recorded in the record as a no vote? It is a no vote for passage. Um, it is in the uh, bylaws um, that what we just approved <laughs> um, uh, in the governance, it, 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 it's in there. And it, it, board, I'm sorry. It, I'm sorry. It's a policy board, and so um, that is that is where I I, I read that at. Yeah. But um, how, but point, how is it recorded just, in the? How is it recorded in the? How 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 each member voted? I'm sorry. Is that like a roll call? Is that what you're saying? Like as far as the minutes? Sure. Yeah. The minutes. Would it would it say? Director Johnson present not voting, or would it say Director Johnson voted no? It would say no from from what I've read and from what I've asked of um, other uh, a board, uh, uh, other board school board leaders, um, not only um, in inside our city but at um, the consultant level as well as the state uh, state school board association and. And so from all of my research so far, it says uh, uh, if people do not voice something, it is a no vote and then you have to go to roll call to okay. verify that. Interesting. Yeah. You can leave the room. Yeah, guys talking over each other yeah. here. Hold up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. I was trying to get in there. Um, Director Adams, 
you uh -huh. are correct on that as well. Um, you, you, you would have to get up and leave the room. And there even something in there that talks about the discussion. Like, I feel like I've been in like a school board course on all of these policies and uh, wearing Mr. Core and some of the other ones out, but <laughs> um, there was someone else talking over it. Mr. Poor, I did not hear the other voice I heard. Director I think Adams. Mr. Walker might be one to make a point, but one thing that I think also answers how Mr. Wood's question was is how do you know whether it got passed? You have to take into account, in this case, we had eight board members that are present for the vote. And so to have the vote be in favor or vote a positive, there has to be five board members that vote for that measure. So you, it's all about how many voted yes determines whether it passes based on how many are present. Thank, thank you, Superintendent. So and so that was a six-three vote. Well, a six-two uh, because we have one one that had to get off. One of our directors. Um, and just very very quickly, how it operates as a no vote is a matter of board governance policy. I understand. Um, but as far as the minutes, I think we can choose the level of detail we want to include in our minutes. So, you know, if that becomes something that we want to describe more in depth, I don't know that that's something that we're prohibited from doing. But, you know, the, the, those are slightly different things. The way it operates is a no vote and then the way we record what happened um, in our minutes. But I think in the right, whenever we do a roll call, from other board presidents talking to them. Um, it is recorded as such because it's a roll call for clarity. So, and, and it certifies the vote. So that should should be um, recorded. I think that's only right, um, especially in the whenever we call a roll call. Some may disagree, but in, until we are developing our process and style. But um, but that's what I've I've read uh, so far within our policies that we have right now. Okay, so um, moving forward for those that are still with us, five minutes till eleven. Um, we just passed a resolution that uh, will be sent to the state board of education. That's Arkansas State Board of Education. Uh, requesting a uh, for them to request a federal waiver on the flexibility of uh, being able to test remotely and again this is non-binding um, however it is a request and it's a um, uh, a public symbolic statement as well as a statement to families to know that um, those that have expressed this concern um, that the board have uh, listened and there it is and, and, and we will submit uh, this letter so um, yeah so we will uh, get that signed off and sent over and go from there you guys this have been a delight um, our our uh, meeting uh, t uh, tonight it, it is long, but we knew that we had a lot of things to cover and discuss. And, and I appreciate the robust um, conversations. And to just as, as, as you guys know, as, as we're forming this board, this is our second full board meeting. I know we had a December 17th meeting, but that was more of the introduction, getting things together. And then this is our second board meeting and so there will be growing pains and our growing pains and learning process is public so it's up for scrutiny and conversation and everything else and um, advice and um, that's just part of it but um, I am looking forward to our uh, trainings with um, Horace and Steve um, as, 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 as we start to uh, form and, and get our mission statement and our direction and our strategic plan and our vision and all that together. Um, Director Adams, I do appreciate you on several levels just for um, uh, just kind of being that, that quiet uh, but relevant voice in um, being able to uh, provide a level of um, clarity and experience to help um, 
you know, stir it and, and, and guide us. So I appreciate you for that. Um, so I do believe that we have a beautiful board that is very diverse and represents our city across the board and uh, it's nine of us and I think we're doing a good job. Uh, we are ready to adjourn. I was talking to get us to the 11 o'clock hour. Why not make it a full five and a half hours? So um, <laughs> this has been a delight. And um, Superintendent Poor, do you have anything before we get a motion to adjourn? No, oh, ma'am, thank you though. Thank you. Okay. May we have a, do, can we get in a motion, uh, motion to I'm adjourn? very happy to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> I second that motion happily. Okay. <laughs> hello, Director Morning. I say hello. Great. Um, do we have, uh, does eyes have it? I mean, all, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Roll call <laughs> vote on that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>